I ranked every Kirby boss of all essential titles in the series, beat more than 15 games and fought over 150 different opponents in order to determine the best boss of each entry. Now it's time to find out which adventure presents the overall greatest selection of enemies in general, since it makes no sense to compare an opponent from a Game Boy title with an ambitious final boss from today. I'm going to judge all games on their own and factor in the respective hardware as well. Although this ranking is mainly going to focus on the mainline series, there will be some of the most memorable spin-offs I consider to be known to worthy. With that being said, let's retrospect each game first, analyze them on their own and finally rank all of those entries. Technically, Poppy Bros is not a boss at the end of a level and therefore the foundation of what we understand as a mini-boss today. Because Dreamland only offers a couple of fights and no other mini-boss, it shouldn't be too detrimental to make an exception and include one additional fray to this ranking. As you have probably guessed, Poppy doesn't offer much of a challenge and functions basically like a tutorial for how the game wants to portray bosses. Unlike in traditional platformers, Kirby is not able to deal damage by jumping on the enemy's head, and due to missing copy abilities, the only way to deal damage is to inhale the opponents, projectiles and shoot them back. This dance between the foe's offensive and Kirby's passive countermeasures lets the game appear like a shmup put into a platforming context, which will be proved with a later boss on this list. Consequently, Poppy Bros serves his purpose of introducing this dynamic perfectly, but is logically simple and only throws a couple of bombs. Still, it's quite commendable to let him bounce and jump as this might appear rather difficult for unexperienced players, who face this enemy only after mere seconds when the game starts. However, it's not something to seriously critique, and Poppy Bros can proudly claim to establish a tradition the series follows to this day. The true first boss of the game and probably most iconic enemy in the series. Wispy Woods is the stoic tree behind the expressionless face with only a few means to attack. Unlike Poppy Bros, Wispy's position is stationary, so there's no real danger coming from his body directly. To compensate for this seeming decrease of challenge, apples cover the whole arena and theoretically there's not a safe spot to hide. The reality however looks quite different as the time span between each strike gives you more than enough moments to reposition. And if you try to trick the tree by sticking to his face, you might get hit by his blowing or pointy nose. All of this sounds way more challenging than it actually is, but I have to commend the thoughtfulness behind this simple encounter. That should prove itself to be the premise of many, many more wispy confrontations. Kabula is the only gimmick boss on this ranking and doesn't play out like other adversaries. By inhaling a special kind of power-up, Kirby gains the ability to float endlessly in the air with unlimited amount of breath to shoot. Kabula performs basically the very same kind of ability and tries to snipe Kirby from the air with all sorts of projectiles. It's a very one-sided battle without variation that lives through the hectic nature of maneuvering around obstacles while consistently positioning to the right place. While Dreamland resembled some kind of shooter mixed with the platformer on the ground, it's here where the emphasis becomes more than apparent. This influence is so strong, in fact, that even today's Kirby games inherit some kind of shmup sections whenever the opportunity calls for, and it's warming to see how much influence a 20 minute adventure like Dreamland still captivates on the series as a whole. Not to speak of the absolute brutal hard mode variation where it becomes nearly impossible to avoid any damage. I'm not over exaggerating when I say that Kabula on hard mode is one of Kirby's Kirby's most insane opponents in the franchise and I would love to see the player who overcomes this challenge without taking any hits. Just like Wispy, Krako made his debut in the very first title and although he's not as present, he's still one of the most recognizable foes in the series. 
The same goes for his weaker variation Krakow Jr., which can be regarded as the foreplay to the actual Clash. It's hard to describe this boss without sounding incredibly boring, since this is the foundation for every future Krakow battle in the franchise. He shoots thunderbolts, drops enemies for you to inhale and dashes through the arena. Being the last regular boss in the game, it's enjoyable to see an adversary escalating so subtly in difficulty. Since Krakow is not stationary and requires you to aim for the target and doesn't allow you to hide in a corner, it would have been more interesting to see him incorporate Kirby's floating ability a little more into the fight, since this is the enemy based on the sky, but having a first taste in form of Krakow Jr. is already an interesting take on this specific level. One thing to mention and similar to Kabula is the hard mode. Initially Krakow might come across as unbelievable challenging, but there is actually quite the easy to learn pattern once you figure out how this boss behaves. Ironically Krakow Jr. depicts the polar opposite, and despite the fact you can study his movement, it's still an incredibly brutal confrontation. Two bosses instead of one as the twins act in harmony as the second main boss. Though it may seem strange to put such a simple boss so high on this ranking, there's something unique about this fight that tries to be very different from all the other bosses. Besides some minor layer switching, platforming is completely ditched in order to emphasize the inhaling and shooting aspect of Kirby's moveset. You have to carefully inhale the moving blocks while avoiding touching one of the twins' bodies, or keep an eye out on objects sneaking up from behind once they turn up again. When I complained about Krakow not making use of the floating skill, this is what I meant and I'm glad the creators were so aware to focus a boss on this idea. Also similar to Krakow, there's a weaker variation before the actual fight, giving you one final chance to train your aim and take out the twins from another game. It shouldn't be surprising to see the most complex boss to be claiming the number one spot on this list, just like he did with Dreamland. At the top of an intimidating mountain, the iconic theme starts to play, and the final showdown for stolen food is about to embark. Before that, Kirby has to face off every major encounter again, the perfect lead up to the climax and forerunner of any future boss arena. All of these standard bosses combine the fact that they function very simplistic in terms of gameplay. While some of them require different skill sets from you, they do not offer many variety in their actions, whereas DDD combines all of them into one singular opponent. This flexibility in options is proven by the fact that DDD presents multiple techniques, some of them quite tricky to dodge if you are unprepared. What's more are the limited moments to strike back. With Wispy it's quite easy to catch the apples, the twins always carry an object to inhale, Krakow drops slow moving enemies and Kabula is self explanatory. DDD however leaves some star bits behind, which are quick to disappear if you're too slow. Today this is the go to strategy for every second boss in case the player is now copyability, but back then it was the perfect difficulty spike to make the final boss the most challenging one. The most surprising achievement however is the charm the creators managed to portray. There's only so much the little handheld can do, in fact not even proper colors, but they still accomplish the task of showing DDD's character without any cutscenes, voice lines or similar stuff, but his attacks instead. The clumsiness of tripping over his own foot or appearing extraordinarily proud when performing a high jump are not necessary per se as these skills would perfectly work without any specific animations. This kind of arrogance is even foreshadowed before the battle, with DDD's portray being centered at the middle of the arena instead of using a mere door. Everything about this first final encounter is probably as perfect as it could be, and brings this short sweet adventure to a more than fulfilling end. Contrary to its title, Kirby's Dreamland 2 is not the second endeavor of the series and instead builds on the foundation of Kirby's adventure with the limitations of the Game Boy in mind. Unlike in the original Dreamland, Kirby can now perform a trademark skill of copying the enemy's ability, and the overall experience is much more longer with multiple worlds and levels. The same goes for the amount of boss fights, some of them well known, others completely new. 
Coming straight from Kirby's Adventure, Mr. Shine and Bright give their skills another shot and have to be both defeated in order to proceed. Just like in their original debut, one of them remains on the horizon while the other attacks and you have to always watch out for any sneaky attacks from above. Most of their techniques remain fairly the same, but one unexpected yet very welcoming surprise is a team ambition where you have to stay in a specific spot to be safe. This kind of duo dynamic was a little lacking in the original and I'm glad they concentrated on the symbiosis between moon and sun. Another nifty detail is the sunlight which will be darkened when Mr. Bright is up, just like an adventure, but I can imagine not as self-explanatory for the Game Boy. Before I'm going to repeat myself endlessly on this ranking, the only reason why those bosses are on last place, despite presenting some interesting details, has nothing to do with the fight itself. It may be a little too similar to the original, but every following boss carries similar enjoyable surprises as well, which have simply impressed me more. The more I think about this placing, the more I'm sure he should be on the last place, but 2020 Wispy feels so strange in his idea that it's memorable for all the wrong reasons. Starting the battle, you encounter a version of the tree that guards himself with a mask and wacky glasses, which holds him back from shooting with his breath. With his newly added roots, Wispy tries to scoop you from below, but luckily there's enough space to hide. The battle returns to its regular form once you diminish the health bar once, and everything you know from Wispy will remain. Of course, giving the tree a small shield and one new attack is not particularly noteworthy, but the whole presentation is so bizarre and random, it's hard to not appreciate. This comparison will probably not make sense at all, but Wispy, as well as some other following bosses on this list, remind me of Super Mario Bros. 2 and its unique character for the Mario universe. No matter how you feel about that game, it's undeniable the second Mario Bros. carries a special charm that is still unmatched in the series. The same goes for Dreamland 2's bosses and although Wispy should be the most standard one, he still managed to adapt to a specific stigma. After Dreamland and Adventure, the franchise seems to carry on the tradition of fighting King DDD at the end of a game, but it's most likely not a surprise to say this is only one part of the truth. When not completing the game, this is going to be your final encounter and even so, it can be quite challenging with or without a copy ability. Some attacks are either extremely similar to past entries or straight out the same, but while fighting, you see DDD sleeping throughout the clash, suggesting there is something wrong with him. This suspicion should turn out to be true once the sleepy king falls into a glowing tantrum, where most attacks are accompanied by some kind of shockwaves. This is a double-edged sword, as those shockwaves give you an opportunity to enhance star bits and shoot them back, but they are also clearly harder to dodge and predict. The battlefield is not as big as it seems and especially the sudden inhaling technique got me more often than I like to admit. Of course, there's the option to enter the seeming final fight without a copy ability, but those skills do not deal as much damage as star bits and some of them do not carry the offensive capacities to sustain a whole fray. This is why the first Kirby titles have this great balance between copy abilities and inhaling star bits, with both placed showing clear pros and cons. Kirby games may have always been easy, but it's enjoyable to dwell back into a time where DDD battles actually required some careful steps to win. This caring parent and her children are very similar to the twins from Dreamland and create a setup similar to their role models. 
Running from every corner through every corner, this boss is quite quick on her feet and is even able to throw some bombs for you to inhale. Unlike with the twins, she's not carrying an object all the time with her, which is why children need to be abused in order to win. One small but clear difference I haven't mentioned when comparing this boss to Dreamland's counterpart is the layout of the arena. Unlike with the twins, Kirby can jump and drop from platforms to platform whenever he likes, making this battle rather accessible on first glance. Then again, there are sometimes some children to bump into and it sounds definitely more easier than it is. Still, it's a far cry from a serious task and a perfect fit for the second boss. A boss most modern Kirby players should be familiar with, the Ice Dragon. A once main boss of a mainline title resembles more of a mini boss today and is especially present in titles like Super Kirby Clash with its multiple variations. Still, this doesn't change the fact that Ice Dragon is a more than competent boss on its own, particularly back in the day. His design might be on the adorable side, but his little tail is used to fly through the air and create obstacles from above. On top of that, he's also able to breath ice or even shoot projectiles. Fighting this boss without any abilities can be quite challenging and it always amazes me how versatile the chunky dragon in reality is. Sweet Stuff is the first proper underwater boss in the series and on top of that an auto-scrawler. This dull looking fish uses his signature body part to shoot powerful arrows and gives you a chance to counter strike with little stars to inhale. Occasionally he also dashes to the other side which is why it's a always better idea to simply walk on the ground, despite being very slow and not versatile. Of course it's a great idea to bring Kain the fish into the fight, giving you more mobility ultimately and negating the home advantage of your enemy. There's nothing particularly special about this fight despite being placed underwater Water, but just like with Wispy, Sweet Stuff gives me those vibes that I don't get from other bosses. Even though he's super forgettable, I appreciate how the creators still care to reference someone like this fish in some shape or form and it proves that you're never going to be forgotten as long as you're a Kirby character. The true final boss and manipulator behind Dreamland 2's premise, Dark Matter, celebrates his debut in this entry and should start an ongoing villainous stampede for the next titles. Once you gather every main collectible in each world and defeat King DDD, this simplistic matter of dark energy manifests into a knight with a cutting edge sword ready to finish you in the sky. By this point, Kirby's no stranger to such opponents either and with the newly obtained rainbow sword, it's time for the true final boss. Reminiscent of Nightmare from Adventure prior to this game, Dark Matter sets up the final similar to that and lets you freely roam in the sky. Unlike in Adventure, however, you cannot shoot star bits. In fact, you can shoot nothing and have to either come close to your enemy and swing the sword or reflect Dark Matter's energy bolts and deal damage. It's a small difference but enough to not completely copy Adventure's final and to be honest, way more challenging as well. Dealing direct hits with your sword is almost never a good idea and it's way less effective and extremely risky too. Also, Dark Matter switches positions consistently and playing on defense is always the idea. Once you complete the first phase, it's time for round 2 where the defense Defensive playstyle shows its merits, with health being spared in the best case. Dark Matter transforms into a simpler shape but all the more aggressive and there's no healing granted through the whole climax. Needless to say, this is an utmost challenging fight and you have to plan in a couple of tries until you learn the pattern of each technique. It may appear unfair or unpredictable at first, but after some while it feels very satisfying to evade all those attacks like a veteran and having a unique, interesting and hard secret final boss is the best reward a game like Dreamland 2 could receive.
The boss I expected the least from fights himself to the top. When I first played Dreamland 2, I was not looking very forward to Krakow since I was completely aware about the hardware I'm playing with and therefore anticipated a rather safe confrontation with maybe one new attack. After all, although Adventure was placed on a home console with much more power, even this Krakow rendition only slightly enhanced the original with a small chase sequence but played out nearly the same. Fortunately, I should be proven wrong as Dreamland 2's Krakow underlines the sentiment that hardware power has nothing to do with the creativity to offer something surprising. When entering the fight, Krako makes use of the surroundings and heights in the battleground. The only way to strike back is to wait until Krako or Krako Jr. comes out and leaves himself open. For its time, the idea to incorporate the environment into the fight is very impressive and amazingly executed as it also combines Krako and Krako Jr. into one clash. After that, you might think the brawl goes back to what you know just like in Adventure. And even though most skills remain similar, they are slightly altered, like the way Krako shoots his thunderbolts or creates enemies for you to inhale. The main reason why I enjoyed this rendition so much is probably mainly the unexpected creativity and my low expectations, which is why we ignore his absence in my top 5 Krako ranking because idiots like to forget stuff. Being the follow-up to Kirby's Dreamland 2 for the Game Boy, it was finally time to bring the Dreamland series onto an actual home console and present a unique art style still timeless to this day. Naturally, Dreamland 3 builds on the foundation of its predecessor and doesn't change the formula too much with only adding a couple new animal bodies. While this is true for the basic gameplay, let's find out if the bosses went under a substantial shift and compare their quality to each other. Starting with the animal duo Pon and Con, it becomes quickly apparent how similar Dreamland 3 is and will be with some of its bosses. Just like with a certain other enemy in Dreamland 2, or the twins in the original Dreamland, these bosses appear from every corner of the battlefield, followed by some smaller versions of themselves. The main difference between this variation and other bosses is the hardware we are playing with. Dreamland 3 is not based on a small handheld with limited screen capacities and can make use of much more space to deal with. Naturally, the playground is much wider, giving you more options to flee and the foes to attack. New are dangerous bombs falling from above and unlike with many Dreamland 2 bosses, it always makes more sense to bring a copy ability or animal body into the fight. As refreshing as all of this may sound, the core battle is still too similar to adversaries and luckily we got a much appreciated break until facing these opponents and star allies again. It always feels wrong to put such an endgame opponent so low at a Kirby ranking, but just like with Pawn and Con, the returning Dark Matter from Dreamland 2 is simply too identical to put him any higher. If you fulfill every character's wish in every level, you unlock the true climax of the game and ascend high into the horizon to fight Dark Matter in this hellish-like dimension. Unlike in Dreamland 2, however, this encounter is significantly easier, as you can now shoot projectiles whenever you like and don't have to reflect any energy balls. Generally, it's always suspicious to fight the previous final boss right from the start in the follow-up, and you can clearly tell that something even more intimidating needs to be defeated afterwards. Now Nonetheless, it's more like a fake out and I always appreciate the trope of starting off with the previous final boss to emphasize an even greater evil waiting to show its cards. One not so important but interesting detail is the second player, Gooey. Since he needs his own means to attack, Gooey transforms into a dark matter like creature with visible orange balls surrounding his body, just like with your enemy. It's one of the early occurrences where Kirby lore started to shine through and even without any descriptions. The post green lore for each modern title is appreciated and optional, but this kind of visual law implication carries much more weight and allows way more room for speculation, since there is no text to go by. It indicates and does not tell, and you can speculate all day if Gooey is related to the final boss, why he behaves so friendly, and other secret details. The 
Similar to many players, I encountered Arkrow the first time in Kirby 64 and was surprised to find out his true origin in Dream Lane 3. Initially, the battle starts rather tame on a dry surface, with Arkrow performing some weak dashes and not posing any serious danger. The water beneath the battlefield makes it obvious that something will be coming, and after dealing a good amount of damage, the fight switches to Arkrow's home turf and initiates the second round. Spitting all sorts of objects and bringing in some movement into the action, Kirby has to reflect those obstacles and shoot them with his bubbles back. Suddenly, the clash transforms into somewhat of a dexterity challenge, and it can become quite hard to aim for your target. This is why the main feature of the game, animal bodies returning from Dreamland 2, are so powerful in certain scenarios. With Kai in the fish, it becomes much easier to at least move around underwater and therefore easier to adjust your position. Kirby bosses are not often placed underwater since copy abilities often either do not work or are heavily restricted, but with Kain in the game, it makes surely sense to give it a try. At this point in the series, players fought their fair share of DDD battles and slowly but surely expect more from the self-proclaimed King of Dreamland. Since this is the follow-up to Dreamland 2 and going by the events of Adventure, it's quite obvious that DDD cannot be the main target and is once again possessed by Dark Matter. The first phase is everything you expect from a DDD encounter, but I have to commend the setting the fight takes place in. The castle itself is nothing special, but the unusual color palette in combination with those floating particles already makes this DDD rendition memorable purely because of the visuals. Luckily, this is not everything there is to and once you initiate the second phase, DDD follows the strangely gloomy tone of the game and similar to Wispy, turns into a kind of monster you would not expect to see. His immense belly starts to bite after you, while turning into an eye for some slow, inhalable dark balls. Shifting the enemy to the air is always a solid way to ensure a small rise of difficulty, and because DDD requires you to destroy a complete health bar instead of only the half. To start the second phase, you have to play carefully to survive until the end. Every attack is not too hard to dodge, but having the patience to not run into unnecessary hits is probably the most difficult part about this battle. When I first played Dreamland, I naturally expected the expected wispy fight at the end of a world 1, going by every past title so far. Of course, there is nothing shocking about this fact, and at first, this impression should remain to be true. The good old tree is as stationary as ever, and seems to offer a traditional fight akin to the first Dreamland in contrast to Dreamland 2's interesting attempt. Furthermore, I was not sure how bosses would work in this game. Will they have a second phase or try to shake up the formula? All of these thoughts should vanish once you bring the first health bar down to zero, with Wispy falling into a tantrum and starting to chase Kirby, looking as angry as never before. I always love chasing sequences during boss fights, where you still have to fight the boss instead of merely running away, leaving the speed of the fight in your hands, despite suggesting the opposite. You would not expect a tree to be so versatile, which is why the effect of surprise works so perfect in this case. The Dreamland Saga did a fantastic job in differentiating all those wispy brawls to make them feel truly unique. Today, a boss like Edo might not be too thrilling considering how there already was a similar opponent in Adventure in the style of Paint Roller, but there's a significant difference to be noticed. Unlike with Paint Roller, Edo is not creating mere objects or enemies for you to inhale, but instead creates a short boss parade mainly based on Dreamland 2's foes. Edo herself hides behind her means to attack and only acts once there's no art left to save her. Before that, you have to face off known enemies such as the Ice Dragon, the Fish and even the Horizon Duo. Of course, all of them are clearly toned down since this would come across as harder than the actual final boss, but still an interesting take for a boss. You could argue this fight lacks creativity to sit on the second phase and is mainly based on adversaries you already fought without any clear differences, but it was a new concept back in the day and creates a fitting challenge for the last regular world of the game. It shouldn't be surprising to see one of Kirby's most memorable final bosses on the first place regarding how out of character this whole scenario is for the whole series. 
Finally, it's time to face off the true leader of the Dark Matter entity, Zero, and bombard him with everything you have. Surprisingly enough, your target is surprisingly huge and easy to hit, which might come across as questionable concerning how challenging Dark Matter was in Dreamland 2, but logical if you think about Zero's character design. The giant white circular body with one little striking red eyeball creates this uncanny feeling while matching the simplistic general design of the series. In comparison, Nightmare or Marx look much more detailed in theory, should pose a bigger threat, yet are nowhere near as intimidating as Zero. I already feel silly to praise a white ball with a red eye, but it's simply so effective for some reason, which may have something to do with how inexpressive your final opponent is. Even King DDD in the very first Dreamland showed emotions with the limited hardware power of the Game Boy, and there we have Zero not shredding any kind of emotions. Even so, all of this is not the reason for this boss special reputation. During the first half of the climax, Zero confronts Kirby by shooting with his own blood, admittedly not confirmed, but heavily implied. On top of that, he performs the Nightmare Background skill, dashes into Kirby and uses small dark matters, underlining the idea of him creating them with ease. It goes without saying that shooting with your own blood in a children's game for toddlers is an interesting take, but much appreciated regarding that children are not as stupid as many people think. Until you delete the first health bar and initiate the second phase. Everything up to this point was very alright, even for a Kirby game, but ripping out the main body in such a bloody manner was done completely on purpose, and you can clearly hear the creators giggling in the background. Some people might say it's a cheap, edgy trick, but incredibly fitting regarding the contrast to the IP's friendly stigma. Franchises like Mario or Donkey Kong are also noticeably kid-friendly, but do not ooze this hard-to-explain gloomy undertone Kirby likes to occasionally use. The final phase is more like a final touch for an otherwise memorable final boss, and it's going to be interesting to see how Zero's incarnation is going to set himself apart in Kirby 64. Kirby 64 might not share the magic experience of bringing Kirby into the third dimension just like many other Nintendo IPs, but became kinda memorable due to the fact of being one of the very few two-dimensional platformers on the Nintendo 64. At least the visuals benefit from a much more powerful hardware and make use of dynamic camera shifts and expressive animations. Due to the technological improvement, there are still people thinking Kirby 64 is actually a three-dimensional game, which could be due to the many impressive bosses offering surprisingly difficult challenges and making great use of the Nintendo 64's power. By adding three first tutorial bosses to the mix, it should not come off as a surprise to see the possessed Waddle Dee, or in this case Waddle Doo, on the last place. The battle, if you can even call it a battle, is just one small sequence to show the powers of Dark Matter, introduce the concept of a boss and add a little piece to the reasoning why Kirby will have partners in the first case. There are even mini-bosses and regular enemies which are probably harder to overcome, but the entertaining, quirky soundtrack in combination with Waddle Doo's clumsiness makes this short quarrel too sweet to seriously complain. At the top of his never consistent castle, King DDD snatches a piece of the crystal only to get tricked by dark matter and expectedly getting mind controlled. While Waddle Dee was a original fight, albeit in the simple side, DDD's brawl is almost identical to Dreamland 3, with the first regular phase on the ground and the second one where the penguin awakens his inner eye and starts to float. It's nice to have a DDD confrontation despite his role of an ally in this game, but the fight itself is unfortunately painfully slow and it takes your enemy extremely long to start his attacks. Like I said with Waddle Dee, however, these battles are not about offering series amazing clashes, and you can basically perceive it as a remake of Dreamland's 3 variation, but with 3D graphics.
Adeline is the second main encounter in Just Like DDD, a copy of Dreamlands 3 boss in the sky. By drawing pictures of a certain foe, she awakens her art to life and hides behind her painting due to her fragile nature. Unlike with DDD, however, the paintings are not the same, admittedly much easier because of being placed at the start of the game, but at least different nonetheless. The way she whines about every loss is unexpectedly adorable, and they even implemented the final phase of their running towards Kirby desperately. All of those three battles are a great taste of what is to come, and something in me wishes there would be a small boss at the end end of every level. The first proper boss and all-time rival, Wispy Woods, guards one of the crystal pieces and summons his children in order to win. Although the game features no three-dimensional gameplay in its campaign, it's the first time to witness Wispy in 3D visuals, and the creators gave their best to at least create the illusion of depth by building a circular arena with Wispy being placed at the center. It's an extremely smart move since a tree looks the same from all angles, which clearly spared some time for animations. Speaking of wasting no time, in today's Kirby games normally you get a lead up to the boss, setting the atmosphere and choosing between a handful of copies abilities. There is not such a chance in Kirby 64, with the battle starting abruptly once you enter the field. It may be considered outdated, as you have to enter another level for a copy ability, but I would argue those bosses are designed and more enjoyable without any skills. Fighting Wispy himself is just as uncomplicated as you would expect, with classic breath and apple attack serving as a means to kill off innocent children. Once his bloodline is undone, Wispy converts into a Wiggler-esque tantrum and uses his roots and even more apples to spice up the action. It's still fairly easy and every skill poses no problem to dodge, but by giving you only the option to strike back when the roots are out, this rendition of Wispy circumvents the issue of ending the clash too quickly. The way the roots drill through the earth in combination with the massive sound design is more entertaining than it should be, and you get everything you would expect from the first Wispy brawl on a 3D home console. As another returner from Dreamland 3, Akro upgraded his tactics and plays out a little different from his crayon style alternative. Instead of starting on plain grounds and switching the occasions to his home turf, 64's first phase resembles fundamentally Dreamland 3's second one. With the copy ability, it might be easier to land a hit, but due to Kirby's inability to defend himself in any capacity underwater in this game, the only option to deal damage is by inhaling Arcros projectiles and spitting them back. At the end of each side of the cave, he starts to perform powerful body slams, but also doesn't move as much, giving you a moment for a counter. It can be surprisingly difficult to perfectly time each blow, but there's the special trick of inhaling the cutter enemy, holding him up and using his never-ending bullets as a means for the offensive. This flexibility in how you approach a battle is still unmatched in the series and a unique factor setting 64's playstyle clearly apart from modern titles. Obviously this isn't everything to the battle and after deleting the enemy's health bar once, the underwater cave starts to crumble down, leading you slowly to the top. Now, the fight increases its verticality tremendously while Akro shoots torpedoes from below, provoking you to swim similarly slow but with the risk of getting swallowed by the auto-scrawler. It may sound more challenging, but it's actually very doable and arguably much more easier than the first phase. What I enjoy about the shift between the phases, not only in this case, but substantially in every other boss as well, is how the game feels no need to show any kind of transition cutscene. In modern titles, when you have the health bar of a boss, the camera slowly zooms in as the foe rages and interrupts the gameplay for a very brief moment to establish the second phase. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this more modern cinematic approach, but the plainness and ongoing action in Kirby 64 is something I really appreciate about every skirmish. If you think Kirby bosses couldn't get any more simplistic in their design, the Pix Crystals might change your mind. 
three colorful crystals resemble the boss of the second world and while people could get the impression the creators are plainly lazy in imagination, back in the day, just like modern titles, Kirby games captivate younger players not only with digestible gameplay, but easy to comprehend character design as well. If a child can draw a character from the Kirby universe, even without any artistic skills, then it's a perfect design for the game. The crystals fulfill that role absolutely perfectly and offer a quality fight on top of that. Initially, it's a little confusing what to do since you consistently dodge all sorts of attacks without any chance for a counter strike. This is only to wait until the antique structure reaches the top and offers strange, colorful adjusted objects for you to inhale. It's not a brain breaker to figure out which of them is meant for which crystal, but the complete pace of the battle changes and is a nice contrast to the faster first phase. It also kind of proves my suspicion that these bosses were created without copy abilities in mind, or at least become much more difficult and enjoyable, which is why the creators should definitely consider some kind of restriction during major battles in the future again. Design-wise, Mac-Man might not come off as particularly intimidating and is clearly inspired by Wispy, but their battles couldn't be more different. With the phone in the background and limited space to stay safe from the hot magma, you can only jump between a couple platforms and have to avoid the burning ceiling on top of all sorts of attacks. Magman actually never appears in the foreground and just like with Wispy, you have to go for his pillars being connected to his body. The first try could be rather challenging, as it could be hard to predict how each technique behaves. Regarding it might appear like the magma pillars move randomly every time. However, there's actually a pattern and once you figure out how to maneuver around all those obstacles, Obstacles, it's time for phase 2. Magman chases you to a more safe space in the dark cave, but faces you off directly with his massive body. It isn't quite obvious at the beginning, but the only vulnerable part is his expressionless visage and Kirby has to perform high jumps and timed attacks in order to win. The crashing rocks offer great opportunities for some powerful projectiles and the arguably most dangerous skill is a mighty fire breath, only avoidable when sticking to Magman's body, something you avoided throughout the whole battle. It's a great mix-up of inherited patterns and looks all the more impressive at the same time. It should be different from person to person, but I consider Magman to be the hardest regular boss. For someone experiencing the game with no prior knowledge due to many unexpected attacks that need time to figure out how to avoid them, I think I would have preferred a complete chase sequence, similar to the one in a level prior to the boss, but regardless, Magman is a surprisingly hard boss in a series known for being a cakewalk. One of the most iconic yet underexplored antagonists of the series is the reincarnated Angel Zero 2, another version of Dreamlands 3 Final Encounter. After traveling through the whole universe and gathering all the crystal shards, the object Dark Matter tried so desperately to shatter completes itself and reveals the hidden menace buried within the Fairy Queen. In accordance with the Dreamland saga, this ending will only be unlocked with getting the 100% and is even teased if you fail to accomplish such a deed. The final world, Dark Star, consists of a very short sequence, highlighting each partner one last time and launching you into the probably most unnerving Kirby final boss to this day. The battle itself is fairly simple. By shooting crystal shards into Zero 2's bloody eyeball, you manage to destroy his balance, take out the halo and aim for the weak point. Initially, it might be a little awkward to circumvent around the projectiles and find a rhythm when and how to shoot, but after getting a feeling for how to move, the climax is actually quite simplistic and surprisingly easy. The true star of the show is the atmosphere, with the surrounding resembling some kind of hellish dimension, underlined by an extremely somber theme that stays in direct contrast to the intrinsic happiness of the series. Kirby games have their fair share of rather gloomy moments, but often these moments are cut by a heroic comeback and incorporate some kind of turning point presenting how the tables turn. There's no such a thing as that in Zero Two's case and the battle ends just as abruptly as it starts. Smaller details like a fake small at the beginning before revealing its true form or being able to destroy the wings for no particular reason 
add a little depth to an otherwise plain Badland and despite the fact it should be a disappointing encounter for being the true final boss on the first and only mainline Kirby game for the Nintendo 64, there is just something that remains memorable. The original Zero in Dreamland 3 stays iconic because of his shock factor, shooting with his own blood shamelessly to test the limits of an age rating. Zero 2 on the other hand cannot rely on such a situation again and instead aims to improve on that foundation and wins with one convincing total package instead of one shock moment. Players would love to see more background information behind Zero 2, but I think this is one of the few cases where elaborated lore would actually damage the mystique of this character. It seems like the creators have similar views, hence never bringing him properly back besides small appearances, even though they love to rely on nostalgia. But if there is going to be the day of a Kirby 64 remake, I hope they will keep the simplistic approach and not over-dramatize the arguably most plain yet memorable Kirby final boss. What would be a game without a good fight against a giant robot? HRH is a mechanical monstrosity staying in the background and shooting lasers as well as rockets. The setup is similar to Mac-Man, with the goal being visible at all time but giving you only few opportunities to strike back. The only way of getting to him is to catch the giant arms, which are occasionally used to swipe you off the ground. It's much harder to time in comparison to Mac-Man since you have to simultaneously dodge the attack and aim correctly. Once the robot sees himself cornered, he shifts his form, goes for a hyper offensive strategy. What I wished for in the Magman fight is basically realized in this situation with the machine chasing you while trying to cut Kirby in half. The auto-scrawler keeps you moving and adds a slight increase of difficulty without creating the irritating nature of being forced to adjust to the movement speed. The greatest feat of this boss has nothing to do with the boss gameplay design, however. It's about the scope and difference in height between your enemy and Kirby. The series is no stranger to larger than life opponents, but Kirby 64 really understands how to subtly move the camera in a way to emphasize every single detail, how the robot tries to smash you from above or the very minor camera movement when you run from left to right. The height of this machine is simply tangible and makes up a fitting duel before the final. To this day, this is probably the best start to a seeming Kirby final boss in the series. Miracle Meta is the supposed to be last step on the adventure and mirrors Kirby's trademark skill of being able to perform every ability in the campaign to some extent. Naturally, he's not able to combine any talents, but this doesn't make him any weaker due to the circumstance of being immune to almost all attacks. The only way to cause any harm is to make use of the ability Miracle Meta is currently using or shooting projectiles in case it takes too long. You cannot attack with fire while Miracle Meta uses rock and you have to always change skills consistently in order to adapt to the situation. Every elemental state is tied to a limited health pool, so you're going to take out each Miracle Meta variation piece by piece, indicated by a noticeable explosion effect. The way the battle starts with the introduction of the classic boss theme but turning into a much more darker tone is a nice fake out to suggest that this battle is very different in comparison to other enemies in the game. Normally there there's always a way to cheese a boss using overpowered ability or other tricks to secure a win if you struggle. In Miracle Matter's case there's not such a trick and this is probably the most fair and honest confrontation in the series. On top of that, despite the fact Kirby is stripped of his most reliable skill to some extent, the restriction is also a perfect way to incorporate every ability into the fight and force you to adapt. There's no other battle in the franchise where you're pressured to switch skills as often as in this case and it's really surprising to see how the IP never really tried that approach so drastically again. It also switches the expected convention of testing everything the player learned at the end by stripping off everything he learned and throwing him into a situation never seen before. The core gameplay however stays the same and you just have to think around the corner to win the fight. The cherry on top is a very fair and challenging difficulty, giving you no options to heal or even withdrawing from the clash. There might 
might not be any exciting cutscenes, sequences, camera shifts or expositions, but all of this adds to the sheer force of Miracle Matter and the core gameplay of this fight is so excellent, it doesn't need any fluff and there is a reason people regard this to be the true final test of skills of Kirby 64. After Kirby's Dreamland's surprising success on the Game Boy, it was only a matter of time until the little endeavor for beginners should turn into a full series with countless titles in the future. Kirby's adventure for Nintendo's first home console should continue the franchise with meaningful ideas such as Kirby's trademark skill of copying enemies' abilities, and further increase the general scope thanks to the increased hardware power of the NES. Naturally, it's not only the visuals or gameplay that should benefit from the jump to a better platform which is why we're going to take a look at every boss and determine if they developed in their power as well. Since the remake does not change any bosses besides lowering the difficulty, I decided to put Adventure and Nightmare Dreamland together. It's hard to start with Wispy by mentioning the tradition of fighting this classic foe always before encountering more mighty opponents. But you have to be aware, there's no pattern with no tradition. Because Wispy worked so well as the first boss, the creators decided to simply repeat the battle from Dreamland again with no substantial changes to the core design. The only main difference is the opportunity to use copy abilities, which is a bigger contrast than you might think. In Dreamland, there was no chance to consistently deal damage and plainly wait until you inhale an apple and strike back. In Adventure, you can end the clash in mere seconds, downplaying the whole premise and making Wispy easier than he needs to be. They could have circumvented this issue by adding at least one more dangerous attack that forces you to retreat once you stick too long to Wispy's face, or just like in Dreamland, take damage when touching his face. For the first home console title of the series, it might be a little disappointing, but luckily there are going to be other new bosses, handling the balance between base Kirby and copy abilities more formidable. Similar to Wispy, King DDD remained almost completely unchanged and is the supposed to be final boss of the game. To name the only new addition to his toolkit immediately, the king himself goes even more after his rival and can now inflate himself to slowly chase after Kirby. Initially, it sounds like an easy skill to dodge and is surely not as grand as any other potential fresh technique could be, but you have to time the trajectory of his movement and accordingly jump. As I stated, the rest stood the same, with both versions of the game even offering an easier boss than in the original Dreamland thanks to a wider stage and adventure and generous simplification in Nightmare in Dreamland. However, what gives DDD the edge over Wispy is the better synergy with copy abilities. The king doesn't become a cakewalk with his skill, in fact, it can even be arguably harder, depending on which ability you use. DDD's sudden inhale becomes much more dangerous since you have to come relatively close and most skills are not as refined as today, hence feeling quite troublesome to use in a fast-paced battle like this. There's a balance how you want to approach the fight and because this is only the entrance to the true final boss, King DDD serves his purpose perfectly fine. Krako is another lucky boss being transported to the first home console title and unlike Wispy or DDD, at least adds one rather substantial addition to his encounter even incorporating a specific copy ability, something you do not often see even in modern titles. Before going to the actual fight, Krako escapes to the horizon with Kirby following him either by floating or using the high jump ability. Not only does it utilize Kirby's new talent, but adds a little platforming challenge. Again, something not as apparent as you would think in the series. For my taste, it's a little too short and somehow could be expanded to be the whole clash, but constitutes as a charming first phase. The 
second half doesn't differentiate itself too much from Dreamland. In fact, it's again basically the same. But you should underline the thrill of having all of those bosses on the at this time big screen and in full colors. The first duo boss in the game, Mr. Shine and Bright, resemble the horizon and act together while making use of their specialities. Technically, you do not fight both opponents at the same time due to the fact how one of your foes remains in the background, only supporting his partner. This gives the fight a unique twist since it's not the same as the twins in Dreamland. Additionally, it also prevents you from simply flying above every obstacle, since the resting enemy in the sky still damages when being touched. With the increased hardware power this time, there's even the appreciated detail of a day and night shift depending on which enemy you're currently fighting. The Attacks per se are nothing to gosh about, as you will have an easy time with or without copy abilities. And I particularly enjoy how Mr. Shine and Bright follow the trend of resampling very simplistic yet charming character designs, akin to the boss design Dreamland basically founded. Just like many other Nintendo franchises, Kirby didn't necessarily establish a clear villain in Dreamland since it was only the first adventure and there should be plenty chances left to experiment with different styles of adversaries. As a dark matter of fact, it wasn't as obvious as you might think to have a true final boss after DDD, since you could easily see the creators merely reusing what worked before. Furthermore, especially back in the day, platformers were quite forward in their approach, so having a twist villain in the form of Nightmare must have been quite the surprise, with DDD trying to stop you from releasing this evil magician onto the world. Being defeated, Kirby grabs the powerful Star Rod and ascends to the skies for a unique shot. Down. During the first phase, the game turns into a shmup, similar to the fight against Kabula in Dreamland, but with one essential twist to the difficulty. Clashing against Nightmare's yet to be revealed true form is not much of a challenge itself, but there's a time limit you're not informed about. Once the screen slowly reaches the bottom, Kirby's going to be crushed and you have to start from the beginning. It isn't as urgent as it sounds and only a commendable addition to give the climax a certain sense of tension. Once you reveal Nightmare's final form, it's time to shift the main event to the ground and start the last struggle. Your enemy mainly uses quick projectiles and teleports all over the place to remain unpredictable. As mighty as the Star Rod might be, it cannot simply deal damage as before, and you have to shoot for Nightmare's inner body which will be revealed, especially if your opponent is either assaulting or preparing something. The Star Rod itself feels like the perfect representation of gaining one of Kirby's standard skills, spitting out projectiles as a copy ability and since you don't have to inhale any star bits or other objects for a chance to attack. It basically enhances one of base Kirby's tame abilities into a strong copy ability and gives you an adequate feeling of experiencing the climax without being overpowered. Watching other Kirby boss rankings of mine, it's not so strange to think I have something against Meta Knight battles in general. But this is actually the first time the Lonely Knight appeared in a Kirby entry and left enough of an impression to become one of the franchise's greatest characters. Throughout the game you consistently encounter Meta Knight briefly when he's handling you an item or to fight his companions. Although he might give off the impression of a villain, it's more like a rivalry to test Kirby's strength and prepare him for what is to come. This is reflected in the fight itself as Meta Knight offers you a sword to even the odds and start a fast duel you haven't seen in the adventure before. Your opponent might appear like no threat thanks to a small body but is all the quicker on his feet and therefore harder to hit. Especially the original title presents an extremely difficult challenge and it's safe to say that Meta Knight most likely is the hardest boss in the game. Each hit you deal is accompanied by a clear effect and it feels very satisfying to swing your sword against such a tricky foe. Many of those intricacies are sadly gone in Nightmare Dreamland thanks to the general decrease of difficulty but is obviously 
actually compensate to it, with the playable knight himself after the campaign. What's even more is how Meta Knight is perfectly designed around the idea of copy abilities in mind, being based completely around Sword Kirby. Surprisingly enough, with Krakow as another example, Adventure and its remake try to directly build some bosses around the idea of distinct skills, something you do not see too often in modern titles, which is why Meta Knight's debut is still one of the greatest showdowns. The second boss is the second most convincing enemy due to his special ability of fighting with secondary means. Paint Roller is the artist behind the dangerous art pieces with four offensive bastions at each corner of the arena. There are more than enough opportunities to create all sorts of traps. Unlike with Wispy, Paint Roller doesn't stand still and moves consistently to each corner. Sometimes at such a speed, it can become quite hard to counterattack or even dodge his dashes. Despite the fact this is only a NES game in the original, there's still details like a small wall jump and the overall quality of the animations is unexpectedly expressive. The same goes for the remake with its charming pixel art style, mirroring the artistic expertise the boss portrays. This is also reflected in Paint Roller's attacks, creating different obstacles that target Kirby directly or simply float around, perfectly to inhale and strike back. Regarding how this is the first Kirby game with copy abilities, there's surprisingly enough not a specific skill to counter your opponent, but Ball Kirby especially fits perfectly into this battle, thanks to missing bottomless pits. During the regular game, it's quite hard and gimmicky to make proper use of the ball since the controls turn into a mess once you started to fully bounce through the area. In this closed arena, there are no moments to lose control and Paint Roller can be heavily overwhelmed with the proper usage. What cements his placement is the unique setup of the boss himself. By creating different kind of hazards in combination with his agility, the whole scenario is quite unseen in comparison to all the other bosses, especially to the first Dreamland. Today, with bosses like Adeline or Modern Equivalent, that built on a similar foundation, this idea could be regarded as boring, especially when not painting proper enemies. But back in the day, it was an unexpected turn of events, and Paint Roller definitely deserves to give his skills in a proper modern title another shot. Just like Paint Roller, an unforeseen enemy for the second entry and first auto-scroller boss in the franchise. Heavy Mold is a heavy working underground machine, equipped with two giant circular saws to bury through the earth. With only one rocket to shoot from his back, the boss himself doesn't actually participate in the battle too much, since he is too busy creating the battleground you find yourself in. To this day, even in consideration of modern titles, I regard this setup as one of the most memorable premises in the series, since there's not really a similar encounter you could compare it to. The speed of Heavy Mold varies throughout the fight and depending how fast or slow he moves, you have to be very careful not to get swallowed by the auto-scrawler. Also, whenever your foe goes up, naturally there are bottomless pits to fall into, so although Heavy Mo lacks an offensive power, he makes up for the weakness by playing with the arena. This fight becomes especially tough without any copy abilities due to the fact you cannot float, hence increasing the challenge whenever you have to catch up, but even with the skill equipped, it's not like the machine becomes a cakewalk. As mentioned many times before, now the remake is significantly easier, which is why I prefer the original and the clunkiness of the copy abilities. Whatever battle style you choose, Heavy Maul offers way more than you would think initially. And just like with Paint Roller, I would gladly battle this construct once again someday. It's no secret that Kirby works with basically every genre and it's interesting to observe how the series tackles each style of gameplay with pure accessibility in mind. Metroidvanias tend to lean on the complex side and require you to memorize rooms, upgrade your character consistently and make logic of the labyrinth you find yourself in. Kirby and the Amazing Mirror borrows the very basic philosophy of a Metroidvania and tweaks the rules in order to implement a surprisingly elaborated multiplayer. 
player. Together you encounter powerful bosses from the mirror world, some of them resembling old rivals with altered designs. So let's see if they can stay toe to toe with their original counterparts or maybe even exceed them. Despite the fact I just mentioned modified enemies, surprisingly enough, Krakow is the only foe in this game staying completely untouched. This does not only apply to his design, as the battle itself is fundamentally every other Krakow battle you fought in past titles. Also, the volcanic area you find yourself in has nothing really to do with the one-eyed cloud per se, and you really get the impression he was a last moment addition in order to fill out the bosses. Even Kirby's Adventure implemented a short chasing sequence leading up to the real struggle, but the amazing mirror does not offer any special situation in any kind. You're going to dodge beams, smaller enemies, dashes, everything seen in other entries. Some people like to argue the mirror world is in the sky or some similar stuff, which is why Krakow simply visited this place by himself, but it doesn't change the fact that this rendition is extremely safe and uninspired. The main selling point of the amazing mirror is the multiplayer and it would have been interesting to see the thundercloud splitting himself up into different parts depending on how many players are on the field, for the sake of emphasizing the main selling point of the game and give every player a target to hit. It also has nothing to do with the hardware as the first Game Boy already proved that creativity has nothing to do with the limitations of the console. Because of that, Krakow remains as the most forgettable boss and suffers from simply adding nothing. Just like Krakow before, the fight against the seeming Meta Knight plays out completely identical from what you know and therefore comes across just as lazy. While the clash itself is nothing to gosh about, at least the ambiente convinces with an atmospheric sunset that was established before the battle. Beating the mysterious foe, you are shocked with the classic reveal of Meta Knight's face, but this time it's Shadow Kirby, who appears throughout the game and leaves items if you hit him. It's quite the waste to turn a proper boss fight against Shadow Kirby into a mere Meta Knight knockoff, and they could have done so many things with this rather unexplored character. Can Shadow Kirby inhale? copy abilities? Does he have other unique traits that set him apart from Kirby? Take a look at Meta Knight's and DDD star counterpart and you can clearly see how much more powerful they seem in comparison to their true selves. The fundament of using a Meta Knight blueprint isn't necessarily the issue here, as it serves the purpose of foreshadowing the fray against the real antagonist, but some special moves could have enhanced an otherwise way too standardized fight. As the first proper boss on this list and parallel version of Wispy Woods, King Golem is the only boss you have to conquer first before choosing your own path. With every other boss you're allowed to battle them in the order you like, but King Golem has to be beaten first, before the game truly opens up. Because of this, he is as plain as you would expect, but at least visually distinct, in comparison to the classic tree. Rocks falling from above resemble the apples and the stoic impression perfectly mirrors the stoic friend. It's a shame King Golem does not make use of his hands, only participating by clapping the ground. Still, if you take your time with this battle, you will at least see some unique tricks that sent out little minions to the battlefield. Most people will end the fight before even seeing this, probably. But especially back in the day, you would not expect more from the expected wispy slash golem encounter. A neat touch that foreshadows all your main enemies in the future are window glasses in the background, each of them portraying one of the main bosses. It's one of the rare uses of background elements and sets the tone nicely for what is to come. Similar to King Golem, Wiz is completely based on the past boss from Kirby's Adventure, the Paint Roller. 
both artists perform their attacks by summoning projectiles with their respective powers, in this case with his magical hat. Even the arena layout is nearly identical with one smaller quality of life improvement by placing a platform in the middle. Apart from that, there is once again sadly not too much setting this apart from the paint roller which is a shame considering the unique setup of the game using past bosses but changing them into something presumably new. Normally the creators have to always assume people may start with a respective new game, hence not relying too much on past knowledge about mechanics or characters. Theoretically Amazing Mirror strikes a perfect balance on paper by principally utilizing established characters by changing their appearance due to the story premise. It's an ideal combination of nostalgia and innovations without coming across as uncreative on paper. Just like this and every boss before on this list, this is a main critique of the Amazing Mirror, not making use of the cards they have in their hands. And you can see with Krakow sometimes there are even more imaginative renditions many years ago. If you want to nitpick, the same applies to Wiz as he lacks the smaller details in his animations, like Paint Roller performing a smaller wall jump instead of magically gliding through the air, or catching you off guard with the drift if you try to hide in a corner. Something Kirby games definitely indoctrinated you to do based on past games. Ultimately, it's not as detrimental as I make it out to be, but only a sign that there is always room to improve. Mini bosses are no unfamiliar feature for the franchise, just like easter eggs from other IPs. Sometimes whole level ideas are strictly copied and there is no denial Kirby combined some of Nintendo's most established creative endeavors in its level design. Amazing Mirror did go one step further and implemented the Master Hand from Smash as a surprising mini boss. Every attack is simply adopted from the original with the special Smash ability being one of the most versatile ones to this day. To spare some development time and increase the fan service one step further, one of the main bosses are both Master and Crazy Hand, but unfortunately it's not as exciting as you would think. To put it in cynical terms, fundamentally you are fighting just two master hands, with Crazy Hand not even portraying any of the uncommon movement known from Smash. There is the fitting accomplishment of factoring the multiplayer into the battle, as your team can split into two groups to focus on both hands simultaneously and the mere thought of realizing a Smash character will never be not charming. Dark Meta Knight is basically the upgraded version of the regular Meta Knight confrontation and builds on that foundation by being quicker, more unpredictable and adding minor additions. Going into this fight with the knowledge of modern Kirby games, especially Star Allies, it might be disappointing to find out that the Dark Knight lacks all the mirror-based techniques, but you have to be aware that this first taste of the climax resembles the structure of a contemporary Kirby final. Back in the day, it wasn't quite as common to have these multi-faced endings, with countless seeming final bosses appearing and appearing without a light in sight. Amazing Mirror kinda set the stone for such a structure, which is why Dark Meta Knight is simply the appetizer for what is to come. And even for that, it's serviceable with some strong skills, an intimidating setting and powerful soundtrack. Even Meta Knight has a smaller role by offering his sword not to cross blades with him and ultimately landing his very own sword for the upcoming struggle. At last the first original boss, which is not based on an enhanced mini-boss or enemy from the past. 
Mowgli is a short-sighted mammal guarding one of the mirror pieces deep in the caves of the mirror world and switches places quickly by digging through holes. While mining he finds all sorts of trash to throw at you and combines a rather passive approach with quick projectiles. Similar to the smash hands, Mowgli makes perfect use of the multiplayer aspect but enhances the potential with a spontaneous change of pace. With potentially 4 players on the field everyone is gathered around the arena so theoretically there's no place for the mole to hide. As there will be the surprising moment of his nose sticking out of the dirt when you are actually trying to hide. Also having a smaller ceiling there is a sense of an enclosed atmosphere, fantastically fitting to the world setting, resulting in the first properly realized new boss of the amazing mirror. Nowadays water based bosses seem to appear less and less in modern titles but back in the day it was certainly not surprising and Gobbler convinced with his goofy design and quite a decent battle. Other than a handful of abilities Kirby is very restricted underwater and can only shoot water bubbles as a means to strike his foes. To add some flexibility to the arena there's the chance to stay above the dangerous water but mainly for hiding purposes. With quick dashes Gobbler rushes through the battleground and sometimes summons his children when child support becomes too much. It's a little unfortunate there are not more unique moves or making use of the multiplayer aspect but Gobbler simply stands out by his strange design and fast paced movement. Obviously there are some considerations to improve on, like the general speed of the fight. Gobbler by himself is fast but takes a little too long to attack and by the time he actually starts to pose menace the battle will be over when all Kirby simultaneously spit on the fish with problems to swim. Revealed to be the true antagonist all along, Dark Mind is the malicious magician behind the mirror world and final opponent to overcome. When you first start the fight he might come across as a nightmare copycat with a secret weak point under his coat and star like projectiles but this time with colors. Also having the option to use Meta Knight's overpowered blade just destroys Dark Mind's health bar resulting in him splitting into pieces. Obviously there's more to see and you find yourself in different short self contained level sections mirroring most places you have visited throughout the adventure. After each short sequence basically a new slightly more challenging phase starts giving the whole staging a unique setup, still very individual for the series. There is the sense that you cannot quite know when the fight is going to end or where it's even leading up to and while the battle itself could be a little more creative and varied, it's still a fitting preparation for what is to come. After an ostensible endless battle against Dark Mind his true form starts to shine through and reveal itself to be a massive eyeball similar to past enemies like Zero. This time the fight takes much more slower pace and the only way to deal any damage is a direct hit into the eye. Often Kirby bosses suffer from the design choice of being able to attack consistently which makes foes like Wispy Woods in many games laughable. The opposition simply gets no chance to show their tricks which is why you often see people being surprised when an opponent uses a skill you have never seen before. Dark Mind is different in that regard as you can only strike consistently once instead of dealing permanent damage all the time. With this approach each sword swing has to be timed and even if you still use Meta Knight's iconic blade Dark Mind will not be taken down so easily just like before. Despite the fact the arena seems to be placed in some sort of alternative dimension it's commendable how Dark Mind still incorporates the mirror theming by attacking with the magical objects itself using them as reflectors for beam or summoning enemies in case you have no ability. Shifting the perspective adds a little difficulty curve in the second half of the battle and regarding how 
frequently the game reuses bosses or concepts from prior entries. I'm extremely glad the true final encounter remains fully original with interesting ideas. Of course, it wouldn't be a Kirby title without one last icing on the cake and after a challenging fight it's time for the gimmick sequence, which is extremely strange in hindsight. There was never a point where the player had to fly with a warp star and shoot something. At this moment kinda resembles the level goals where you had to dodge obstacles, gather some items and alleviate to the top. However, the controls are noticeably different and it still confuses me why they even decided to implement such a strangely last phase. Still, this is not to say it's not enjoyable as the battle is basically over and you can plainly give everything in and utterly destroy Dark Mind. To top the whole strangeness of this scene, once you defeat the health bar, the credits just start to roll, with no fanfare or any transition. For all the reasons Dark Mind's last fight appears to be quite odd, it also adds a certain unforgettable charm, which remains to be unique to this day. Robots Mega Titan is a rather unusual boss as you cannot deal any damage with regular attacks. The only exception are electric based skills like beam or plasma but otherwise there is no other chance to crack the iron titan with 4 powerful floating fists. The only strategy to win is to push Mega Titan into one of the electric walls while dodging his punches from every direction. It's a notable difference from any other premise in the game and doesn't allow you to cheaply win by using an overpowered copy ability, especially with 4 players on the field, the sheer chaos unfolds and sometimes it can become hard to tell what can be considered a floating fists or panicking friend in the air. On top of that, Mega Titan is the only regular boss with two separate faces. After destroying the main body, a small horned machine pops out and shoots rockets as a projectile for you to inhale. The fight doesn't become harder, in fact it's basically over at this point, but having the contrast between an undestroyable monster and weak true core is all the more effective. Especially especially if you had troubles pushing Mega Titan into the walls. His design is similarly fantastic and while it's hard to mess up robot bosses, it's commendable how perfectly they nailed the simplistic character design of the series with a slightly intimidating touch, something the franchise is quite known for. Kirby games love to recycle most of the memorable bosses from the past and I'm more than certain that everyone who experienced the amazing mirror will certainly remember this boss and wishes to see a modern interpretation. Kirby is no stranger to experimental gameplay styles that are often specifically crafted for the respective console. Canvas Curse perfectly fits that description by utilizing the double screen of the DS on top of the touchscreen and pen. By drawing lines you move the cursed Kirby around strange areas and encounter bosses that don't quite often follow traditional boss policies. Because of this, it's especially intriguing to find out how these bosses compare to each other and explore which of them serves the innovative gameplay best. Even though you're fighting Krakow Jr. technically first, they don't differentiate from each other enough to split them up. Inspired by Kirby's block ball, in this minigame Kirby floats through the air and can only be used by drawing paddles to bounce him off. At the end of this minigame waits Krakow who uses his fluffy body to guard his weak point, the striking eyeball. On paper there's nothing particularly wrong with this battle as it's quite easy to beat this boss without any serious problems. It's most likely a simple case of skill issue, but I feel like I never got a feeling for his clash and just randomly pop into Krakow and hope it will hit his eye. The minigame is not necessarily designed to hit one specific spot consistently and it becomes especially frustrating when the cloud parts start to regenerate after some while. Krakow Jr is similar in that regard, admittedly much less tiring but still inconsistent. There's no strategy as you're simply going to dash at his weak point and simply hope you get through his shield. It's probably the 
the best they could have done for such a minigame, and it certainly does work to some extent, but it's nothing more than a mediocre battle. Even the king himself offers yet another challenge and tries to relive the good old days of gourmet race. Being placed in a running minecart, you have to draw an ongoing line and eat as much food as possible in order to power up and speed up. Unlike with Krakow, there's not an unlike version of DDD himself, but instead different courses with increased challenges. On your way, there are multiple obstacles as well as enemies to stop you from becoming too fast, and you can always see your nemesis in the background throwing hammers at Kirby. It feels very satisfying breaking through blocks and gaining more and more speed as the race continues, but this competition is also extremely repetitive. Looking at actual gameplay, it might appear like I'm moving moving strategically through the area and while this is true to some extent, you don't really have to play smart. Sometimes I get the feeling you can just win if you just move above and down consistently and probably get more than enough food simply by chance. It may not be true for the higher difficulty levels, but the regular race and the regular adventure offers no greater challenge and is simply an enjoyable time without any fluff. The first and, ironically, final boss that could be considered traditional. While every other opponent resembles a minigame with an overarching enemy watching you, Drossia falls into the category of a classic boss without any specific gimmicks. And due to the fact the player was never trained to face off foes like that, Drokia feels very safe in her battle design. By reflecting her energy balls with your lines, you make her taste her own medicine and go for the hit with some dashes. Throughout the clash, she creates some dangerous illustrations, dashes through the air and makes you uncomfortable by crying consistently. Even her art is fairly easy to counter and you can clearly tell the creators didn't want to introduce too much of a difficulty spike. The only way I can see to make the confrontation harder yet staying fair are the energy balls and how you reflect them. If your line turns to be slightly off you can actually redirect the balls as often as you like, as long as it's not touching the ground or floating away. Drossia could have created some kind of portals where you have to draw at least two lines in order to correctly reflect the attack but then again it could also be very fiddly, especially if you consider that this is only the first phase, hence giving you a taste of what will happen. It may not be too bad to experience a preparation before the actual climax. As you probably know by now and looking at the gameplay, Canvas Curse is quite the experimental spin-off and does not have any significant impact on the series on the surface. For the most part, this is true, but Drokia's soul is the exception and for whatever reason influenced almost every secret Kirby final boss to a huge degree. While Drosia herself didn't go as all out as you would expect from the antagonist, her soul ditches this idea completely and treats you like you have beaten the game multiple times. The legendary bouncing splitting into a thousand projectiles, dashing through the arena with a fiery passion, boomerangs cutting through the air and a simple scream left so much of an impression 
passion the developers must really love draws your soul. Look at whatever secret Kirby final boss and it's going to have at least one skill of this soul to copy. As crazy as this sounds, I had never the feeling the battle is unfair as you don't have to reflect any energy balls this time. Plainly tapping at the crazy soul or sending back her henchman is more than enough and for every hit Kirby is getting, you'll deal just as much damage back. To be honest, I'm quite surprised myself, but this artistry battle against the paint roller is the best and probably most fitting fight in the game. By giving you a little hint on what is to draw, you have to follow the lines in a specific order and cannot lift the touchpad from the screen until you're finished. If you do so, or mess up while drawing, this will drain some of your time, which initially might not be too detrimental. Then again, after some unfortunate missteps, the bombs shown at the beginning will start to catch up and once they touch curb, it's over. After a couple of rounds you come across a secondary short mini game, which is basically a measure from the game for you to slow down. However, if you're simply too unskilled to draw a picture, Kirby will simply move on but of course lose some necessary time. Once again, this is more of a mini game, but the combination with actually drawing while having those bombs walking on your neck on top of the fast paced soundtrack makes this battle way more intense than it should be. The first few rounds are always pretty doable, but if you want to go for all the medals and beat every difficulty, you should be prepared for something truly hellish. One thing that doesn't sit quite right is the accuracy of the touch pen. Connecting dots that are far apart are no problem at all, whereas cluttered, dense pictures can become almost impossible to beat without mistakes. And since the challenge is slowly increasing, you will face those hurdles often in a row, which makes it simply more and more unfair the more you go on. Still, this ultimate task is luckily optional and the standard fight during the adventure strikes a pleasing balance. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse is the successor to Canvas Curse, this time being placed on a home console and featuring a distinct art style not seen in the series before. The gameplay remained fairly similar, but bosses work quite differently to Canvas Curse, which we already ranked on this channel. While Canvas Curse presented major encounters as some sort of mini-games coated with classic enemies from the past, Rainbow Curse offers complete traditional opponents similar to a platformer. Let's see how these bosses work in comparison and find out which of them is the best. Starting quite simplistic, Mecha Kotter is the first mini boss and upgraded version of the regular enemies. Targeting different parts of his mechanical body, you're slowly destroying each component until the energy runs out and your foe loses. In fact, this battle is so simplistic it doesn't even present a health bar, but a good tutorial for a more elaborated opponent. I'm never a fan of health bars for bosses as they distract from your foe and only rarely make sense if not properly contextualized. Visual cues as to how much damage the boss has taken is always more interesting and I wish all the following adversaries would have followed this trend as well. Just like Mecha Kotter, Kotter, Deep Sea is the stronger variation of his weaker counterpart and second as well as last mini boss in this game. 
The special trait of this battle is the opportunity to fight while being transformed into a submarine, giving you much more flexibility in your movement. This flexibility, however, is not really needed as you will be focusing on directing torpedoes towards the unexpectedly speedy crab. Of course, it's not like you're safe underwater due to deep sea shooting his very own projectiles to keep you moving. The hustle is underlined by a pumpy quick tune and makes you wish there would be more of those mini bosses in the game. The Clayken is the last proper boss before the final and appears just like his colleagues twice throughout the game. According to his natural surroundings, the first encounter takes place underwater, where you are confronted with the spiky tentacles and comprehensive techniques. After surviving the barrage of attacks, the Clayken tries to end things fast and dashes through the arena, only to get stuck and leaving himself vulnerable. Even though this fray is perfectly fine in what you expect from the third boss, it's also a little too safe and unimaginative to be honest. The main challenge comes from navigating through underwater, where the controls feels noticeably different with Kirby naturally floating to the top. It's a fitting way to add a challenge, but not enough to carry the boss. Still, the detail of heavily muffling the music is much appreciated. The second encounter falls into a similar role of being plainly alright. Environmentally, the setting changed to the complete opposite and there's now smaller room to roll around. The hurdle of restricting controls are gone and you can perform precise moves again, which makes this variation a little easier if you ask me. There's still no special idea incorporated and I get the feeling the developers were simply going for the first idea they had, without brainstorming any other interesting concepts, despite the fact the game shows signs of brilliance regularly. After the obligatory wispy fight, it's time for the first proper original boss of the Rainbow Curse with Hoop Lagoon resembling some kind of ancient circular monstrosity. These boss names? Initially he comes across as a little too small and unintimidating, but as the battle continues, so does his growth and he nearly covers the whole battleground at the peak of the clash. Using the boss's volume to increase the difficulty naturally while you trained his skills before is such a clever way to add challenge and boost the boss's presence at the same time. The weak parts, his brown armor, is very obvious and dangerous lasers have to be dodged while moving around your foe. Normally Kirby bosses feature unfortunately only one boss theme throughout every regular encounter and although Rainbow Curse is not so different in that regard, it at least mixes the music up in order to fit to the setting. The reason why Hoop Lagoon is not any higher on this ranking is the second fight which takes place underwater. And this is sadly everything there is. The manipulated controls might increase the challenge in combination with the water flow, but the basic boss is basically untouched and completely the same. Only changing the controls and nothing else is very lazy. And Regarding how the game already reuses their main bosses, it's even more unfortunate concerning how promising the first encounter started. For many people, the true final boss probably remains on the last place, but I never really despised Dark Crafter for what he offered. It's by no means a fantastic final encounter, and I always regarded this battle as a cherry on top instead of an actual climax, similar like the truck sequence in Kirby and the Forgotten Land. In space, you take the form of a rocket chasing Dark Crafter, while he tries to hold you back with some bombs. The only thing you can do is to collect some stars, come close and simply touch your opponent whenever you get the chance. There's 
nothing more to the fight, which makes Darkcraft an extremely unpopular Kirby boss among players. One thing everyone can agree on, however, is the fantastic soundtrack, which seems to never disappoint. No Dark Matter, the boss. The rocket transformation proved some interesting ideas in the regular adventure and it's really a shame the creators didn't go for a similar creative premise, but it's very clear the game was created with a restrictive budget on a console no one had hoped for, also explaining the constant recycling of the regular bosses. Still, this is probably the most okay Kirby final boss in existence, only being holed up by its music. I demand applause as Wispy climbed his way up to the second place instead of being relegated to the introduction of a ranking. You might think this is a little undeserving as there might be nothing particularly noticeable during this clash. The Wispy fight however understands the very nature of the game like no other boss and emphasizes the gameplay and set of his character. What I mean by that is basically Canvas Curse where most bosses were technically mini-games but fit the gameplay style a lot more. I mentioned how awkward it feels to hit Hoop Lagoon underwater because drawing lines and moving Kirby around is not necessarily designed for bosses in the traditional sense of having an arena and an enemy to hit. Wispy stays always on the same spot and the only thing you have to do is maneuvering around obstacles and reach your goal. The same thing you do in the regular adventure and levels. The second fight mixes things up just fine, with Wispy having a nearly unbreakable skin. This time you have to collect enough stars for a mega dash, which is a perfect slight increase in difficulty in comparison to before. It might be the only time where the second fight is not drastically different from before, due to control shenanigans and simply expands on the idea with small touches. At the end of the adventure, the mysterious hands reveal themselves to belong to Glacia, Aline's former friend and master of claymation. With her passion for dangerous art, she guards herself with a shield and shoots spiky, slow balls at Kirby. Patiently waiting, you get the chance to strike them back if timed correctly and go for a counter-attack the moment Glacia drops to the ground. The basic strategy to win is surprisingly simple for a final boss, but it can be difficult to perfectly hit her creations with the correct angle. After that, some lasers shoot from above, while Glacia remains in the background and enjoying her time. The grey area around Kirby hinders you drawing any line and the only way to defend yourself is creating a couple lines to shield the moving Kirby. While the fight goes on, every attack escalates slightly in their executions and it becomes increasingly harder to avoid any damage. There's even the small fake out with a health bar diminishing extremely slowly suggesting there must be a more powerful way to plainly dash her. With some stars collected, you get the chance for an all out mega dash, evascerating the health bar and squishing Glacia to the ground. Ultimately, this fight isn't as elaborated or memorable as other Kirby final bosses, but serves the gameplay expressively fine. Due to the nature of the game, some moments and especially traditional battles can be quite janky, and while the spiky balls can confirm this idea, it's just enough to not become frustrating. Also, the music carries this heavy orchestral weight that is rather uncommon with the series. You get the sense of an opera playing in the background, which fits the specific art style surprisingly well and shows the finesse of the composers to adjust 
just their style to the respective game, instead of offering classic Kirby fanfare. Of course, there's still some small leitmotif symbolizing that Glacia is mind-controlled or as if Aline tries to reason while you're fighting, giving this final boss a very unique charm. Being the first mainline Kirby title on the DS, Squeak Squad was followed by certain expectations thanks to the unique traits of the double screen handheld. While the features and general quality left a little to be desired, there's still a dedicated group believing in the strength of this rather strange mainline entry. Luckily, all of this has nothing to do with the bosses and especially the striking Squeak Squad. Led by a bunch of charismatic personalities and offers itself interestingly for all sorts of memorable fights. It might be rare, but occasionally we receive a DDD clash right at the beginning of an adventure and for a change of pace Squeak Squad ditches the idea of serving yet another wispy fight. As exciting as this may sound, unfortunately this rendition of the Hammer Swinging King is as bare bones as you could imagine, with not a singular noticeable new skill to show. On top of that, it's so easy to completely cheese the fight with some abilities and there are even wispy battle harder than this. The only thing noticeable has sadly nothing to do with the brawl but the background instead. Because you're probably going to be bored while fighting, there's the nice easter egg of the monster summoning machine from the animation show. Maybe DDD should have used it instead of offering absolutely nothing to the table. For many players, this is probably not only the most disappointing boss in the game, but the extremely lackluster final boss of all time. After defeating the powered up Da Roach, you start to chase the true roots of evil and source of the secret treasure chest with Da Roach's mighty weapon. What follows is a appreciated build up to what should become a climax feeling like a joke. Dark Nebula is a one eyed star able to change his body to attack with different elemental skills. It's really hard to keep things short and not turn this section into a whole video why this final boss is most likely the biggest letdown in the franchise. The chase sequence before already feels it's a little awkward for some reason and even unnecessary to be honest. Fighting Dark Nebula himself isn't better as the whole clash feels so boringly slow without any highlights, new faces or general surprises. Most attacks are very easy to dodge and they repeat too often to mirror the variety Kirby bosses normally present. Also if you try to compete without the Roach's weapon and give yourself a little challenge, you will quickly notice how the creators didn't even take this consideration into account, waiting for a chance to inhale some projectiles can take ages and you will remain for quite some while in one of the corners. While Amazing Mirror's final boss only strangely ended but offered a great parade of battles, Squeak Squad shares the weird sudden ending but leaves no impression at all. There is a reason people consider Da Roach to be the true final boss of the game. And I guess you just have to imagine Dark Nebula is supposed to be the appetizer but served as a dessert. <laughs> It's unfortunate to say, but Meta Knight joins the group of underwhelming bosses and just like DDD, is way too samey to be a late game boss. While you can excuse DDD for being the first boss, Meta Knight is nearly identical to all the other renditions. You fought in the past with only one minor improvement. From time to time, Meta Knight attacks with powered up sword techniques, but I do not really want to praise the bare minimum. The fight itself might be nothing to gosh about, but at least there are some smaller noteworthy details. Normally in Meta Knight's encounters you are offered to take a sword, but this time it seems like Meta Knight does not want to go for a fair duel. This is because he 
mysteriously tries to stop Kirby from opening the treasure chest containing Dark Nebula. But to be completely frank, I can also believe the creator simply forgot to add the sword. Another neat detail is the sunken Hellbird from Superstar in one of the levels before, but due to this being a boss ranking, I cannot rank Meta Knight any higher for having some interesting easter eggs. It's at this point where it becomes very apparent who exactly created Squeak Squad. After beating her husband in the Amazing Mirror, Mrs. Mowley wants to take revenge and is the second boss of the game. Just like in the Amazing Mirror, she hides in the ground and throws with all sorts of trash after you. To give her a unique twist, Mrs. Mowley starts to appear in the background and jumps at you with a mighty crash. A small detail many players will not notice is how she loses a little energy once landing on the ground. It certainly makes the battle a bit easier, but adds to the immersion and is something you actually never see in the series. The Firebird Bobo follows directly after dogs intimidating machines and just like Mrs. Mowley reminds me of one of the mini bosses from The Amazing Mirror. However, this is only a personal feeling as this boss offers a completely unlike moveset and stays in the air nearly the whole time. The only occasion where the bird becomes too confident is when he goes for a dash only to stay a little confused if he crashes to the ground. You have to maneuver the boss rightfully to the ground since he will simply fly away if it's a wall. Of course some dangerous fire based attacks cannot be missed and generally speaking this is one of those bosses where it's quite hard to either critique or praise it. Everything is perfectly all right, but I do enjoy the wacky design and smug grin. Because there's not much to talk about the boss per se, I want to use this placing to commend the creators for adding the background to the fight occasionally. Bobo does not directly assault from behind, but incorporating the background in DS games is not too common, and if there would be a grandiose skill coming from behind, maybe the bird could have even rise up a little more in this ranking. The leader of the title reading Squeak Squad and trigger of the whole event, Star Roach secures the third place on this ranking. To be precise, there are two different Daroach battles taking place at different points in the game, with the first encounter only offering a decent enough initial challenge. He throws bombs, stays in the air and shoots a powerful ice beam across the arena. The ground might be frozen, but it's way too simple to plainly stay in the corners and wait for a chance to inhale one of the stars. He throws with his staff. This is not to say the first battle portrays some kind of letdown. It's very obvious he's holding back for his second round, and I always love the feature of fighting the main antagonist mid-game to get the first taste of what is to come. Furthermore, I appreciate the detail of presenting the Roach as a solid brawler and no pushover. The following cutscene clearly shows him being unfazed of Kirby, and after following the events of the game further, he gets possessed by Dark Nebula. Time for the next phase. Dark the Roach is, at his core, the same boss and only enhances each attack marginally. The once tiny bombs turn into a mighty explosion going to the ceiling, and a thin ice beam becomes a a voluminous laser forcing you to fly to the very top. There's still the chance to hide in a corner, but much less safe in comparison to before and the general sense of speed is completely different. With or without a copy ability, Dark Dark Roach is extremely difficult, especially on your first try and there's no shame in dying a couple of times. Just like another certain boss following on this list, the tornado ability proves itself to be noticeably helpful for a fast boss in the air. And if you have serious problems winning this supposed to be final boss, you should definitely consider using the ability. If you have watched my top 5 Krakow battle videos, this placing should not come off as a surprise considering my preference for robotic versions of established characters. 
Pi in the thunder clouds you meet a strangely looking Krako that seems to be a construction instead of the real one. Another suspicious moment is how the Roach commands Robot Krako into the fight, hinting at something that should reveal itself after fighting for a couple seconds. The first phase portrays everything you know from a classic Krako clash, with some slow dashes, thunderbolts and dropping enemies for you to inhale. The background perfectly emphasizes the mechanical grey style of your enemy and it's surprising to see how long it took them to put a Krako battle in such a scenario. As you have probably guessed by the Roach's inclusion, this robotic monstrosity was actually built and is controlled by Doc, the mastermind behind the squad and technical expert when it comes to creating machines. He's basically the farfall without speech issues and is responsible for my favorite Krako battle that isn't even the real Krako. The little moment of exposure is a sweet way to reveal the truth and shows another nitpick I have to question, missing boss names. In the amazing mirror, even regular enemies had their names shown once you heard them, but Squeak Squad for some reason only presents the health bar. Still, the missing name is nothing to do with the fight and the second phase is surprisingly hard if you're not prepared. The pattern of which Dog destroys the ground is random and if you're unlucky, there are more chances to fall down than survive. Especially a thunderbolt leaves only mere seconds to fly back, as Kirby's more stunned than usual and you will consistently struggle to not die by the bottomless pits. If you try this boss without a copy ability, it might be the hardest boss in the game, but just like with the Roach, the tornado ability is the perfect counter for this thundery encounter. After failing with the mechanical counterpart of Krakow, Doc tries to be fully innovative and creates a monstrosity fully dedicated to running over Kirby. I'm not even trying to pronounce the boss's name. Being chased from the left, not only do you have to be on your toes, but dodge flying rocks, small laser beams and the giant fangs of the scrap-like creature. I'm always a fan of those kind of chasing bosses that only slightly restrict your movement and require you to actually fight. Mario games are also no stranger to these playstyles, but in those cases you have to simply reach the end to win. It's not very replayable and I'm glad the creator still set up a proper confrontation with Kirby, having to delete a health bar. Speaking of health bars and my special relationship to them, the more damage Doc takes, the more chipped his robot will look. At first it's only one arm, then the other one, until he's not even able to shoot lasers anymore. What happens here is something only very rarely happens with bosses in video games, weakening them. Conventional level design tells you to make your opponent more angry, initiating a second phase and spicing things up in some shape or form. This case however is quite different and especially in the end, you're not fighting a boss anymore but a pathetic piece of junk clinging to the remaining power it has left. It's a little confusing why there is only one boss using such a feature which could have given Squeak Squad a unique twist to its bosses in comparison to other titles but it's still appreciated. Think of the monsters from Monster Hunter where the giant beasts become weaker the longer the fight continues. On paper it should not make sense but is overly satisfying and enjoyable to watch. It also gives you a sense of relief to better judge what kind of attacks will await. In a perfect world, this design orientation makes perfect sense if there would be a following second phase, maybe similar to Amazing Mirror's robot boss with Dog trying to escape and you're chasing him this time, but maybe this is also a sign that robot bosses are just always amazing. Kirby Superstar Ultra is one of the most beloved, if not the most beloved title in the series and substitutes as the perfect poster child how a faithful remake should look like. With a couple self-contained adventures and even more modes in the remake, it's self-explanatory to fight all sorts of different enemies, new and old, since the remake only adds a handful new foes and only alters known bosses very slightly. I decided to put both the remake and the original together, but will take the original's accomplishments into consideration and do not judge those bosses based on the standard when the remake released. Since this game features the most Kirby bosses of any Kirby game, there's no time to waste and rank over 15 bosses of Kirby Superstar Ultra.
As I explained in the introduction, Superstar isn't structured like a traditional platformer and offers multiple experiences based on a certain unique premise. To have a gentle approach to the game, the very first mode resembles a remake of the original's Kirby's Dreamland for the Game Boy, hence presenting those bosses nearly untouched. This is why Krakow, as well as some following enemies in this list, remain so low, because there is simply not too much new to talk about. Krakow dashes, shoots thunderbolts and drops enemies just like in the original and while the harder counterpart introduced in the second half of the game is not as brutal as in the origin's extra mode it's probably more suitable for the modern zeitgeist of Kirby. Still, I'm glad they even implemented those difficult variations this time. And there's nothing wrong seeing classic Kirby enemies with a pleasing pixel art style. Just like Krakow, the twins are basically the same fight, like in Dreamland, but I haven't mentioned one essential difference to the original. This is a modern Kirby title. What I mean by that are copy abilities, a feature missing in the original, making every boss way easier than before. This is only partially true in this case, as the battlefield is heavily restricted thanks to the tight layout that once emphasized the projectile-based fighting style of Kirby. You don't need to inhale the twins' blocks anymore and the whole dynamic of the battle changes, therefore. It might sound negative, but I'm not implying this is a bad decision, since you can perceive it as interesting to encounter those bosses with modern skills. Besides, the harder counterparts of the twins explore the idea of increasing the difficulty way better than Krakow by adding an additional layer and Gordos to increase the pressure. Unlike with Krakow, it's not nearly the identical battle and noticeably changed, giving the twins a fitting contemporary twist to their premise. Following the original's Dreamland boss quartet, Wispy obviously has to follow and is easier than ever before. Normally you would have to wait for some apples to shoot back, giving the battle a little room to breathe, but just like I mentioned with the twins, having a powerful ability ends the fight in an instance. It's not as bad as in today's games since Superstar as well as the remake have the small trick to deal damage in very brief intervals instead of consistently. In today's games you can inflict damage to your opponent as long as you perform some kind of attack, but in this game's case there's always this little gap to at least give the enemy some somewhat of a chance to strike back. Of course, this doesn't make Wispy any harder and the only reason why this tree is even higher than the former bosses is Twin Wispy. During the events of Meta Knight's Revenge, you are going to drop from the ship and land on the surface again, encountering Wispy a second time. This time, however, you have to face off two Wispies at each side of the arena. And while it does not really change the way you brawl, it's at least a little surprise you may not see coming. Moreover, having two opponents does underline the multiplayer of the game and if you venture with another player, everyone can target a foe to fight. Concluding the Dreamland Quartet, Kabula plays out a little differently from those other bosses. Initially a regular foe on your way through Dreamland, the original Superstar does not include Kabula in its short mini remake of the first Kirby game, and we should have to wait until its remake to get a proper revenge of DDD's grinning airship. Before entering Mount DDD, Kabula takes you down from the sky only to be rescued by the starship you used to fight Nova. The accompanying urgent music, a little cutscene before the fight, and overall atmosphere conveys a surprising sense of tension and feels unnecessarily climactic therefore extremely exciting. You get the impression it was always like that in the original and giving the starship one last shot during the post game makes everything feel a little more rounded. Fighting Kabla per se is very similar to Dreamland, with some quick dashes and consistent firepower from the enemy's side. In fact, it's even easier thanks to the power of the starship. And even though the battle could have handled an upgrade as well, Kabla is without a doubt the best improved original boss while staying very classy. Sick.
The final boss of Meta Knight Revenge and leader of the Halberd, Meta Knight awaits you as your last opponent in this fast-paced, action-packed mode. Coming straight from adventure, Meta Knight established himself as one of Kirby's all-stars and wants to test Dreamland's resistance by starting a great offensive. Countless foes and obstacles later, it seems like there's no hope for the ship itself left, but a fair duel to find out if Kirby can also overcome the Halbert's true core. Using the sword you're offered, the battle against Meta Knight is fundamentally akin to adventure, with new moves, a better sense of difficulty and unique music. A special shout-out to the wacky design of the original Super star with Meta Knight being a little bigger than his adventure counterpart, but still not as refined as the remake's model for example. Every new skill like the tornado is still used to this day and although it's hard to explain, it feels like his behavior is far more fair to predict while remaining challenging. The fight itself is not what makes this encounter so iconic, but culmination of everything you have seen in this mode before and even after you win the duel, there's still a short chasing sequence trying to escape the crumbling halberd and dodging Meta Knight last attempts to stop you. From the beginning to the end, Meta Knight's Revenge remains to be one of the best modes the game has to offer and even though there's no Halbert left to win Dreamland over, it was enough to obtain a Grammy. The first proper original boss and one of Meta Knight's defense system guarding his giant battleship, the Halbert. After causing serious damage, the reactor is the last remaining machine to take and therefore incredibly important for Meta Knight's goal of assaulting Dreamland. What I enjoy not only about this construct, but the upcoming combo cannon as well is how these are not characterized with eyes, floating arms or similar design patterns you see in Kirby games. It's a cold machine without any expressions, which leads to a very specific strategy to win. Unlike with most bosses, you cannot permanently deal harm and have to direct the reactor's lasers coming from small devices to the core crystal providing the halberd with necessary energy. Luckily the laser bounces from corner to corner, making a task that could become frustrating fairly bearable with the right sense of direction. Naturally, there has to be a challenge and fire from below or powerful flamethrowers at the front force you to either stand in the right place or make a quick jump to dodge. Although it's not necessary, you can actually destroy the flamethrower at the front, which is not linked to the health bar of the boss, but nonetheless an appreciated detail. Detail. It makes the overall boss fight more complex and gives you something to do while waiting for the next laser to come. Having those optional parts to take out reminds me of Star Fox, where a lot of bosses have those additional weak points attached to their body, sometimes implemented for a quicker way to deal damage or simply make the boss weaker. Robotic enemies obviously offer themselves greatly for such a feature and I wish more modern Kirby bosses would think about this idea again. The first of many bosses you will face in the Great Cave Offensive, a short self-contained open world mode with countless treasures. This side adventure is structured into different areas for you to explore, each of them containing one boss at the end of the road. Camellio Arm is one of them, a cheeky little creature able to adjust to his surroundings and make himself nearly invincible. Armored with small claws and a long tongue, this boss feels particularly unique, since there was never a foe playing with your ability to recognize your adversary properly. Of course, this isn't as hard as I make it out to be, and no matter which copy ability you carry, there are enough chances to strike from the ground or the air. It's a trend you're going to see from all of those bosses coming from the underground, but I'm glad they focused to make each of them distinct and individual enough to clearly differentiate them in terms of gameplay, design and general atmosphere. Probably the most disappointing yet promising encounter in the game. This sentence alone should create some confusion, considering the relatively high placement in contrast to how many bosses there are, but it's more like a mismatch between the amazing design as well as potential to actual fight. 
coming straight after the tutorial mode of the game, Dynablades mode doesn't increase the challenge too much and focuses on a traditional platformer adventure, with the classic level selection screen similar to a Mario title. At the end waits a proud mother, eager to defend her children and misunderstand the situation. If you have watched the animation show or played Air Ride, you are probably aware how powerful this Iron Bird is normally portrayed. Yes, those representatives only appeared after this game, and it's unfair to judge something based on a future it was not aware of. But even in Superstar, Dynablade is shown to be a more than capable fighter. The way she dashes from the background in combination with the scratchy sound effect demonstrates her speed and thanks to the armor, you can only damage by hitting her head. For a beginner, this fight could give you some trouble considering how there is not much space to hide and Dynablade switching positions consistently. For a basic first encounter, this would have been more than fine, but strangely enough, Dynablade is one of the very few bosses in this game to not receive a harder counterpart in the remake, a clear missed chance to underline her true strength. It's even worse that, to this day, this is the only proper Dynablade battle in the series, and despite the fact she only occasionally appears in modern titles as an easter egg, many newer fans still know about her existence, proving the impression she left on players. Something about her design strikes a perfect balance between colorful without appearing ridiculous, and I'm more than certain that one day she's going to cross the sky of dreamland again. It feels a little contradicting to say regarding the friendly design, but Fatty Whale poses one of the dangers awaiting you in the grounds of the Great Cave Offensive. The blue whale, prone to make a huge splash with his massive body, can be more difficult than you would expect. Regarding how the main damage you're going to take is probably going to happen thanks to touching his body. With a boss like that, you would expect him to remain mainly in the background and maybe show his head occasionally, but it's the complete opposite. Coming from left to right, appearing in the middle, using water to break down rocks or simply throwing you into the air are all skills surprisingly elaborated for not being the main adversary of the mode. And because the this is a 2D game placed on a console only able to mainly portray 2D graphics, the creators did a tremendous job in showing Fatuel from all those angles, making him way more flexible than he has any right to be. The foreplay to the true climax and cause of Mark's overwhelming power, Galactic Nova. This comet was summoned after Kirby's exhausting excursion through the galaxy and should have been the reason to end the Sun and Moon's conflict, the seed of this adventure. Before taking out Marx personally, Kirby has to stop Nova with the help of Sun and Moon, entering the wish-granting star with the starship, and naturally including a, at this point in the series, classic shmup section. By destroying each core of each pillar, Nova will be stopped for a moment and you can even see your progress in the background, cementing the fact that you're flying repeating rounds. For a Super Nintendo game, every implementation of the background is heavily appreciated. And even though the fight itself doesn't offer much variety or challenge, since it is the introduction to the final, there is still the attempt to differentiate this shmup boss from others you have seen before. The last foe on your quest to find every treasure, Wham Bam Rock, uses his rock solid hands and unearthly grin to offer a boss fight, unlike to everyone else in a game full of individual opponents. Despite the giant appearance of a golem, it's only the heads which are going to participate as your enemy, and in classic Nintendo boss fashion, also the weak points. They travel through the arena by walking on their fingers, clutch a fist, let some rocks fall or try to grab Kirby. Mechanically, there aren't really interesting ideas going on, although the premise seems particularly unique. The main challenge comes from avoiding attacks while trying to hit and even though the golem is far from difficult, it's still a fitting final test before ending the 
the Great Cave Offensive. I would even claim it's unfair to judge this boss on its own. It's a great luxury to receive so many unlike bosses in a singular mode, and the golem is the only icing on the cake. Still, if this is not enough, there's actually an additional secret boss in the remake when playing the Helper Arena. After going through every major boss, you meet the crystallized version of Wham Bam Rock, which sounds fancier than it actually is. Every technique is noticeably faster and all of your efforts are not as powerful as before. It's commendable to have one last surprise for the helpers as well, giving them a special encounter and celebrating one of Superstar Ultra's best modes again. Another one of the Halbert's impressive mechanical constructions and main means for the offensive. The combo cannon is yet another soulless machine and fires with bombs and an unobtrusive yet huge laser from the front. You have to attack the main cannon at the top while watching out for a slow arm coming from above throwing bombs at you. Once again there are a couple of targets to hit, like the aforementioned arms or laser cannon in front of you. Since you do not have to wait for a beam to appear and can attack the main cannon whenever you like, it's not really smart to waste time and go for optional hurdles, but more entertaining if you want to increase the challenge personally. Me. The only reason why I enjoy the combo cannon more than the reactor is simply the order in which they appear and their execution. The reactor comes after the combo cannon and is a neat last stretch to make you feel like you destroyed the halberd on your own, but the foundation is very similar to the combo cannon and basically a reskin. Furthermore, maneuvering lasers to your target sounds harder than it is and I find the combo cannon to be a little more difficult and pleasant, being able to strike whenever you like. As I stated, to this day, we do not really fight mere objects anymore and you could consider all of those industrial menaces to be one unified boss on its own, the Halbert. After traveling through dreamland, different galaxies and battling dangerous foes, Meta Knight reaches the end of his adventure and just like Marx is granted one wish to come true. Unlike the power-hungry maniac, however, Meta Knight does not thirst for fame, energy or wealth, but has only one wish he previously tried to compensate with Kirby, fighting the strongest warrior in the galaxy. Entering the top 5 of the Superstar Ultra bosses, there are only slight details in differentiating the quality between those behemoths. Galacta Knight starts with his debut in this remake, resembling the final boss of Meta Knight's very own campaign. Today, this legendary opponent doesn't leave as much of an impression as in the past, especially with the everlasting presence of Morpho Knight, but having another knight similar to the Lonely Swordsman was such an interesting idea, considering how no one expected such an elaborated new final boss. What's even more is how Galacta Knight's design mirrors the childlike design of the franchise with his friendly color palette. Dodging the edgy style Dark Meta Knight was going for, still his flashy pink in combination with the striking eyes create a certain sense of intimidation which is reflected in every attack he performs. It would have been easy to plainly copy Meta Knight's battle in the Halberd and simply add one or two new attacks, but Galacta Knight is completely original and doesn't play by any rules. The snow white wings allow him to permanently glide through the air and the pointy lance pierces the horizon with powerful beams. Regarding how this mode is post-game content and Meta Knight's overpowered additional abilities you can perform, I feel like Galacta Knight strikes a perfect balance of difficulty, not coming across as too unfair but just fine to force you to go all out on your first try. It's the perfect reward to having to go through what can be considered the same game again and there's a reason why this iconic knight should stay in the franchise to this day. The main antagonist of Superstar Ultra and first twist the villain when it comes to betrayal, Marx, left quite the impression on fans back in the day and is without a doubt one of the franchise's most memorable enemies. 
After bringing Kirby to summon Nova, he kicks the naive hero aside who wants to become a creature full of dominance and impossible to defeat. There might have been an unexpected turn of events in Kirby's adventure prior to Superstar, but I assume no one really foresee a twist villain coming. Taking advantage of Kirby is in fact an extremely clever move, but being aware of the pink glutton's potential and simultaneously underestimating the very being who helped you reaching your goal is something no twist villain will ever learn. Still, there has to be a fight first and with Mark's newly added wings and sinister laugh, you are in for one of the most iconic boss fights in the series. Judging this battle today, it's a little hard to praise the fight with the modern standard in mind. I always regarded Mark's as the blueprint for any contemporary Kirby final boss, using all sorts of wacky techniques, but in former days it was a huge upgrade from all those shmup climaxes, like Dark Matter or Nightmare. On top of that, Mark's skills are simply creative and especially on your first try, there are so many techniques you do not see coming, like the falling seeds immediately growing from below or the falling bomb splitting itself into two pieces. In the original, the clash already initiated an incredibly eerie aura, but the remake did a terrific job in improving on the animations, expressions and general sound design. It strikes this perfect balance of not turning too edgy, but feeling uncomfortable enough to create this uncanny tone the series occasionally tends to have. There may not be a glorious finisher or anything similar similar, but Marx offers an amazingly solid foundation for the future to follow and could definitely return as a devious background player, causing some shenanigans yet being wise enough to never mess with Kirby again. The main safeguard, the Heavy Lobster, always remained memorable to me, ignoring the fact it's a stylish looking robot. Its whole movement differentiates from other bosses by expressing no emotions whatsoever, and the strong mechanical footsteps make the soundtrack this boss is accompanied by feel incomplete. After all, it's not like you have to face the robotic lobster once, as there's one attempt to get rid of Kirby from the halberd. Naturally, this was destined to fail, and after re-entering the giant battleship, it's time to settle things completely and destroy your enemy once and for all. The sequence starts with a short chasing scene, something I always appreciate as the appetizer before the fight. It's not too long to become annoying even after multiple tries and sets Heavy Lobster up as something to be reckoned with. Surprisingly enough, the fight itself is quite simplistic, with a handful of attacks repeating themselves quickly if you take your time. Winning shouldn't pose a problem unless you want to make use of a specific gimmick, only possible in this encounter. By inhaling one of the Heavy Lobster's slimes, Kirby gains the paint ability, a one-timer skill just like Crash, but with the side effect of not destroying your opponent with one hit, but making him blind and confused. Technically, Heavy Lobster doesn't become weaker, as all of his techniques stay the same, but it feels like the AI doesn't function properly anymore, and it's genuinely a pleasant easter egg to make sure the battle receives a memorable factor. I wish more modern bosses would inherit a special way of defeating your foe, and Heavy Lobster perfectly shows that it doesn't have to make the fight significantly easier, but plainly turning the events into a different direction is arguably even more worth the inclusion. It may sound like an exaggeration, but the computer virus is not only one of the best bosses in this game, but one of my biggest favorites in the series. Everyone who played the game is most likely familiar with the special concept of this boss, but for all the people who want to understand the gist in one simple sentence, it's an RPG boss put into a platformer. Like most bosses in this list, there are different variations of this encounter, but every time you fight the computer virus, you have to defeat three enemies in a row and bring their health points to zero. A text box at the top comments on the events tells you when to attack and when your enemy strikes, as well as congratulating you on your win. Each opponent can only perform a handful skills to not oversell their welcome, and you get even a nice indicator on how much damage each of your attack deals. This could be considered a hot take, since on regular playthroughs it can be annoying to go through all those little comments and the whole fight feels rather slow once the surprise dwindles. Still, it's an extremely creative take on the genre, especially for the first time when the original Superstar released, and I would love to see more of those strange, unexpected foes in future titles.
Initially, it might appear like a surprise for everyone who played the game to put a boss like DDD on the first place in a ranking full of memorable encounters. Just like the first placings, the original DDD Brawl is simply a remake of the original Dreamland, but way easier and overall beginner friendly. While this aspect of the fight doesn't sit quite right with me, the visuals are massively upgraded and although you battled in an arena before, this time the whole scenario is much more elaborated, with striking colors and a proper audience. DDD himself looks extremely detailed and expressive thanks to the masterful pixel animations, mirroring the same amount of power they used back in the day to make the original DDD DDD just as punchy. For a remake, they probably couldn't have done better, but all of this would not justify the first place. Superstar Ultra introduces a couple of new adventures and one of those is Revenge of the King, a mode similar to Revenge of the Meta Knight, but being based on the extra mode of the very first Kirby's Dreamland. This is also where you fight all those harder versions of known enemies I mentioned at the beginning of the video, but the true highlight is obviously the King himself. At the end of this difficult excursion, you find your yourself in an empty arena with only one viewer, the battleground being closed by an electrified cage. Unlike with the only slightly altered, harder counterparts of former bosses, DDD truly wants to step up his game, armors himself with an iron mask and upgraded version of his trusty hammer. What follows is a clash between rivals unseen for the franchise before, where Kirby is going to be bombarded with heavy swings, rockets and claustrophobic atmosphere. Obviously, it's still a far cry from a serious challenge and it will most most likely not to take you more than two tries, but Kirby games never have to be seriously brutal in their difficulty, and Mask DDD strikes this perfect balance of keeping your eyebrows high without breaking your controller. The number of details are similarly important to notice, with DDD offering you a hammer before fighting, making the fight easier but equitable while Bandana watches as the only viewer from behind. Gameplay wise, the cage is a brilliant way to higher the stakes, since you are not allowed to fly endlessly and dodge every attack. Instead, you have to keep a certain height, adding a little dexterity to the battle and incorporating something I would like to see be implemented more often into bosses, Kirby's floating ability. Even if all of this is still not convincing, it's not only about the fray itself. Until the release of Superstar Ultra, players fought countless DDD battles and it must be always hard to come up with a new idea or concept as to why DDD acts villainous in the first place. Longtime viewers probably already know my stance towards friendly DDD, but I always enjoy joined his cunning side way more, even if his motives are as simple as stealing food. So having this personal, intense rivalry being played out in such a face-to-face -face manner, without any unnecessary words and scenario, is so much more impactful for those two characters that do not need to despise each other to bonk their hammers. All it takes is the main hero and the main antagonist of the series to finish a game, or in this case, mode, and it's not without a reason that Mask DDD remains to be DDD's most memorable showdown in the franchise. It would have been a shame to leave out this iconic battle considering how Superstar Ultra contributed a fair share of recognition to someone who's considered as one of the main cast of the series. Bandana Waddle D, or simply Bandana D, assists King DDD in Revenge of the King and banters with him throughout the mode. It's mostly panicking, as Kirby steamrolls through every obstacle and after there's no hope left, the brave Waddle D takes his destiny in his hands and does everything to protect his king. Naturally, this battle is not a serious showdown and instead a mere regular enemy encounter with a boss health bar. He has no spears or umbrellas from modern titles and plainly walks towards Kirby, with the confidence every final boss would bow to. Although Bandana D receives no options to harm Kirby, I still appreciate how they gave him his own health bar, showing how this Waddle D is a little above a regular one. Even after defeating this intimidating opponent, he still cheers for King DDD during the climax, proving how he is not only loyal to Kirby in modern titles, but will never forget where he came from.
Kirby's Epic Yarn might be the most dense spin-off in the series with its multiple worlds, collectibles and secrets offering a complete package some mainline titles cannot follow. Back in the day, this charming adventure was dismissed because of its not existing difficulty and not being able to completely die. It's more like a Sonic game where each hit robs you some gems, necessary for 100%. Of course, there are also a couple unique bosses functioning a little different due to Kirby's changed abilities. I'm going to judge them just as usual but will determine their difficulty by the challenge of keeping your gems and obtaining a gold medal. The first boss of the game and introduction of how Epic Yarn wants to design them. Because this is a rather different kind of Kirby game, bosses play out a little differently and unlike in most Kirby titles, rely mostly on the three hit pattern you see in many traditional platformers. Another difference is the way you deal damage. It's not a consistent struggle where you can strike whenever you like as long as you keep your copy ability. Also, Kirby cannot jump on the enemy's head, so they require you to stay patient and wait for an opportunity. This is alone makes Epic Yarn very unique as a game in the franchise. So how does Fangora execute this idea in practice? Very safe due to the extremely beginner friendly nature of the game. His appearance might be more on the intimidating side and I really appreciate the fact we're not confronting Wispy this time. It becomes very tiring to write about Wispy a million times, but the fight itself is very uncomplicated. The only way for this monster to attack are small firebolts and his pointy tongue, which leaves a chance to flick it. Besides, the short battle cries and wind blows to keep you away are not necessarily attacks or add difficulty to the fight, but are nice details I always enjoy in boss battles. They give the boss a certain presence and not every design choice in a boss has to serve some serious purpose. It reminds me of the chit chats in Ahead in Time, which technically are not needed for a good boss, but make the difference between a good and a brilliant one. Fangora is obviously not on the same level, but I do want to emphasize the importance of such small details that can make the difference. Another visual element is the way some bosses will start to look worn out the more damage you inflict. As I always say, I enjoy it way more if boss health is portrayed by visual factors. And despite the fact it's obvious how often you have to hit your opponent, it's still an appreciated detail. Going by the regular order of the game, this Count Dynablade is the ruler of the volcano and guards a piece of the magical yarn with his flaming wings. Just like with Fangora, the basic strategy requires you to grab one of the bird's projectiles, throw them back and flick the boss through the arena. It's a trend that continues with some bosses in the game, but I extremely enjoy how mighty Kirby wrestles those enemies through the air instead of giving them a light bump on the head or simply lashing them. It adds impact to each hit. And making collector gems much more satisfying. Also, the bird's design, just like many other foes, looks so detailed yet simplistic and you have to be always aware that Epic Yarn was created by a different team, hence showing a great sense of expertise when it comes to designing new Kirby foes but with a unique touch. The fight itself is very much appropriate for a second boss and feels clearly challenging, with a lava attack that requires you to stand on a platform being the highlight. There is no way to recollect most of your gems once you you lose them so each hit counts and can make this boss more challenging than you think.
It was mandatory to happen and just like with a certain king following, Meta Knight was possessed by Yin Yan's magic power and therefore tries to stop you in the last regular world of the game. Going through my past experience with Meta Knight battles, you are probably aware how much I dislike the similarity between them. Since his debut in Kirby's Adventure, not much has changed when it comes to those duels, which is a shame regarding how creative the creators tend to be in Wispy's or DDD's case. It's still not as outgoing as I would like to see, but Epic Yarn's Meta Knight at least focuses on an aspect that is never really touched on the blades. Kirby's not harming Meta Knight directly in this confrontation and instead disarms the Lonely Knight in order to bring him back. Because of this, all those blades perform different attacks, with a small increase of challenge. What makes it even more harder is the agility Meta Knight performs. He was always on the quicker side and hard to hit, but without copy abilities and only a few chances to strike back, you have to be permanently on your toes to win. On top of that, I greatly appreciate how Meta Knight mainly flies throughout the fight, instead of jumping as you usually does. There's not one big feature setting this rendition from other Meta Knight battles apart, but many small adjustments that can make, once again, a big difference. Meta Knight was not the only victim of Yin Yan's great campaign to conquer Dreamland and set the self-proclaimed king also into the Yarn world. Fitting to his physical similarity to an arctic bird, DDD is the boss of the ice world and controlled by a strange construct, maneuvering his movement. I like how he casually walks into Kirby suggesting he was lost the whole time and just exploring this unknown world. This peaceful manner should change, however, and once each string is attached to his coat, it's time to duel. Just like with Meta Knight, there are theoretically a thousand ways to design a DDD brawl, no matter how often he appeared as a foe in the franchise. It's all about creativity and I'm glad Epic Yarn does not rely too much on the past and puts its own twist to this lifelong rivalry. I already mentioned it with Fangora, but having four visible strings displayed is a fitting way to present how much total energy your opponent requires to be diminished. Also, they increase the mandatory hits to win to four, which is not extraordinary crazy, but nonetheless a light increase in durability on the enemy's side. As much as all of this is new, DDD obviously performs some well-established skills like swinging his iconic hammer and leaving star bits to throw back. Once you land a strike, the only thing left is to stomp his back and destroy each string. Something about this flow of fighting has a special charm to it, not harming your foe directly and instead only targeting the construct that holds him back. It's fundamentally the same just like with Meta Knight and normally Kirby simply beats them until they are free. Unlike with Meta Knight, however, I feel like there is one interesting signature move missing, but I'm still more than pleased about how they handle those classic adversaries. It does not happen often, but Epic Yarn features an underwater boss thanks to the pleasing underwater controls. In case you haven't noticed, in this game Kirby automatically transforms to whatever fits the situation, be it a car when sprinting or turning into an umbrella when falling. This goes for underwater sequences as well and due to your flexibility to move around as fast as you like, Kepamari is a natural fit for this game. Appropriate to his name, the first phase plays out quite uniquely, with the monster hiding his weak point under a thick, multi layered coat of yarn. You have to consistently win the loose part of this hat until it's exposed and shifts his strategy. What I enjoy about this setup is the unlike way of progressing in the fight. Normally you have to wait until it's your moment to turn the tables, but in this case, you can inflict damage whenever you like. The only thing Kirby has to be aware of are the tentacles, which force you to move around while winding. I have not mentioned it yet, but the two player mode shines brilliantly in such a scenario with one player focusing on beating the boss and the other trying to defend. Playing alone increases the challenge while the other option emphasizes teamwork, the perfect combination and mindfulness of keeping both playstyles in mind without restrictions. Once Kepamari loses his cool, it's time for something not every boss goes for 
in this game. A second phase. He tries to hide in the dark or sneaking up to your butt. Luckily, it's pretty obvious where your foe remains. And the only thing left to do is landing some powerful hits. Ultimately, it's a great escalation of what you expect from the fourth boss. And I really have to comment how subtly yet noticeable the creators managed to let those opponents rise up and challenge complexity and overall impression. For a Kirby game, it's not very uncommon to place the final boss so high on the ranking, even in spin-offs like Epic Yarn. Yin Yan is the magician behind this whole Yarn chaos and turned Dreamland into his place of dreams. I praised it already during my Kirby 64 ranking, but I enjoy how needless the transition between level selecting and the fight is. There are no cutscenes, dialogues or whatsoever and it feels like both parties want to settle this conflict, once and for all. Also similar to 64 is the soundtrack, which sounds noticeably comparable to 64's regular boss theme and creating a pleasant, fast-paced contrast to the calming melodies you heard throughout the game. Still, the fight starts with a feature I always like to see, recycled bosses. There is something intimidating about Yin Yan being able to recreate those former opponents with ease, but far less powerful. It's only Fangora and Kappa Mari with both of them renouncing time-consuming skills and having only one health point. Normally Kirby bosses are reused before the final in a level for instance. But having them directly during the final boss is a fresh breeze and should not diminish Yin Yan's actual skills. Occasionally he drops dark curtains with only one exit and you have to jump to escape his barrage of attacks. It's a very interesting attack for a 2D platformer boss, emphasizing the platforming aspect and incorporating the whole arena to the mix. The only moment to seriously strike back is when Yin Yan creates some regular enemies for you to grab, giving you an option to smash your foe through the air, despite the fact the final boss is not really present most of the time and only glides at the top occasionally, it feels like you consistently hide yourself from all sorts of dirty tricks and surprisingly enough, it doesn't take too many hits for you to seemingly win. We are still talking about the Kirby game and there has to be at least one additional phase to round things up. Yin Yan turns into some sort of robot and with Meta Knight's help, Kirby obtains a mighty transformation himself. This second half is not really about bringing an interesting new perspective to the final, as you're going to simply shoot with all your stamina until you win. It's similar to most modern Kirby finals with one climactic finisher, using the gimmick and because the first phase already convinced with its multi-layered situations. This final brawl is the perfect cherry on top of a charming spin-off. Coming into the fight, it's already clear enough something will be different as the eyes of many Waddle Dees watch you. This sentiment should be proven right and Squashini makes himself ready to deliver the best boss fight in the game. The premise of a magician understandably leaves so much potential for a creative magic around and the roulette in the middle of the arena is the main cause of a couple dangerous tricks. Each combination stands for a different technique and they are more than enough to give the fight the variety you know from other Kirby games. The concept by himself might not be innovative per se and was used many times in other games but feels fresh for Kirby. The only downside I can see is the downtime between each round, particularly if you replay the game and know what to expect. The fight can be a little slow but first impressions are everything and the idea makes it worth. My highlight is the surprising rope attack where the curtains fall and the boss ties Kirby to a giant bomb. Escaping might not be too hard and there's plenty time to get free but you can use the additional time to farm some gems. Something about this attack is so surprising it really left an impression on me and this is the kind of one special technique I was missing for other bosses. Squashini himself carries on the fantastic simplistic design, offers a great soundtrack and overall secured the first place by presenting a truly creative show.
You would expect the last Kirby title on the DS to be one of the mainline entries, but Mass Attack ended this successful era of the franchise with one of the most unique titles in the series full of strange experiments. Divided into multiple Kirbys, you navigate with a group of pink gluttons all at once and attack as a group instead of using Kirby's trademark skills. Just like with other spin-offs, this concept offers itself greatly for interesting boss opportunities. And without giving away too much, you would be surprised how unexpectedly ambitious they are. In order to not create any confusions or mix enemies together, I'm going to focus only on the main bosses at the end of each world, just like I do with the mainline titles. Also, the slightly harder variations at the end of the game will not be ranked separately and put together with their original version since they don't change things up too much. No matter how outlandish the premise of a Kirby game is, you can always count on Wispy to appear in some shape or form and this time it goes into the sky. By destroying parts of his wooden body, Wispy starts to increase his height and hides himself at the top screen without a chance to reach him. Slowly taking each segment apart is the key to victory and surprisingly enough, this battle becomes much easier with only a few Kirbys. The balance of this gameplay lies in keeping as much Kirbys as possible in your group to expand your attack power but leaving yourself more vulnerable for the opponent's attacks. It's basically like a heavyweight in a fighting game. The bigger and stronger your squad is, the more likely it becomes to receive hits. Classic wispy skills like falling fruits become much more difficult to dodge and while you can tank some damage and receive Kirby's once they try to go to heaven, many players will try to go for the gold medal which requires you to leave the battle uninjured. Wispy himself guards his body parts with either covering them in bouncy mushrooms, flicking your Kirby's across the arena or spikes. Other DS Kirby titles never really made use of the double screen of the handheld and it's a little odd to see the final entry to utilize a feature that can enhance the experience quite a bit. Wispy's harder counterpart only increases the speed of the fight and general challenge in a very slight way, which is something every boss will do as well. One thing I need to complain about now before mentioning it every time is the boss music. For some reason, nearly all of Mass Attack's main bosses use a new rearrangement of King Dedede's theme. There's nothing wrong with this iconic piece of music, but admittedly a little ill-fitting to simply utilize it for a standard boss. Mass Attack consists of such a fantastic soundtrack. In fact, it was partly done by the same composer of Mother 3 and I would have loved to see a unique musical take on this unique spin-off. After the mandatory Wispy encounter, it's time for the first proper original boss of the game and second main enemy of World 2, Lady Ivy. Being placed on a shaky metal plate, you have to press down the battlefield and hit the antagonistic plant's head with as much Kirby's as possible. You will see this trend later on, but Mass Attack tries to succeed in making every main boss a true memorable confrontation with unlike premises how to fight. Wispy required you to simply flick Kirby's with no necessity for a big group. Lady Ivy, on the other hand, plays with the weight and the more Kirby's you have, the easier it becomes to let the metal plate fall. Of course, you have to be as fast as possible as the quick head bump your opponent does before getting confused throws all the Kirby's to the other side, giving you less time to react back. The main challenge comes from keeping an eye out at the top screen with multiple obstacles falling from above. Sometimes it's little needles, but often Lady Ivy can summon weak enemies only there to hurdle the balance of the plate. The only annoying downside I see with this concept is waiting for your turn. Once you miss the chance of executing a strike, there's the chance of waiting through all the long-winded attacks again. The only inconvenience in an otherwise surprisingly individual battle for being the second boss.
So far, we are going with the order of the game and fitting to his triple letter name, King DDD catches the third place. After infiltrating his peaceful resort, there's luckily no forced possession plot this time, but a good old clash between those classic rivals. With DDD hiding at the top screen in his hot air balloon, you have to kick his bubble bombs back and line up the correct timing to hit the self proclaimed king with a mighty explosion. Some of those bombs fire up quicker than others, and if you don't get a rhythm for how to encounter this game of timing. It can turn into quite the chaos with a lot of injured Kirby's. After enough explosions, DDD drops to the ground giving you a chance to assault him which is not necessary to win. Both direct hits and the explosions deal damage so while the basic gameplay loop might be a little tricky, it shouldn't be too exhausting to win. After the first phase, DDD goes for a direct confrontation and swings his hammer, guarding his body. By switching the right side at the right moment you get the chance to attack his Back, ultimately winning the battle. With only a handful bosses in this game, at first I was hesitant about DDD's inclusion after Wispy was already taking a slot. New enemies are much more appreciated than title like that, but luckily the creators deliver with a creative take on the king's battle style. As I mentioned before, this clash goes for something different again and underlines the dexterity aspect of the game. Juggling the bombs with the right timing and keeping an eye out for both screens makes amazing use of the features of the DS and while it's easy to call Mass Attack too gimmicky, it's also extremely confident in utilizing the handheld special traits like no other title before. My one real downside with the brawl is one missing surprise in some shape or form. The whole staging is kinda one-sided and for the third boss I expected at least one unexpected turn of events. DDD's harder counterpart doesn't deliver on that front either, but I was still enjoying this old rivalry on DDD's personal resort. It would have been perfect to follow the game's progression, but the final boss and puppeteer behind Mass Attack, Necrodius, misses the top and dwells on the second place instead. After this intimidating monster separated Kirby into multiple pink balls, your moment for revenge comes and without any dialogues or cutscenes, the climax is about to start. Going with classic Nintendo fashion, you have to take out his robust skeleton hands first, before heading for the head. Only the backside of each fist is vulnerable and can only be damaged by flicking, which is why it's important to waste no time. One smash with the hand is enough to take out a Kirby immediately, and Necrodius' technique of putting his fists together to lure you in might give you an opportunity to counter, but is also a trap which can kill every Kirby at once if you're too greedy. After putting your enemy into a corner, the second phase begins without solid ground, and even though you're now floating, it's just the underwater controls. Luckily, unlike in most games, they are quite comfy to use, giving you free range to move around and gather every Kirby at once. Hiding in corners, Necrodius occasionally appears and charges a powerful laser, but leaving himself open for a counter-attack. It's a similar case like with the hands, where you must balance how much damage you want to deal, or play safe and retreat after a couple seconds. Naturally, his little henchmen cannot be missed out and stall the battle with their number instead of actual force. The second phase seems to be quite easier, considering how much space and time there is to avoid most antagonistic skills. There is something of a climax at the end, but nothing that rivals the highs of other Kirby finals. It does not have the overwhelming, frame rate destroying chaos of Yin Yan or eerie atmosphere of Drossia's soul, but seems comparable to Amazing Mirror with the clumsy, sudden transition to the ending sequence. This is also the main reason why Necrodius could not be put on the highest place, since just like with DDD, there is something missing. Be it an additional phase, final attack to avoid, or any kind of climactic 
finisher. The whole battle feels too straightforward and ironically doesn't play with any unseen twist to a feature. This is not to say Mass Attack's final is bad, as it makes use of every skill you learn throughout the game and does not come across as frustrating or overblown. Still, I wish Necrodius would have been as intimidating as his design and maybe present one last trick to truly impress me. There's something special about larger than life colossus and fighting them, especially as someone as small as Kirby, really sells the point of a David vs Goliath confrontation. Skull Lord is such an opponent and sits at the top of an active volcano bombarding your squad with fiery rocks and all sorts of dangerous hazards. By defending the platform which transports you from all those attacks, you come closer and closer to your target and ultimately tackle the beast directly. Here the battle continues to a little dexterity section with timed cannons to inflict damage by shooting straight into his head. After that, the whole ordeal repeats, but this time you must collect the former destroyable rocks and have to be more cautious about your movement. It goes without saying that Skull Lord is the most exceptional boss among Mass Attack's selection of enemies and while it might be a little too gimmicky for some players, I greatly enjoyed the remarkable setup to offer something surprising. After three bosses, utilizing the game's tricks and controls to the fullest, there was only so much to be done with Mass Attack's concept, and even though it's most likely a mini game to some extent, there's still more than enough standard gameplay you learn throughout the game. The first phase incorporates everything you know, and it's only the second phase where things become situational. On top of that, this is the only boss to present a unique boss theme apart from the final boss, something that should have done for every other one as well. Generally, this is one of those bosses that works with the limitations of the hardware amazingly, and there's never a point where it feels dull or unoppressive. The presence of Skull Lord having a special theme, the varied gameplay and more than satisfying length makes this boss, rightfully so, the best battle in the game. <laughs> With Kirby's Return to Dreamland setting the standard for modern Kirby bosses, it was triple deluxe purpose to build on that foundation and explore what those enemies can bring to the table. Freshly added backgrounds and the 3D effect promised some multi-layered puzzles, but how would the bosses take advantage of the evolved design philosophy of the 3DS? Triple deluxe may dwell in the shadows of its much more popular modern entries, like Planet Robobot or Return to Dreamland, but presents the probably best bosses in any two-dimensional Kirby games. A brave assumption to make regarding all the quality titles in the series, but you will definitely understand by watching each placement to the end. As usual, I'm going to combine every regular boss with their DX counterpart, since they only slightly change the initial fight and don't warrant their own ranking. Also, every unique supernova battle will also be ignored and not counted as a true boss due to their simplistic nature. One of the most infamous bosses in the series for all the wrong reasons. 
Pyribit, Pyribit resembles a frog-like creature dwelling at the end of the last regular world in an active volcano. Its appearance might be on the harmless side, but all the fiery attacks prove the opposite, and he really gives his position of guarding the final world justice. Due to being so versatile, it's quite common to see this boss jump between fore and background periodically, which may be a strong point for other following foes on this list, but Pyribit's downfall. As you've probably guessed, having to wait for the boss to give you a chance to strike back can become quite annoying, especially regarding how often this frog likes to disappear. Almost all of his attacks strike from the background, which does not necessarily make the fight harder, but simply more drawn out. Another reason why so many people do not enjoy this boss has nothing to do with Triple Deluxe as such. Normally I try to leave out other Kirby games when it comes to discussing bosses since another game's hiccup has nothing to do with the topic we are talking about, but it's just too tempting to miss out for this exception. The free-to-play spin-off title Super Kirby Clash for the Switch is a collection of one of the most iconic bosses of modern Kirby, and Pyribit is a part of this best-of. The fray is basically unchanged, with the main difference of having a timer on every clash. You're probably aware what I try to say. The constant jump between fore and background clashes directly with the time pressure of Super Kirby Clash, which makes the Pyribit missions one of the most frustrating ones in the game. Whether or not it was intentionally done does not really matter, since once again it's not adding to the challenge and raises frustration. Still, there are some strong qualities like a special trump card summoning lava mountains similar to the one of the bosses of Kirby 64, or mudding your view after shooting with a massive flamethrower. Fighting this extraordinary boss for the very first time, there's actually not too much to complain about, but in the unique context of the series in consideration of other titles, you will certainly start to despise this nimble frog quite quickly. No Kirby game without a wispy battle, and this time it's the colorful counterpart Flowery Woods, emerging from a timid flower manipulated by the magic power of Taranza. What is so memorable about this rendition is the fact that Flowery was most likely the first time a Wispy Clash tried to offer something beyond the tutorial boss. Usually in the past we only received smaller gimmicks that were certainly nice touches, like the chase sequence of Kirby Streamland 3, but didn't quite make the Wispy battle that fantastic. When starting the assault you would actually get the same impression about Flowery, but just like with basically every modern Kirby boss, the true fight starts when entering the second phase. All of a sudden Flowery jumps to the background, something I did not see coming when first playing the game. Theoretically only very few moves have changed as they make use of the 3D effect, but don't become harder to dodge. The highlight are the long flexible routes with two giant Oshis catching you off guard if you're not prepared for their smash. It may sound like Flowery suffers from the same fate as Pyrobit by staying too long in the background, but whenever you get the chance to strike back, there's enough time to end the battle quite quickly. Flowery Woods essentially set a new standard for upcoming Wispy Woods fights and truly elevated the one so plain, standardized rivalry into something worth talking about. Just like Flowery, Krakow portrays one of Kirby's all-time rivals, with the main difference that this is his first major appearance in a modern, traditional mainline title. 
Similar to his wooden colleague, nothing seems to be too noteworthy at the beginning, as Krakow only uses some easy to avoid electric shocks and dash attacks. When it's time to step up the game, of course this boss also makes use of the background. Unlike with every other boss though, Krakow requires you to switch layer due to a giant thundershock crossing the whole battlefield. It adds tension to the fight and small bottomless pits can even end the run in an instance. A small detail many players are probably not aware aware of is how the game lowers the difficulty when it thinks you have troubles. The bottomless pits will be filled out, something I'm not too fond of, but it was likely already brave enough for a modern Kirby game to even add those traps. Still, Krako is not depending on those small obstacles and carries some more surprises in his lofty body. These little spikes turn into huge drills perfect for some fast dashes. It may not be hard to counter, but looks all the more impressive instead. Since then, there was only Star Allies giving this resistant weather beast another proper try, and regarding how much potential Triple Deluxe already showed, we can only wonder what they will create next. Going by its vague theme, World 2 makes it hard to predict what kind of opponent will await you. The game manages it to mix all the settings with interesting twists and ignoring the level thumbnail everything could wait to stop you. The answer is Paint Drawer, an artistic magician with the ability to turn pictures into real objects, similar to Adeline from Kirby 64. Her design is heavily reminiscent of Drossia from Canvas Curse, which explains the similarities in skills. Still, it's not like she contains the same tricks and even makes use of the 3D effect by hindering your vision. The enemy might be small, but her arsenal of attacks seems to be endless and I can only praise how much variety Kirby bosses bring to their fights when it comes to unpredictable techniques, not to speak of smaller easter eggs that shouldn't be left unnoticed. Compare this hectic brawl to Return to Dreamland's second magical fray and it becomes clearly apparent how much of an upgrade Triple Deluxe is in comparison to its predecessor. The beauty-seeking Bee Queen Sectonia holds the strings behind the whole premise and reveals herself to be the main antagonist after Taranza failed in his task to kidnap the hero of the lower world. Not counting the slight spoiler a collectible is responsible for when trying to complete the adventure 100%, you always have the feeling something greater must be behind all this fiasco. Her design suggests a majestic yet ignorant creature with egoistic goals in mind, and this attitude is perfectly reflected in her battle. The way she moves through the arena in combination with her seductive voice, by the way it's Kirby's voice actor, emphasizes a unique style many Kirby final bosses do not go for. Another thing that separates her first battle from other bosses are the three distinct faces with increasing escalation. In the beginning it comes across as if she's observing your skills, without going all in in any kind. Quick sword swings, classic teleportation or magical projectiles give a taste of what the queen is capable to do. But after some while it's time to shift this duel into the background on a giant crystal. Gameplay wise nothing changes too much, with the addition of some minions and new techniques. It's only after that that when Sectonia seems to lose her patience and moves unpredictably through the air. These whimsical teleportations are very hard to dodge on first try, but after some while you see the pattern where she appears. Every other skill remains the same or is only slightly improved. This initial encounter is the perfect serving plate for what is to come, and after winning you clearly get the feeling this wasn't everything, since there is still an unobtrusive glooming flower in the background.
For some reason, the Coily Rata always struck me as a peculiar boss among the series. Something about the design, animations and premise seems so unique to me, which can only be viewed in a positive light. To increase the challenge in a minor way, it's only possible to deal damage by attacking the head, which is why the archer ability might be an ideal recommendation regarding the precise use of arrows. Even so, you still have to dodge the quick, unpredictable patterns of the ancient snake, who will linger in every corner of the arena for sneaky attacks. As usual, the first phase holds itself back a little to introduce the stakes. But once the second phase starts, so does every part of Rattler's body and he divides himself into multiple parts to bombard you with heavy strikes. So far, I haven't really mentioned it, but Triple Deluxe bosses introduce or maybe emphasize the design concept of establishing one impressive technique once the second phase starts. Normally, or in older titles, initiating the second half of the fight only means faster attacks or more aggressive behavior. And while the same goes for this game as well, it also tries to leave an impression by having those bombastic attacks that are not necessarily hard to avoid, but simply appear grandiose. It's a very clever way to increase the spectacle and there's a reason that even today's games still follow this pattern. When the game's connection to the Amazing Mirror becomes clearer, it was inevitable to face off one of the main adversaries of the Game Boy Advance titles again. After beating DDD's evil counterpart, all what is left is the revenge of a foe trapped in the Dimension Mirror. Since there is no regular Meta Knight battle in the game, Dark Meta Knight is not a slight enhancement over something that already exists and is basically a reimagining of the Amazing Mirror's final sequence. At first it seems like nothing is particularly changed. The iconic heavy theme is missing and just like with Galacta Knight in Return to Dreamland, I still feel like the modern Meta Knight model looks a little too clunky. For this supposed to be dangerous aura. However, similar to Galacta, Dark Meta Knight truly initiates his presence when halving his health. An amazing arrangement of his theme kicks in, but the true surprise is probably the complete overhaul of his moveset. While the alternative knight kept all of his moves from the Amazing Mirror, for this game he upgraded his arsenal and makes use of different reflections. It's a perfect combination of the mirror theming while staying classic and although I like to criticize Meta Knight-esque battles for being too similar to each other and especially after expecting a mere one-to-one -one copy of the Amazing Mirror, I was pleasantly surprised to see that this rendition is a taste of a remake I'm still waiting for to this day. The controlled King DDD is the prelude to Triple Deluxe final and simultaneously goal for the whole game. After chasing the kidnapped King of Dreamland through thousand horizons, Kirby ultimately catches up and confronts Taranza at the top of Sectonia's palace. Here it is revealed that Taranza mistakenly trapped DDD, thinking he captured the hero from the lower world in order to preempt the people of the sky's plan to call for help. Of course, DDD on his own would be no match to Kirby, and with the additional help of Taranza in the background, the first of many fights at the end of the game begins. Initially, it seems like there's there's nothing outstanding about this encounter. DDD uses most of his well-established moves and you get the impression there's no particular challenge. The only indicator that something must be happened is the health bar, which normally starts the second phase after reaching the half. This time however, Taranza offers the seeming hero a huge power-up, as the penguin grabs one of the axes and swings around like a madman. The mask already teased the return of the iconic mask DDD theme, but it's only now that the full force of this battle starts 
starts to come through. It becomes much more difficult to dodge, as DDD flies from back and foreground like a piece of leaf in the air. It might be a little disappointing to miss out on a proper Taranza clash, but if the fight takes long enough there are small moments with him, actually participating in the fray with additional magic, used for even more projectiles you have to be aware of. King DDD's battle may only be the appetizer to what is still to come, but fulfills his role as a gateway to one of the best climaxes in the series perfectly, by being quite challenging, fast-paced, nostalgic and simply enjoyable. But we can obviously not forget about the secret boss at the end of DDD's own personal campaign. After going through the adventure once again you face the Dimension Mirror, the object responsible for Triple Deluxe's whole catastrophe. Fans of the Amazing Mirror for the Game Boy Advance most likely remember the absence of King DDD in this experimental title. It's one of the very rare occasions where the penguin doesn't appear at all in a Kirby game and in order to make up for this absence, it's finally time to see Shadow DDD. Most of the fight stays naturally the same and is only seasoned just like with every other DX boss, but the sheer fan service puts an extra cherry on top of this battle and after fighting Shadow Kirby and Shadow Meta Knight, it was just fantastic to see the creators complete the Shadow cast with the missing final Kirby All-Star. Most people will probably not have problems understanding this position regarding the surprising nature of Sectonia's soul, but you have to observe why this secret final boss works so great. Just like always, after an exhausting run through the true arena, as it appears to be like she kept one unknown trump card not used during the regular game. Back in the day, secret final bosses were not as common as today, especially after Return to Dreamland did not use one final trick when beating Margolore. Seeing how Sectonia pulls herself out of the flower to transform into one final, flexible form gave everyone a shock at this time. And there's no supernova to save you. What follows is one last action pack battle against Sectonia's remaining powers, which can easily end your arena run. The way she flies through the air with slight camera shifts and underlined by her insane voice really stresses the unexpected situation and there's no time to relax or comprehend the moment. Despite the fact the music resembles the supernova phase of regular Sectonia, it starts much less triumphant this time, almost needing time to kick in the recognizable enemy, reflecting the overwhelming shock melodically. Back in the day this this secret phase caught me completely off guard and still remains as one of the most memorable moments in any Kirby game to me. It comes across as so naturally that I get the feeling this form was maybe even planned for the regular fight. Nowadays we accept the secret final boss at the end of an arena, but after DX Sectonia started with multiple powerful fruits on her own, I thought this was more than enough for the climactic struggle. Battle wise it becomes extremely hard once you lose your copy ability, there's almost no corner to hide with skills assaulting from above and beyond. Naturally classic soul attacks like the giant fireball or splitting herself up in thousands of projectiles belong to every good soul fight and the relief after overcoming one of the hardest Kirby challenges at the point of Triple Deluxe release is more than enough reason to justify Sectonia's soul as a second place. Just like always, it shouldn't be too surprising to see final bosses at the top of a ranking regarding how amazingly staged they tend to be. Especially in modern entries. Queen Sectonia, however, might hold the candle for being one, if not the best Kirby final boss among the series. After all the events before, the build up already sets the mood for something dangerously beautiful. Shooting Kirby through a small hole in order to reach the giant flower at the center of the planet, you already get a glimpse of the atmosphere that is going to unfold when choosing your final copy ability. Often, final Kirby bosses present this horrific tone combined with either 
strong, heavy soundtracks or demonic rings from hell, mirroring the never-ending desire to beauty Sectonia's battle is initiated with somber piano sounds leading to an extremely underappreciated theme of sacrificing your true self for egoistic fake ideals. As the music goes on, you get the impression of the once timid spider singing along the moon night interfered by a traditional fantastic Kirby fanfare. At some point, it feels like the music is having a conversation between Kirby's and Sectonia's theme and there's just something so unique for the series that hasn't been recaptured yet. You do not need to have eldritch monstrosities every time in order to leave an impression. And just like with Masked DDD and Superstar Ultra, a much more personal confrontation against a past little creature with seemingly unassuming goals can have a greater impact than everything you have seen before. But how well is the gameplay doing? At first it might come across as unsatisfying to indirectly battle against Sectonia, as you primarily take out her flowers instead of targeting her main body. This isn't an issue though, as Sectonia closely watches every step and sometimes even shifts her position for more powerful skills. There is definitely not a strange disconnect and the more the climax continues, the closer you get to the giant flower. Every attack approaches in high speed and thanks to the bottomless pits, there is even the chance to instantly die. What I particularly enjoy not only about this fight, but Kirby finals in general, is how you get the impression of always dodging unseen techniques. Because the whole brawl is a fast paced exchange of blows, attack patterns rarely repeat and there is simply not enough time to study her behavior. Mixed with a perfect sense for difficulty, Sectonia proves herself to be a worthy opponent for Kirby's first main 3DS entry. But this wouldn't be a Kirby final without one more face. After it seems like the queen is falling, a sneaky stab behind Kirby's back catches him unprepared. Fortunately, Taranza finally faces the truth of ending this madness and helps with DDD to gather one last special fruit to activate Kirby's seemingly most powerful ability in the franchise. At this point, it's not unusual to end the climax with a respective gimmick, but Supernova's implementation is so excellently implemented, it's really hard to not praise it endlessly. While Return to Dreamland went for a more desperate, fake out approach, Triple Deluxe goes all out and presents a one sided slaughter. Sectonia cannot win. Normally, you see a final struggling, pressing multiple buttons and overcoming your foes barely. However, Supernova cannot be put into this category. And plainly, Low Diffs, one of the most powerful beings, without any sense of struggle. What makes this even more interesting is the fact that Sectonia seemingly also withholds her strength and suddenly starts to bombard you with assaults you would normally never be able to dodge. It doesn't matter if it's multiple rocks, one huge bomb, a giant laser or the health bar, nothing can withstand the power of endless gluttony and a determined Kirby stare. You most likely know this exciting feeling when the main character in one of your favorite shows starts to overwhelm the foe with complete dominance and the very same can be said in this case. The sheer fact that what was needed was a mere supernova transformation, something you did throughout the whole game, is just ironic and very satisfying. Another aspect worth praising is the mere staging of this whole final moment. The way DDD and Taranza look at Kirby knowing with complete confidence that it's over for their opponent and change from the melancholic moonlight to triumphant racing sun sets the spirit for something you are not ready for. The music reflects the tables turned perfectly, still carrying the sense of battle but contrasting hard to what you heard before. The only real downside I could name is the implementation of forced motion controls, but it doesn't destroy the potential at all. The law is obviously the icing on the cake and after Sectonia slowly fades away by her own madness, she probably realizes that the love of the one valuing her the most was much more worth than any seeming eternal beauty.
Kirby Planet Robobot is one, if not the most beloved title in the series and delivers on almost every aspect. One of those aspects are the boss fights, one of the franchise's greatest strengths, especially after the outstanding groundwork, triple deluxe set. Just like we did with many other titles in the series, let's rank the mechanical beasts of Planet Robobot and determine which enemy deserves to be the best. In order to keep things simple, I'm going to combine every opponent with the EX counterpart and leave bosses of Team Kirby Clash behind. At first, it might appear like a drama to put a memorable foe like Galacta Knight on the last place, but you have to perceive it from a certain angle. The Everlasting Warrior already appeared as a surprise in Return to Dreamland in the arena, and was certainly an unexpected implementation after being absent for many years. You can pull off the same trick twice, but also have to make sure to bring something new to the table. It makes sense for Meta Knight to face off against his final adversary akin to Superstar Ultra, but the fight is almost completely identical to Return to Dreamland, with maybe one unimportant addition to his skill set. On top of that, being the secret final boss of Meta Knight's campaign, the creators can assume the player is fairly decent at the game at this point and there is no reason why the battle is so easy in the first place, especially with the usage of Meta Knight's secondary abilities. The only noteworthy moment I can remember is how Galacta Knight slashes through Star Dream with only one hit, immediately proving his power by eliminating the once mighty final boss in a breeze. It reflects his reputation of being the ultimate knight, but sadly there is nothing in the fray itself that verifies this initial instance. This artificial enemy from the past collected data from various life forms, creating the perfect nostalgia bait. As a matter of fact, this battle is purely based on past confrontations, like Krako from Triple Deluxe or the Doom Spheres from Return to Dreamland. The narrative premise and lore implication is quite fascinating and an interesting concept, but the execution all the more lackluster. Leaving the narrative behind, the only thing you get is basically a mini-boss rush of watered-down counterparts of the original fights, without the slightest spark of innovation. The hollow style might be a pleasurable visual touch, but no story or visuals can hide the fact that this boss is one of the most lazy ones in the game. Still, they could have found ways to make the reused foundation more compelling, by combining some of them for example. Fighting Krakow and the snake simultaneously would have been at least somewhat interesting, or taking out the crystals after each phase in a separate short battle phase. As it stands, there's nothing going for the hollow defense system beyond simple nostalgia, which is not something I want to see from modern quality Kirby bosses. The first and sadly only boss that requires the robot armor suit. 
Gigavolt is a giant robotic monster with heavy swinging arms and an intimidating presence. Looking at this foe as such, he comes across as stronger than most main oppositions, but is only a mini boss. After taking out smaller minions, the boss himself appears in the background, and you have to destroy his arms by crashing his armor and unscrew his limbs to go for the head. The whole fight is fairly simplistic, quite easy, and doesn't take too much time, but an entertaining change of pace. The robot armor suit is the perfect combat gear for those kinds of huge enemies, and it's quite a shame and puzzling to be honest, why there are not more of those kinds of enemies. Slowly taking parts of their body apart and going for those heavy hits would have been extremely satisfying, but unfortunately, Gigavolt is the first and only opportunity to go for a real mecha fight in this game. The president of the Helpman Company himself guards the ultimate machine and is more of a bridge fight for the true final. Heavily resembling Susie and her robot armor suit, Haltman's battle plays out fairly similar and only introduces smaller changes. Instead of starting from a plain two-dimensional perspective, the mad businessman immediately switches up the situation and creates a circular battlefield, similar to Clanky Woods or his daughter. This doesn't mean there are no changes though, as it feels like the faces consistently shift throughout the clash, and there's never a moment to rest. The reason why he remains below Susie, despite portraying the up graded counterpart. Helpman doesn't really add too much individual touch to his confrontation and just like the defense system, it feels like a mere color swap to what we have already seen. Sticking money to the screen and hindering your view is a neat way to add a certain challenge, but the true highlight is probably the surprisingly intense voice acting we only see on rare occasions in the franchise. Just like Gigavolt, not necessarily a traditional boss at the end, but COGS in combination with the return of Kabula might still count as a proper boss. Starting with a, at this point classic for the series, shooting section, you're assaulting through a couple of enemies until this mechanical construction of multiple cannons stands in your way. Even though this style of gameplay is well known in the series, I still enjoy the new contextualization of the robot armor suit basically copying the returning jet ability. It would have been great to receive a slightly altered gameplay style, as the controls are basically the same as the other dimension sequence in Return to Dreamland, but we have to appreciate the attention to these. Detail. The air combat itself offers nothing particularly surprising, as you slowly take apart each part of the machine. Progressing in the game, it appears like the battle is being reused without any clear changes, but once Kabula reveals itself from the rubbles, the once ordinary quarrel turns into a short trip to the past. Unfortunately, Kabula was not really upgraded and is basically the same from past encounters, but it was still an unexpected amazement after the game conditioned me to simply expect the same battle against the cannons once again. It's not so surprising to swing your sword against Meta Knight in a Kirby game and Planet Robobot is no exception. Just like the rest of characters, Meta Knight was heavily mechanized and turned into Mecha Knight, a warrior without a will and only used to follow commands. If I had to only judge the very first fight during the regular playthrough, this alteration would easily drop way harder on this list, but because Mecha Knight appears regularly at the final and bonus adventure, his battle improves slowly. What starts as a rather standard Meta Knight battle with some additional gimmicks, turns to an unexpectedly creative duel with an extended robot arm and 
small lasers. Back in the day, Meta Knight battles were quite challenging due to the knight's quick movement and unpredictable patterns, but as Kirby games turned easier during the years, so did Meta Knight and there have to be other ways to make him interesting. Mecha Knight is such an attempt and despite the fact it could have been more, I'm quite pleased with what they ultimately came up with. This is one of the rare moments where Wispy Woods' fight remains quite high on the list. Technically speaking, it's Clanky Woods, as this robotic menace only portrays the iconic tree from the outside, but being armored with his own tricks. The first time you meet the not-so-stoic tree is during the first level, where you have to run and dodge obstacles. It's an amazing way to introduce a boss as a serious threat, but if you're feeling brave enough, it's also possible to frighten him away for some extra items. The actual battle at the end of the world goes through three unalike phases, adding a huge amount of variety for a first boss. Boss. One key difference in comparison to Triple Deluxe is the introduction of a circular battlefield. Similar to Kirby 64, it creates a certain sense of depth and three-dimensional space, while increasing the flexibility of what a boss can do. The only smaller nitpick I have is the last phase where Clanky closes the tower and attacks from the background. While it's alright in the standard fight, I wish the EX counterpart would have required you to climb up the closed area and deal the final blow at the top. As it stands right Right now, the last phase doesn't really add too much or gives off the feeling it's now or never. One thing, however, I have to praise is the resistance Clanky shows throughout the game. Sometimes you get the impression he appears more often than Susie herself, which indicates he's a mere mass production product. I would have loved a scenario where you have to either run or fight multiple Clanky Woods at once, maybe even going through a level where you can observe the process of producing them. Even so, all of this is simple wish thinking and cannot undermine the creative visual and gameplay display of this variation of Wispy Woods. Despite the fact this constellation consists of multiple fights, I decided to keep them together since they kinda resemble one unit. After beating the game a second time and traveling with Meta Knight through a mechanized planet pop, it's time to reach Star Dream another time and confront the machine. Due to Meta Knight's everlasting persistence to search for a true challenge, you encounter doppelgangers of opponents from the past, one of them dating back many years ago, while the other is fairly recent. Sectonia is almost completely identical to her clash in Triple Deluxe, with the exception of only one new technique. Again, it was probably an easy way to extend the fights without having to implement a completely new one, but luckily, the other encounter makes up for this by emerging from a time many players are not even aware of. Dark Meta is not really an unknown enemy despite being absent since many years now, but one character some fans do not know about is the variation of Dark Meta from Kirby Streamland 2, portraying a powerful knight with the ability to shoot lasers. The simplistic modernized theme and his frantic sword swinging are identical to his very first appearance and the creators always manage it to re build those little mannerisms and animations that only looked like that because of the limited power of past hardware into modern visuals without coming across as strange. They keep their character and just like another certain boss following on this list, the original Dark Knight was fought during a shooting section, making the modern counterpart special due to being placed on the ground. Besides, Meta Knight is probably the perfect matchup for such an opponent and despite the fact Dark Knight is not the final boss of Meta Knight's campaign, I kinda regard 
Datum as one. The only positive thing I can say about Sigtonia is the little easter egg after defeating her. Back in the day, I simply thought this creature was supposed to be Taranza for whatever reason, but this is one of the very rare occasions where we can see the initial Sigtonia before she turned into the power-hungry monster we know. Furthermore, the interesting implication that Stardream somehow collected information about Sectonia and Dark Matter adds to the intrigue and lore, letting the Kirby universe feel alive once again. I'm glad there's at least one special surprise for Meta Knight and Dark Knight easily makes up for the uneventful Sectonia and Galacta Knight battles. Just like with Meta Knight, it was quite obvious to receive another DDD battle. It would have been interesting to create a fight with the lost DDD robot known from the cancelled GameCube game, but what they came up with is at least similarly intriguing. Instead of fighting the king himself directly, it's a clone similar to Dark Matter and Sectonia with the obligatory enhancements. Akin to his name, this variation of DDD splits himself into three separate parts, which have to be defeated and become smaller the longer you attack. With standard DDD skills, nothing seems to be out of the ordinary, but if you take a look at the surroundings, it becomes pretty clear the elevator takes all of you to the true fray. At the top of the skyscraper, the DDD clones unpack a giant cannon and drifts around the arena to shoot from every angle. The sense for 3D and the corresponding effect come successfully to light and thanks to the constant shift of position from your enemy's side, there is never a safe spot to hide in. I would argue the whole staging still doesn't reach the heights and just looking at the fight without experiencing it, it might come across as rather plain. Still, in action it's surprisingly entertaining and the triple D firework at the end is the perfect way to end a convincing clash against Kirby's very evil rival. Hartman's personal assistants and daughter herself, Susie, secures the third place with her own powerful robot armor suit. Initially, I wasn't sure what to expect from this little antagonist, since her build doesn't give off much information on how she would operate. The answer is the counterpart to Kirby's robot armor suit, which makes it all the more sad that we never got a robot armor suit clash between them. Even so, when the second phase starts and Susie animates the whole arena into a circular battlefield, similar to the one of Clanky Woods, it's a great sense of depth, but much more expanded. Unlike Clanky, Susie jumps all over the place and attacks with rockets, dash attacks and the weight of a machine. There's not a particular move I can point out that makes this battle special, whereas it's the combination of every move resulting in an extremely varied encounter. Besides, unlike in Triple Deluxe with Taranza, it's nice to see Susie taking action once in a while instead of letting other henchmen do the job and she really feels like a constant participant in the story. The secret final boss of the true arena and most likely nightmare for many players. 
Star Dream Soul, or to be more precise, its heart reveals itself after an exhausting ongoing struggle through every boss of the game and just like with every other prior Soul enemy, does not hold back in any terms. For every fan of the series, it doesn't come off as a surprise to fight one last mysterious foe at the very end, but one thing that made Star Dream Soul especially intriguing is what they would do after this specific climax. One additional phase with a halberd, or perhaps using the robot armor suit to round things up? The answer might be more on the traditional side gameplay wise, but all the more interesting considering the past. As you have probably noticed at this point, Planet Robobot likes to recycle most of its fights, either from the past or the main adventure itself, and Star Dream Soul is the perfect exception of how to mix callbacks with the modern contextualization. Obviously the whole scenery is very reminiscent of Superstar and the original Nova, with the only difference of fighting on the ground this time. This alone gives a completely new feeling to this uncanny enemy, and you have to watch out from all angles not get hit by the various pillars shifting through the arena. At first Star Dream Soul feels rather passive and seems to be suspectedly easy for a secret final boss. You get the impression the developers try to have mercy for once, but this safe feeling is quickly crushed when the heart itself takes action. Again, if you know what will happen, it's actually not too hard to dodge, but since you have never fought this opponent and presumably enter with low health, dying is not as incredible as you think. You get the chance to swallow a copy ability, but the instant teleportation and extensive attacks covering a good part of the battlefield forces you to move consistently. Another neat detail are unobtrusive cries from Haltman whenever you destroy one of the pillars, further underlining how his mind is still consumed within the cold, mechanical urge to evascuate every biological life form. Nonetheless, there is nothing we can do for this tragic father, and when the health bar finally reaches zero, Haltman's spirit can rest at last. Apparently. Whenever the screen doesn't shift to a glorious fanfare, the player immediately knows there is something wrong and as one ultimate ace, Star Dream Soul activates a self-destruction program that ended many true arena runs. You have to dodge three fast shockwaves that deal so much damage it can be basically counted as a one-hit KO. Having to go through everything only to die so cheaply can feel devastating and is directly the hopeless feeling. After all, the true arena is the absolute challenge of any Kirby game and due to the fact the developers can assume inexperienced players will not even reach this point, they can do whatever they like in order to increase the challenge. Admittedly, it's not even a challenge but a hollow trap, but the sheer truth, they were brave enough to implement such a final middle finger for everyone who thinks it's over, obtains my respect and is not without a reason one of the most memorable Kirby moments in the series. Despite consisting of so many reused fights and nostalgia, the final boss of Kirby Planet Robobot Star Dream recovers this nitpick by presenting one of the most memorable yet unforeseeable climaxes in the series. Since Return to Dreamland it's expected to include the gimmick of the game to some extent, be it for one final slash or whole dedicated phase, but Planet Robobot approached this topic from a different angle. Theoretically Kirby makes use of his trusty robot armor suit, but basically inhales Meta Knight's battleship, the Halberd, completely and transforms into his probably most strongest mechanical form. I'm not quite sure how other people see it, but back in the day it was a huge surprise for me and it makes so much sense, hence forgiving the missing implementation of the standard robot armor suit gameplay. It works so amazingly, you really get the feeling the creators desperately wanted to create a shooter. Well, Kirby's quite flexible, so please. <laughs> 
don't hold yourself back. As you would expect, Star Dream packs all sorts of punches and seems to contain an endless arsenal of different skills. To counter this barrage of attacks, you get the opportunity to inhale destroyed rubbish from your enemy and shoot back with an extremely mighty projectile. Of course, this isn't the whole deal to the story and once Star Dream is forced into a corner, he uses Haltman's spaceship and combines the ultimate machine. The music starts to develop from an almost magical sense of space into an ominous premonition that Star Dream seems to prepare something. Slowly but surely, huge metal parts crumble and when you overcome the battle transition, the real enemy reveals itself. The cold eyes open and a mighty uncanny cry shocks the universe. It's safe to say this is one of the greatest moments of any Kirby final, as the access arc was another galactic nova all the time. This is the perfect kind of fan service, as newcomers will be stunned by the unanticipated friendly grin, whereas fans remain in awe of battling yet another magical planet. At no point in the game was this hinted at and the surprise works amazingly, considering you get glimpses while slowly disclosing its face. But there's no time to rest as the newly reborn Star Dream changes its strategy and assaults with strange techniques resembling the original Galactic Nova and its body parts. Each of those three faces feels very different in atmosphere, tone and how you have to dodge all the obstacles, while being quite challenging on top of that. Self-evidently, the EX counterpart further increases the difficulty, but one nice detail they kept is the slash of Galacta Knight. In hindsight, Star Dream might not be a traditional battle and heavily focuses on a specific gimmick, but stands out as one of the most action-packed, unexpected and intriguing finals in the series. And even though we ultimately do not receive a robot armor suit fight, it doesn't mean the final opponent will not be defeated with the gimmick of the game. The swan song of the Return to Dreamland Quartet Star Allies was received with mixed receptions and didn't leave as much of an impression as you would expect from the first proper HD title for the franchise. Multiple reasons are responsible for the displeasure of many players, but at least the bosses continue the strong quality of the series with a couple memorable confrontations. Since Star Allies offers a bunch of variations of some bosses, I refrain from separating them and put every boss with their counterparts together. Except Except for one exception you will understand, since there's not too much of a difference between them. The first boss of the game also introduces this ranking with a more than solid representation of what can be expected from a traditional wispy fray. Since you don't clash with the tree at the end of World 1, he feels like a stepping stone on your way and doesn't go as all out as former renditions, especially on the 3DS. This doesn't mean Wispy has nothing to offer though, as he makes great use of the multiplayer aspect of Star Allies and separates the group once you drag Kirby's classic rival into a corner. With two players on each side, the main focus of the screen still remains on Wispy, throwing an avalanche of apples and just like before, having trouble keeping both halves in check. Occasionally he jumps into a different direction, giving you the option to unite the allies again. But the fight will probably be over by this point and you get an appropriate first taste of Star Allies boss battles. Surprisingly enough, this isn't everything there is to Wispy and despite the fact how fast you can end the brawl, there are tons of secret features hidden to be discovered. With enough firepower, it's possible to completely burn Wispy to his core, finishing the fight in mere seconds. It's a very similar case to the secret paint ability when assaulting heavy lobster and even though it makes the fight clearly easier, the option to have such a chance is much more worth than any seeming downside. Furthermore, if you slightly enter the battlefield without completely committing to enter, you can actually go back to the door you came from and return with one of the friend's abilities. Similarly overpowered like using fire, for whatever reason the creators decided to pay 
pack Wispy with tons of interesting easter eggs, which should justify a higher ranking but doesn't actually change the core confrontation itself. Like I said in the beginning, there are varied counterparts of some bosses, however, and Wispy is no exception. After traveling through Popstar and identifying the antagonistic site, Kirby and his companions enter the galaxy and visit unalike planets focusing on specific visual elements. The forest, full of autumn leaves, is guarded by Iggy Woods, an older version of Wispy with rotten fruits hanging above. As I stated, the appearance might be new, but the actual battle is nearly the same, yet I have to commend the motivation to at least alter the boss noticeably from what he looked before. The true star of the show is Parallel Wispy, the challenging counterpart added as the final update of the game. Again, nothing has changed as such besides the difficulty, which is now impressively higher. You may not die with a group of four fighters, but the clash will be closer than you think and is only a first taste of what other bosses will have to offer. Teased in the intro of the game, Meta Knight got also corrupted by the Jamba Heart and attacks Kirby at the end of World 2. Having such a nimble foe with 4 players, it isn't very hard to overwhelm the Lonely Knight. And the only main challenge comes from targeting a rather smallish opponent who is quick on his feet. Since every boss strength was increased thanks to the dark power, Meta Knight relies purely on the sword skills and splits himself into multiple copies, perfect for the multiplayer aspect of the game. Summoning huge rocks to create giant pillars is a great way to separate the group, and if you're fast enough to destroy them before Meta Knight slices them up, his doppelgangers are going to be stuck in the ground for you to counter. Another important detail to notice is how they all share the same health bar, but if the fight takes too long, Meta Knight is also going to collect himself and attack as one strong unit again. With the sword, it's even possible to clash your blades for a moment, not as climactic as in the Forgotten Land, but at least a neat touch in case you take the unnecessary sword before the battle. Unnecessary because it makes no sense regarding how Meta Knight is overwhelmed by a malicious force. Normally, the sword is a symbol to have a fair fight, but this Meta Knight should only be focused on winning, just like in Squeak Squad. It's a very unimportant nitpick, however, and even though Meta Knight does not offer the unexpected creative confrontation, unlike another certain king, it doesn't mean I consider this rendition to be bad. Almost every boss of Star Allies keeps the multiplayer in mind, and although they could have done so much more in this case, it's at least a serviceable duel for the second world. The hardest, or to be precise, hardest bosses to rank in this game. Normally you fight each magical sister piece by piece in the third world in their bastion, but I decided to put them together due to their general similarities. It's not really about the attacks they perform, but pattern all of them have in common with. They have the same size, general sense for difficulty, and only really differentiate from another by their special aces. If I would have to rank them separately, it would be just the order in which they appear, so having one connected placing makes more sense than repeating my point again and again. The blue mage starts the occasion with her icy skills and a powerful axe. Just like every following sister, she is quite quick on her non-existing feet and moves from side to side accompanied by dangerous projectiles. Winning against her is no problem at all though, if you are aware of her weakness. Using a water gun with endless supply, you can electrify the water and deal additional damage. Overall, she is the right first taste. 
and gives you a good impression of what is to come. The Red Sister, however, contrasts nicely to her, acting with a fiery passion and is more of a jumper than floating elegantly like before. Everything I have said about the Ice Mage can also be applied to her, with the only clear difference of having a better challenge thanks to her speed. Similarly, you can stop her hot cannon with either water or paint Kirby, but even if not, it's rather uncomplicated to dodge by simply flying above the fire beam. The final sister completes the trio with her calm, collected and more thoughtful manner and portrays the main boss of World 3. At first I was a little unsure about her posing as the last fight, considering the once again nearly identical battle style you have seen twice at this point. Naturally her electric tricks are different and with water it becomes even easier to stop her parade of shockwaves, but it's nothing special to conclude a world. I'm aware about the sheer number of boss fights in World 3 compensating for a proper main clash, but this isn't actually everything there is. When Partizan goes down, she prepared the outcome of the battle with her mindfulness and activates a self-destruction commando, leaving Kirby and his allies behind. Ending the world in Metroid style, you have to go through a couple friends pose and escape with the help of the friend star, following your enemy into the galaxy. It's such an appreciated turn of events and for the series brand new way to let a boss fight or world end. This follows the philosophy of Star Allies playing with the rules of the genre, deciding on its own how many and in which manner bosses appear. Although it feels like he's treated like a sidekick to fill out the boss count, Krakow demonstrates a complete original battle and is only loosely similar to past renditions. What starts as a classic fray against the one-eyed thundercloud turns into a feature that took too long to finally appear, splitting Krako into multiple bodies. Once again, it's a simple way to incorporate the multiplayer, but even so, the duo dynamic works surprisingly well and all attacks cover nearly every corner of the battlefield. The true star of the show are elemental gimmicks, like freezing Krako into an ice block once he starts using water-based skills. It's basically even foreshadowed in a level before and just like with Whisper, be. While it fundamentally guarantees you to win, the payoff makes it all the more worth. Parallel Cracker on the other hand plays with the faces, starting as a team but combining into one giant cloud. At first it may sound easier having such an enormous target to take down, but in reality it's quite the opposite. No matter where you hide, Cracker is so gigantic that you're often forced to block him and it's not even like he remains stationary. Dashing through the air is still one of his favorite moves to perform, and you should definitely not under estimate him based on the previous fight. The newly added wind blowing in combination with smaller thunderclouds is another appreciated addition to his moveset and while the base Krakow battle serves its purpose but only feels a little lackluster for being the first Krakow encounter on an HD title, the parallel upgrade is without a doubt one of the best in the game. The only pure gimmick boss of the game and probably sole encounter you cannot remember all that well despite spending many hours in the game. Grand Mom doesn't appear in one of the side modes of the game and doesn't receive a harder counterpart in any capacity. This shouldn't hold the big mama back however as the fight stays memorable thanks to the inclusion of the friend star something you could have used during the wispy clash, but is mandatory in this case. Because of that, the whole fight is based around the friend star's features. Admittedly not very in depth, but at least a welcoming surprise after the final world seemed to only recycle prior bosses. The giant mother throws heavy iron balls after you, leaving her open to cut them off with the proper ally or copy ability. After that, it's time to switch your skills and let those bombs explode by setting the fuse on fire, revealing the opponent's unprotected, delicate body. I entertain the idea of using the game's base mechanics and making a boss out of them. Setting bombs on fire or cutting ropes is something you have done in levels prior to this encounter, so it's not like the false weak point comes out of nothing. The circumstance of fighting 
fighting with a friendster might be new, but the means to deal damage are not and I appreciate the option to leave this boss out of any side mode, to keep the individual touch. After their debut in Dreamland 3, Pawn and Con make a surprising comeback as the guardians of the enemy's bastion. Not even this inconspicuous duo was spared by the dark power and appear as the first major boss in World 3 at the first level. Self-evidently, their battle style has not changed too much, with the only downgrade wandering through the battlefield a little slower. Their children still participate in the fight as a means to be inhaled, and large bombs can obviously not be missed. Judging the very first encounter on its own, it's actually quite sluggish and uneventful, with the only proper surprise having to fight these returning opponents immediately at the start of a new world. The second clash seems to only improve the speed, but initiating the second phase, a massive pillar rises from the ground and the whole arena doubles in height. But the original battle already benefited from the multiplayer with multiple targets to hunt down, but such a big playground allows you to spread the group into all directions and cover every corner. Additionally, it's possible to break the pillars and walk right through it, giving you a better movement and prediction option where your adversary will come from. This is the kind of modern improvement past bosses definitely need. Back in the day, the standard and especially expectations were different considering how today's Kirby bosses act under new, much more grandiose rules. As mere appetizers for the third world, Pawn and Con fulfill their role perfectly fine, and the upgraded versions meet the modern expectation, resulting in an overall almost flawless comeback. After completing the regular adventure for the first time, you unlock an additional campaign starring all the star allies in their own separate excursions. It's mostly the main game again with a couple of adjustments, like having the option to collect stat boosting items or going through a handful of new level sections. All of this may be fair enough, but every vivid fan knows the truth and expects some kind of secret boss at the end of the line. After all, Void Termina is destroyed and there has to be an unseen threat waiting to be free. Initially my disappointment was big, seeing Galacta Knight return after his lackluster inclusion in Planet Robobot, but this was a fake out with a true enemy following Kirby and so many intros. The unobtrusive red butterfly appearing in almost every Kirby game at the start of the campaign reveals itself to be Morpho Knight, the Crimson Destroyer with only one goal in mind, absorbing a fitting host and taking out every single star ally. At first glance you may get the impression of a brand new knight character in the Kirby universe, but Morpho Knight actually resembles a scrapped character never used until now. There's also the common misconception that Morpho Knight resembles Meta Knight's beta design, which isn't true as the director of Kirby stated. Going by the Red Knight's body structure, there are naturally some skills mirroring the ones of Meta or Galacta Knight. Initially I was a little hesitant towards this secret final boss, expecting a mere reskin of what we know and receiving yet another Barebones clone. Fortunately my skepticism should not turn out to be true as Morpho Knight brings in his unique techniques like letting a sword grow into giant blade or using his wings to turn your allies into enemies. The forgotten land released after Star Allies, but just like I mentioned it there, when Morphonite creates those devilish ghosts, it seems like they kinda correspond to whatever host Morphonite absorbed. In the Forgotten Lands case it was plainly the original final boss, but here we have no idea what kind of monster this is supposed to be. Overtaking Galacta Knight should be the answer, but the evil grin does not resemble Galacta Knight whatsoever, leaving many questions behind. Does it reveal something about the true essence of Galacta Knight, or are those faces the remaining 
remains of something we do not know about. Naturally, this is only fan speculation and there is probably no real answer, since this is more for Knight's first appearance and the idea of mirroring the host probably came with the forgotten land. But it's still an interesting idea and from now on, we will always look out for this particular butterfly in every opening cutscene. The King of Dreamland doesn't appear often so high on a boss ranking, but for this occasion it's fully justifiable considering what trump card he hides. Crashing his castle and wandering along the roots of the first Kirby's Dreamland again, it's time to get back all the stolen food and initiate a duel in DDD's throne room. Like many classic rivals in modern Kirby games, the king starts off fairly traditional and seems to be quite slow with all that food on his belly. One intriguing new addition to his moveset is a skill directly copied from Smash, with DDD using his hammer to swing around some Gordos. Normally, you see the opposite by Smash utilizing the original games as inspiration and Regarding how the former Kirby director is now responsible for Smash, it feels like an act of respect to keep an eye out what experience he is actually developing. Self-evidently, this doesn't explain such a high ranking and when the moment for the real deal comes, DDD must use his secret gains, too mighty for this world to witness. Back in the day, it was sadly revealed in trailers, but would have been such a fantastic surprise for the first world's main boss. If you have watched any other ranking of mine, I have consistently complained about the lack of creativity for Meta Knight and DDD clashes, with the latter showing signs of interesting ideas but never really committing to them. Buff DDD is the kind of reimagining I want to observe, since no one could have seen something like this coming. With his strong arms, the buffed king destroys the ground and swings around the pillars of his castle, like Donkey Kong himself. Once again, the pillars are a fitting way to separate the group, even if it's for a couple seconds due to their destructible nature. I consider the regular first fight to be an almost perfect first main boss for a Kirby game, offering the perfect amount of surprise and difficulty, but parallel DDD is where the true challenge comes from, with highly quick attacks coming from left and right. The king's uncanny colorization depicts the cherry on top of this protein-filled battle, and buff DDD will rightfully remain as one of Star Allies' most memorable opponents. The only exception of returning enemies but the combination of all magical sisters at once is such a brilliant chaos, I'm glad the creators took the opportunity and added this secret boss with the last update of the game. Technically nothing has particularly changed as every magician performs their regular attacks you know from the regular fights, but this time the odds are balanced. It's not an overwhelming 4 against 1 and for the most part, one sister is going to observe from the background while the other two assault. This alone makes the battle not only noticeably harder, but all the more complex keeping an eye out on two targets and trying to dodge their arena covering skills. There were times where you had to fight two foes at the same time but Krakow, for example, was not nearly as fast or nimble and you always got the impression there was some sort of coordination. The magical sisters however sometimes seem to act randomly whenever they like and it almost feels like someone created a mod for this encounter to happen. This alone cannot be everything and after initiating the second phase every sister starts to pull out their ace naturally simultaneously. If you get hit by one of those massive techniques you will be flicked into the next one and in most cases it's a clear KO. One of of them alone might have been a little lukewarm, but together they release their full potential. And it may not only be the hardest regular fight in the game, but most chaotic, frame rate destroying battle royale you will witness in Star Allies. Teased at the start of the game as a mysterious mantled cultist, Highness is the catalyst of releasing the Jumba Heart's dark power onto the universe and tries to recollect each piece in order to fulfill his plan of reviving his, at this point, unknown god. 
The first phase starts rather calm, with unobtrusive melodies perfectly fitting the arena, and Highness himself seems to not take the battle seriously. After all, he was just completely in his thing, not even noticing the battle beforehand. But just like every antagonist in the series, he immediately underestimates Kirby, and the weak health bar deleting too fast should be enough indication to expect something more. When Highness' hood falls and the camera zooms in, his disgusting visage is revealed, and a foreshadowed manic seizure is fully displayed not only in Highness behavior, but music as well. With the help of all three magical sisters, he uses their unconscious bodies to strike with elemental techniques, some of them easy to dodge, others covering nearly the whole battlefield. It's an extremely clever setup to combine all the antagonistic forces into one confrontation and the voice acting of Highness, despite saying no clear words, should definitely be praised. Entering the third phase, the real surprise is the friend circle, this time used against you and without shielding or dodging movements. It's nearly impossible to leave this skill uninjured on your first time. The trope of using the player's specialities against him shows how powerful the player is in the first place, especially in Kirby's case and I wish the harder counterpart would maybe incorporate another one, like the friend train since it's fairly straightforward in its approach. Another perfectly fine executed feature is the huge lore drop before Highness goes for the offensive. Naturally, you have to pause the screen to read the hysteric tirade, basically stating Highness' back story largely, but it's a clever combination of letting players who are uninterested in the lore skip it, underline Highness outrageous charisma and offering some interesting details for everyone who wants to know more about these characters. If you were wondering where Star Allies' budget went, the final boss, Void Termina, might give you hints with his elaborated, multi-faced and overall grandiose staging. Without giving away too much, this final enemy probably swallowed a huge amount of the game's budget and tries to at least end the adventure on a high note. To great success, as the premise is surprisingly unique with a giant three-dimensional arena, the monstrosity without a soul in the middle and Kirby, together with his allies, riding the friend star. You have to take out each weak point, each body part and glide around the opponent without getting hit by shockwaves, powerful punches and elemental skills. Once the defense is broken, Void Termina falls to the ground, a perfect moment to enter his body himself and take out the weak point directly. Here the gameplay returns to regular two-dimensional action, with a rather passive heart to assault. Strange symbols follow you wherever you go, turning allies into foes and after dealing enough damage, the true core is nearly revealed until it casts you out of the field, with the neat side effect of saving the unconscious highness and the magical sisters. As if this wasn't enough, Void turns into a giant bird, attacking from the sky with all sorts of different techniques, some of them implicating even more lore information. After you bring your foe down, it's time to finally end the struggle by going after what looks uncannily similar to Kirby himself. Having a bright grin on his face, Void takes the shape of a circular entity, something players have seen regularly in the franchise. With a simplistic form like that, it allows Void to perform a variety of special attacks, and if you were lucky enough to survive until now, there's a high chance to faint on your first try. As the music turns into a hopeful melody mixed with classic Kirby light motifs. There are no unexpected gimmicks left, but even so, Void manages it to present some tricks like flooding the area, turning into a dark matter-like creature, shooting lasers or performing the Drossia bounce. The idea of not holding back despite how hard everything before already was adds the perfect challenge to the climax and you're going to feel very relieved once it's done. I haven't really talked about what makes this final boss so amazing since this is the long 
longest continuous encounter you will find in any Kirby game. There are no moments to catch a break, only very few means to heal and predict what is going to happen. The mixture of having a massive, rather gimmicky showdown on the outside against this colossus versus classic gameplay on the inside is the perfect unification of gimmick and gameplay, something I missed during Planet Robobot's climax for example. There's even the clever attention to detail of dealing damage by plenty throwing hearts at Void, something not possible for any other enemy, and also proof that Void completely lacks any kind of affection. My only real complaint is the unobtrusive music which isn't disappointing per se, but it kinda lacks the weight Triple Deluxe or Planet Robobot had. Still, the odd voice of Terminal in combination with the barbaric design, the heart's similarity to Kirby and the sheer spectacle of everything after you could have been let down to this point makes sure to let Star Allies at least end on one of the highest notes in the franchise. If there's one thing in Kirby games that improved as time went on, it's certainly the boss battles. What started as a straightforward clash against a simple tree escalated into demonic beasts and all sorts of unthinkable enemies. Their design reflect their wild rage and although the difficulty might not mirror the excellent staging, it's hard to deny the fantastic boss fights of the franchise. Varying attacks, unpredictable changes of strategies and never ending phases gave Kirby the reputation of having one of the best clashes in the whole genre. However, this only applies to the 2D platformer, as Kirby never explored three-dimensional environments properly and thus only relied on what was known, until now. Kirby in the Forgotten Land moves the traditional gameplay for the first time into a fully explored 3D world and naturally introduces a whole new threat the Beast Pack. But how well do they continue this legacy of amazing opponents and can these animalistic beasts really shift the quality of the 2D fights into three-dimensional battle arenas? Today we are here to find that out, so let's rank all the regular bosses of Kirby in the Forgotten Land. You may be confused as to why the leader of the Beast Pack himself, Leongar, is ranked on the last place, but you have to consider this from the game's perspective. After traveling through the vast landscapes of the Forgotten Land, the game very purposefully keeps details about the story and antagonist private, as if some sort of huge storm is drawing near. This is certainly the case for the final in general, but not Leongar as well. After beating the mind-controlled King DDD and a terrifying revelation about Elphalin, you encounter the leader of the Beast Pack at the top of the Forbidden Lab Discoverer and what should have been a climactic clash with the One commanding the beasts is just just a prelude to a much bigger event. Don't get me wrong, it's not like this boss battle is poorly designed, but it's not explicitly exciting either. While his character design might be intimidating, the boss design is nothing but bland. Most of his skills are just regular physical attacks with the laser beam and claw swipes depicting the exception. How you fight this enemy is basically just the same as Gorimondo, and I miss the uniqueness in his battle. In the best case, a foe brings in at least one special trait that makes him or the circumstances around the staging unique in any kind of way, but sadly I cannot confirm this for Leon Ga. As I said, it's not about being a horrible boss, but it comes off as tedious, which is much worse in my belief. Luckily this problem is solved in the post-game and considering this fight is very likely only an introduction to the real Leon Ga conflict in the post-game, it was still too basic to care. Gorimondo is the first true encounter against one of the commanders of the Beast Pack. With his massive appearance and gigantic body, he certainly leaves a powerful impression and makes use of that. This monster takes his massive arms as his primary means to attack or grabs Kirby in order to squish him. But it's not only the close combat that makes this gorilla so dangerous. Whenever he feels pressured by a little pink ball near him, he jumps back, pulls enormous rocks from the ground and throws them at you. The best strategy is to stay in between his legs, dodging his stomping and avoiding the following shockwaves. As 
as the last ditch attempt, Gory Mondo starts to rotate himself, performing the perfect Donkey Kong up B with the only drawback of getting confused after some while. Since this is the first boss of the game, it should be clear that, despite looking like a gigantic threat, Gory Mondo is not the unstoppable monster you would expect. All of his attacks are fairly easy to dodge and he gives you enough moments to prepare for his skills. With the ice ability, you can even freeze his body to his core, dealing massive amount of damage while slowing him down. It's a nice change of pace to finally start a Kirby game without the traditional Wispy Woods fight, don't worry, we will get to that. You also have to take into account the little details and animation during and before the clash. Kirby runs through the mall as a giant figure swings above the building and stomping outside. The banana hill foreshadows an ape-like creature and the mighty cry before the title drop makes his presence clear. The way how he smashes through the glasses to grab Kirby and how he tries to peer at you while fighting just adds to a believable yet basic fight. Facto Forgo is the abomination of what happens if Alpha Lin's other side is not completed and absorbs every organic life form close at hand. After beating Leon Gar, the creature from another universe is tired of waiting and tries to speed up the process of becoming complete again. The result is one of the most terrifying enemies in the Kirby franchise design-wise and chases our pink hero down the hallway to achieve its goal, getting Alpha Lin. Although the appearance is horribly intriguing for the series, the fight itself is nothing but a short chase sequence similar to Mario games and constitutes as the bridge for the actual climax. Because of that, there are no more multiple phases and all you have to do is dodging a charge attack and avoiding the thrown slime. I like how they put in copy abilities that would really help in a scenario like that, like Ranger for example. But other than that, Facto Forgo is more memorable because of his design rather than the battle. If you have played at least one Kirby game in your life, you are probably aware of one of the most iconic enemies of the franchise, Wispy Woods. This simple tree with a stoic impression in his face appears in nearly every title and sometimes it even feels like a challenge from the developer's side how they could make a new, innovative Wispy Woods boss battle. However, this is not the case here as Tropic Woods is the first three-dimensional translation of the traditional rivalry. With his main body being centered at the top of the arena, this enemy makes great use of the battlefield and throws explosive coconuts at you while breathing air in order to push Kirby back. When it gets to the second phase, Tropic Woods will even start to guard himself with the fence being pulled from the ground and lets his roots chase after Kirby. Although it can be easy to just stand before his face and attack endlessly, there are a lot of ways how to approach the boss, either attacking from a distance and watching out for the roots or risking direct damage by getting hit by the fence or his breath. Especially if you are reaching for the optional side mission of beating Tropic without a copy ability, this arena turns into a huge battlefield really fast and just the sheer chaotic back and forth is what makes this boss such a good transition to 3D. Of course it's still too easy to just dodge the fence and simply jump over every breath attack, so it would have been much more exciting if he would at least for once shield his whole body in order to force you to retreat. The only thing I have my problems with is how he doesn't really fit into the rest of the bosses. Being the only enemy that isn't a part of the beast pack, Tropic Woods isn't as interesting as all the other characters and thus stands out a little. Meta Knight is an optional boss in this game, so I think it would have been great to fight a completely new foe in this world, while Tropic Woods serves as a secret boss for everyone who discovers one of the many great hidden mysteries in the game.
World 3 was the first location that didn't follow any genre conventions in terms of setting like desert, ice or water and fully focused on the merits of an abundant theme park. You go through each corner of this magical wonderland and get to experience this place once full of happiness during the night and day. Naturally, the boss should reflect a similar charisma and luckily Chloraline does not disappoint in that regard. Before you even start to fight, you can already see her standing menacingly in the center of the circus tent, unguarded as if the leopard already knows she's going to win. One interesting detail about her figure reveals how Chloraline is basically the right hand of Leon Gar and ventured through the Forgotten Land in order to stop Kirby personally. Her rank gives her the role of an idol among the beast pack, which is not surprising if you see her skills. Mirroring the elegant movement of a leopard, Chloraline is able to jump to great heights and uses that ability to throw knives from far above. Of course you should not underestimate her close combat abilities either, as each of her claw swipes is merciless and can even create small shockwaves. When feeling cornered, the right hand starts to use surprise attacks and disappears in a blink, only to appear right in front of Kirby to slash. Chloraline is a huge contrast to most of the bosses because she's not a giant wild creature and acts way more careful than most of the other commanders. What I really like is how she loses her composure after entering the second phase and how she has this killer instinct in her eyes during some special attacks. In terms of difficulty, Chloraline isn't specifically hard in any way, especially with the ranger and can be killed pretty quickly if you know her moves. Flying above every attack can sometimes feel a little too overpowered however, which is why the developers probably implemented a bonus side mission in order to prohibit you from doing so. Still, every attack feels like you can barely dodge and all her moves are designed to miss you just by a second, making Chloraline certainly a force to reckon with. Even though King DDD is supposed to be the Bowser of the Kirby franchise, it often feels like he became the goofball of the series. Whenever a great evil appears on the horizon of Dreamland, the lazy penguin is one of the first ones to get mind controlled in any shape and form and therefore rarely feels serious. Of course, sometimes he gets the chance to relive the good old rivalry, but unfortunately, these moments depict the exception rather than the rule. When Kirby was sucked into the Forgotten Land, we don't get any information of what was actually happening, who did send the inhabitants of Dreamland into this unknown world and what happened to well-known characters like Meta Knight, whereas the Lonely Knight shows his skills in the Colosseum, there are no traces of what happened to King DDD himself. After fighting many bosses and reaching a destroyed cathedral, Kirby is faced with a surprising truth. The foolish king of Dreamland he once knew turned into a beast as well and seems to be linked to all the events happening in the Forgotten Land. It's not like DDD is joking around when you fight him in previous games, but it's undeniable that this version is much more covered in a stern coat. His shredded royal clothing in combination with the war paint on his face lets this DDD appear way more intimidating, which even translates into his battle style. Nowadays, it seems like the developers love to put whatever weapon they like into the king's hand, be it a robotic hammer or an axe, but this time DDD will reach out to a pillar close at hand and swings it around with complete ease. The massive shockwave created by one of his attacks is visually spectacular, but still not enough to take down Kirby. After furious fight, King DDD proves his cunning sight and plays dead, only to strike back from behind and take Alphalin with him. By this point, it's unclear if DDD is actually the main villain, and the game finally knows how to take the very first rival series again. Two worlds later, and it's finally time for revenge. Unlike in the first encounter, it seems like DDD is possessed by a mask and uses two hammers for maximum attack. You quickly notice how fast his health is reduced, so it's already clear that there must be something coming. Instead of grabbing another new fancy weapon, DDD unleashes his primal instinct, throws away his iconic hammers and starts to rampage on all fours. It may sound strange for an enemy like DDD, but comes off as surprisingly fitting in combination with his boar-like mask and feral clothing, not to speak of all his aggressive new moves that spread all over the arena and deal massive damage. The icing on the cake is a fantastic arrangement of the well-known mask DDD theme, and after winning the battle, an amazing cutscene follows with probably one of the greatest DDD moments in the series. Even though Dreamland's King was once again just a puppet of a much greater 
another cause. I did not have the feeling of fighting a lesser version of what is still to come and after longing for such a long time for a more intimidating strong DDD again, I was nothing but pleased until the very end. Since the very first introduction of Alpha Lin in the official promotional material, every long time Kirby fan immediately suspected the new partner character to play a bigger role in the narrative. To be more precise, many people expected him to be evil, since there is a past of some essential betrayals in the franchise. Be it the cunning Margolor or insane Marx, it's safe to say that every player should keep a healthy amount of caution when meeting a seemingly new ally. Although the Beast Pack tries to kidnap as many Waddle Dees as possible, it's clear they also want to capture Alphalin for some mysterious reason. After all, you never see them collecting regular residents like the little hatchlings or other wildlife animal. So there has to be a deeper, more significant connection between this world and Alphalin. He pretty much confirms this suspicion by not telling Kirby about his past at all, which makes this whole thing even more peculiar. It takes Kirby until the very end where he gets introduced to Alphalin's other half of his original form, Facto Fog. Go. Together they result in the supposed to be ultimate life form, Facto Alpha Liz. A powerful creature that has the ability to create wormholes and connect multiple worlds with ease. It's basically the same creature that sucked in the inhabitants of Dreamland, but he didn't expect one major mistake. Kirby. In the ultimate battle, not only for Dreamland but this forgotten land as well, Kirby tries to fight off this malicious being with everything he has, even forcing him to go all out and use the power that makes Facto Alphalis so terrifying. However, it's still not enough and after rescuing Alphalin from his other evil half, together they create their own ultimate life form and Isekai Facto Alphalis to a world not even he can escape from. Before even starting the actual fight, I was straight away impressed of how terrific the character design of this final boss is. It's the perfect combination of ominous yet native and blends in among the cast of hideous Kirby bosses excellently. What I often do not like about creatures being called the ultimate life form in other games is how this statement only reflects to the power and not the actual anatomy. Being an indefinable something does not mirror the form of ultimate at all, but Facto Alpha Liz possesses all the traits something being ultimate needs. This is shown during the fight itself as Alphalus consistently flies to the background, attacks with multiple close range as well as wide range skills and is even able to heal itself if you are not fast enough. Kirby final bosses are known for having a seemingly endless repertoire of different attacks and the same definitely goes for Alphalus. We were all curious to see how the developers would bring the traditional multi-faced final boss into a three-dimensional environment and I think it's safe to say they did not disappoint. Even the music kinda sounds like it's fighting itself Itself, trying to be this beautiful track of being reborn, but being played in a melody as if Alpha Lin still tries to free himself. However, after rescuing him, Kirby and his partner combine to one, and even though this whole sequence is fantastically staged, I think my highlight is how they used the invincibility music for the first time in the series during the climax. Still, there are some aspects I'm not quite a fan of. It's way too easy to just abuse the dodge rolling and the shield in general. I would have appreciated at least one or two attacks that simply destroy this overpowered mechanic, but the fight is luckily, especially on the first try, still very difficult. In addition, I can see the irony and amusing idea of simply running over the demonic final boss with the truck, but I was expecting something more creative with the mouthful mode. The second planet popstar showed up, I hoped Kirby would go all out and mouthful his own home planet, but I suppose even Kirby games have to set their limits somewhere. Whatever the case may be, this is just complaining on a high level and cannot hide the fact that Facto Alpha Liz is a more than worthy final boss. Meta Knight is the only optional boss battle in this list and can exclusively be fought in the Colosseum in the Wardle D village. 
Even though he plays no significant role in the story other than protecting the rebuilt town, his spirit to duel in the trial of strength is not gone and stronger than ever. Just like with Tropic Woods, this is actually the first proper Meta Knight battle in 3D, which is something I haven't noticed at all regarding how amazingly realized this fight is. It all starts with the traditional offering of a sword which you can either deny or accept. Normally you enter this duel with an ability anyway, but the sword serves a different purpose than simply giving you a chance. If you accept the blade, Meta Knight begins to swing into the action and if you have a sword in your hand, a short clash follows, foreshadowing what kind of trick you will be able to perform in the actual fight. Otherwise, Kirby will just simply dodge, but whatever you decide to do, there's no turning back. In classic Meta Knight fashion, his stance reflects his respect for Kirby and he will often dodge behind you or throw out blade beams. After dealing a good amount of damage, Meta Knight retreats and starts to raise heavy boulders, similar to Kirby Star allies and covers nearly the whole arena with his technique. By this point you are probably accustomed to the dynamic exchange of blows but the true highlight and easter egg unfolds if you decided to use a sword. Whenever Meta Knight starts to charge at Kirby with a very specific signal beforehand, you can clash the blades and disarm your foe as a result. Now it's up to you whether you want to take the opportunity to strike back or more deviously steal Meta Knight's iconic sword Galaxia. It actually doesn't matter though as Meta Knight falls back to a more basic sword from old days and keeps fighting as if nothing happened. The whole fight is amazingly choreographed and makes great use of a dynamic camera shift. Because of that it feels like you're playing a cutscene and the music only emphasizes the rivalry between these two star warriors. Despite being an optional boss, the developers put so much care into this battle and it's definitely a perfect conclusion to this tournament. I already said it at the beginning and I can only repeat myself. Although this is the first time fighting Meta Knight in 3D, I think it actually works much better in the third dimension and the more Kirby games come out, the better these fights against Meta Knight seemingly get. When I first entered the cave of this mysterious creature, I had no idea what to expect. The level selection screen suggested a goofy looking beast and all the junk, wanted posters and stuff from past worlds suggested some sort of collector with a passion for handcrafted figures. This suspicion should prove to be true as we see multiple fake curvies hanging from the ceiling and an insane armadillo appearing behind us. Silly Dillo is the name of this outgoing animal and you get immediately the feeling that this boss is different from the rest. The way he tries to catch you in his cage and shakes the poor Kirby is reminiscent of the squishing of Gorimondo, but the real fight starts when Silly Dillo breaks the ground and brings the clash to the real battlefield. Here he starts to roll at you with his decorated armor in high speed, giving you barely the chance to dodge. Once after losing two thirds of his energy, Silly Dillo uses his special talent to attack Kirby and dances with his self-made wives just to throw them after you. Every move and every second of this boss battle forces you to keep moving because there is never a minute to rest. It feels like Silly Dillo just bombards Kirby in an ongoing fashion and the only real moment to strike back is when he finally falls to the ground. If you look closely at each attack it seems like they are built up on each other and raise the difficulty naturally. The first running attack stops after touching a wall whereas the dance with his wives bounces off and is much more difficult to predict. But it's not necessarily the different techniques that gave Silly Dillo the top of the list. Since the very first second you encounter him, you can clearly see how wacky he is animated and how much fun the team probably had designing this boss. Everything from his movement to the facial expression screams simple, stupid fun and I wish more Kirby enemies would be like that. Especially the scene where he presents his wife and gives her a little nudge on the nose with an innocent smile. This is just top notch character animation. I think I think it would have been great to add an optional secret mouthful mode where you can use one of his wives to attack him, but other than that Silly Dillo is the most charismatic boss in the whole game and left the best impression on me. A 
As many of you probably know, Kirby games tend to reveal many memorable secrets and additional modes after beating the main adventure. Extra difficult playthroughs or new playable characters became somewhat of a tradition and however a new Kirby entry decides to picture their post-game, it's safe to assume to fight most of the bosses a second time. Often these enemies get their chance to show their true potential and sometimes even play out completely different. Previously we ranked all of the regular boss enemies of Kirby in the Forgotten Land and viewers rightfully asked themselves, what about the post-game? It's not only about fighting once defeated foes another time, but adding completely new opponents as well, which is why we decided to dedicate an extra ranking to Kirby in the Forgotten Land's post-game bosses. Each placement is based on how they either improve on the original or simply bring something new to the table, so it's recommended to watch the regular boss ranking first before going into this list. You might be surprised how much has changed in comparison. Yet again Gorimondo is relegated to dwell on the last place. Generally speaking, there's nothing wrong with this fight as such, as the monster becomes much faster, aggressive and overall challenging. It would not be too shameful to die at least once during the battle, as Phantom Gorimondo basically sets the bar for what is to be expected in the future. Still, the only real new move he shows is an improved Donkey Kong Up B with an additional tornadoes, while all the other techniques are just a little faster. He might be the first post-game boss, but I think some attacks are still too easy to dodge, like simply flying above his arm swings or grab. Phantom Gorimondo is demanding, feisty and merciless, yet nothing but a tasty appetizer. Going from the second top to the second last, it seems like Meta Knight dropped quite some heart in terms of what his Phantom version has to offer. This is only partially true, as Phantom Meta Knight follows a similar pattern as Gorimondo by simply fine-tuning instead of changing. Every move and every sword swing is quicker and more unpredictable, with the iconic clash being more tricky to counter. The obvious highlight is the enhanced rock technique with two more waves to avoid and less time to react. Despite the lower ranking, Phantom Meta Knight is, at its core, extremely action-packed and way more fast-paced than most opponents on this list. The reason for the grounded overhaul is probably the nature of the fight itself. Phantom Meta Knight is not a part of the post-game adventure and, again, a bonus during the final Colosseum Cup. Optionality being packed by optionality, so to speak. Every upgrade is a gift on its own and I have to absolutely comment how amazing the battlefield looks with the new colors and lighting. Besides, a certain other sword swinging knight fulfills a fairly similar role on this list as well, using this rendition basically as a foundation. Putting my favorite boss of the Forgotten Land on such a low place was surely quite heartbreaking. Normally I would gush over everything that Silly Dillo has to offer, but at the same time I have to be honest with myself. Most bosses in this list improve on their original design with many unexpected surprises and new attacks, while Phantom Silly Dillo simply adds one additional skill and weather changing ability. The first encounter already suffered from a rather linear attack pattern and the second encounter could have been the perfect chance to make the best boss fight in the game even more best. The reason why he is still above the previous enemies is simple, because I still adore this foe and his new attack, the explosive Kirby's. During the regular battle, I wish they could have translated his obscure hobby more directly into the battle and luckily, the only novel ability they implemented are self-made combustible mock-ups. What's more is how a sandstorm might appear like a simple accessory, as it doesn't even count as an additional attack, but harmonizes greatly with his lovely dance. Another small detail 
detail is how Silly Dillow doesn't stumble anymore, giving you less opportunities to strike back. If you haven't mastered the dodge roll by this point, Phantom Silly Dillow might give you some serious problems and despite being a fairly simplistic upgrade from the original, I can still deeply resonate with this creature for some reason. Chloraline is a special case where I couldn't quite grasp how they would refine her battle. At the same time it always felt like the original clash didn't live up to its true potential as well, so in order to not get disappointed I basically expected the same changes as with Gorimondo, faster attacks, a more aggressive behavior and general increase in difficulty. Much to my surprise the confrontation immediately starts with a technique Claroline used as a last ace before, followed by quick projectiles. The first half is portrayed by the minimum of what I want to see from a phantom boss, but it's the second half which shows the leopard's true claws. Normally she would jump up to one of the steel structures, throw some needles and complete her act with a mighty dash. In this version however, Chloraline duplicates herself into four identical copies, with one after another dashing across the arena. Fundamentally it's just a more targeted variant of the original clash, but looks way more spectacular and impressive thanks to the supporting camera shifts. I do have to say, despite being such an improvement, it's still way too easy to simply dodge by flying above every attack. In the normal run the player is driven to try not to fly due to a certain bonus mission, but in this case there is no reason to take a risk. Luckily the fight is fairly challenging enough and as one small final touch, Phantom Chloraline is even able to perform a claw swipe similar to Leon Gar. Initially it may appear as a lesser, weaker version, but narratively it makes absolutely sense as it would be weird seeing her outperform her leader. It's a great nod for people who are aware of the total package, making this boss a more than solid rendition. What is there to say that wasn't already mentioned during the regular boss ranking? Once again, the first Phantom DDD encounter is more on the safe side and doesn't add too much to its blueprint. A welcome new addition are spiky Gordos who fill the battlefield with a slowly moving danger, but otherwise the battle in the church is just a quicker and stronger version from the original. The other side of the coin, however, is the second confrontation surrounded by dangerous molten rocks. The fight always reminded me of the Goron battle in Zelda Twilight Princess and the main reason for that is the battlefield itself. Instead of simply dashing at Kirby and using everything Phantom DDD is physically able to do, this time he makes use of the surroundings more effectively, summoning falling rocks with his mighty voice and nearly turning over the whole arena. Even if you have mastered all of Kirby's abilities and the dodge roll, he's still pretty challenging regarding how most of his attacks either require you to jump or be quick on your feet all the time. It's probably safe to say this is one if not the most brutal King DDD fight so far and it makes me really happy to see how intimidating Kirby's rivals still can be although being mind controlled. The only reason our king dropped a little is not necessarily because of his fights becoming less thrilling, but mainly due to how everyone who's following just improved that much. hinted at at the beginning, it's not a huge surprise to see the deadly fire red butterfly back in action again. After an exhausting fight against the powered up Leon Gar, the last remains of Elphilis' other half, Sol Forgo, starts to gather their force and initiate the traditional Sol boss for this game. At least that is what it looks like. Just like in Kirby Star Allies, the now not so unobtrusive butterfly makes use of Sol Forgo as a host and materializes its body once again to take revenge in 3D. Just like every other traditional enemy, Morphonite lives by the benefit of translating his original 
battle into 3D, despite appearing only one time so far. This doesn't mean harm to him though, as all of his attacks seem familiar, yet are quite unpredictable if you don't watch your step. Classic teleporting and quick sword swings are reminiscent of Meta Knight's deadly swordsmanship, not to mention of huge fire waves in combination of creating chasing soul demons. One detail that is worth pointing out and quite an interesting nod from the developers is how the demon is formed like Soul Forgo, whereas in Star Allies this attack resembled some kind of unknown creature. It's safe to say this skill resembled the host the butterfly inherits and makes Star Allies alternative all the more mysterious. But there's not enough time to theorize when Morpho Knight starts to open the second face with an additional sword, both of them becoming as big as the Crimson Knight would like them to be. These strikes are rather easy to dodge but look all the more impressive and come out faster than you would expect. Besides attacking much quicker and being more aggressive, the second phase is not too different from before, but the simple increase of movement and intimidation is everything this encounter needs at that point. The shockwaves, once used to turn friends into enemies, now send you into a state of trance, turning the tables against you and being amazingly adjusted to the 3D environments. The sheer fact Morpho Knights return so quickly and feel stronger than ever is proof of how the developers probably had a 3D fight in mind all along and you can definitely see it. Also, we should probably not forget the Morpho Knight sword upgrade, where you are able to perform most of his special moves on top of being able to steal the enemy's life energy in order to heal yourself. It's not only about the battle serving as a satisfying conclusion to an exciting post game, but the reward for coming this far as well. As the final opponent in the true arena, Chaos Alphalis was destined to put up a more than worthy fight. At first I expected basically the same like with every other boss, with one or two new techniques, as the true enemy would probably show itself after winning. Wink, wink. But much to my surprise, the complete opposite happened here. The master of teleportation uses his quick, unpredictable movement to give his moves a sense of delay, while assaulting from the distance as well. It's a small addition and nothing new for a Kirby boss, but makes Chaos Alpha List's whole behavior different. The truly impressive addition though is the second phase, where Alpha Lin's other half starts to summon some kind of giant version of himself, shooting with arrows and swinging his massive spear after you. It may not be particularly hard to dodge, but makes up for amazing visuals and lets the fight play out nearly completely different from the original. Of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg as all the other moves resemble the power of Chaos Alpha Lin's last ditch attempt to finally consume everything. It's a great overall package and even without the little extra that will come afterwards, this second climax does not need to hide behind the legacy of other iconic true arena bosses. As teased in the regular boss ranking video, this version of Leonga no longer sits at last place and rightfully so. While the first clash felt like a rushed battle against what is supposed to be a key figure at the end of the game, this Leon Ga is the mainstay of the post game and must be rescued after collecting his shattered souls. The first phase is basically the same like before, showing how this is now a mere introduction of what is supposed to be Leon Ga's true power. This time the fight evolves into the scenario I was hoping to see in the regular game, with Soul 4 Go acting as a supporter who engages from behind. It's not like you have to to fight two separate bosses, but keep an eye out instead, as Leon Gar himself is still more than capable enough to carry this battle on his own. I particularly remember the sneaky bomb attack from behind, covering the whole arena while you try to dodge the falling rocks. As if this isn't enough, Sol Forgo occasionally uses energy balls with the classic shockwaves afterwards, adding another layer to the fight. The synergy between both of these forces is just amazingly executed and having a secondary foe in the 
the background without fighting him directly is not only unique in this game, but finally gives me the Leon Ga clash I was hoping for. It might come off as a joke, but Phantom Tropic Woods indeed claims the second place of this boss ranking. As I stated at the start, this list is all about improving on the original and our favorite tree excels in that regard. Unlike Leonga, who obviously was held back for the post game, Phantom Tropic Woods did not need to go all out or enhance nearly every single attack. In my regular boss ranking I mentioned how a 3 dimensional battle against Wispy Woods would ideally use the whole battlefield as its playground due to his stationary nature. While Tropic Woods played into that role to some extent, it wasn't enough to speak about the perfect rendition completely. Little did I know that the Phantom version would swipe away all doubts and deliver like no other regular boss. As you've probably noticed, many post-game bosses on this list simply improved on the counterpart by flexing with new main attack gimmicks like Gorimondo's Tornado or Chloraline's Duplicates, but the Phantom tree seems to come up with more than that. Starting with simply making normal attacks harder to dodge like the extended breath or falling Gordos, the second phase is where the music starts with a sudden labyrinth to reach the tree. This alone is such a clever addition, even though suffering from small perspective issues. But what's even more great is how the roots are played into the battle as well. After some while, Phantom Wood starts to throw out the ultimate breath and you have to jump on top of the roots to be even able to properly dodge. In the regular fight I started to jump all over the place just because it was entertaining, but this version makes it necessary while being fairly difficult on the first try. There was absolutely no reason to step up this fight so much in comparison to the original, which makes me wonder what kind of wacky ideas they still have for fighting a tree in the future. Having a secret final boss at the end of a true arena in a Kirby game is given at this point. The question is how frantic said enemy is going to be considering this is the first proper 3D title. While Chaos Alpha List by itself was rather different from his original, the Soul version appears to be quite simplistic when it comes to its design. Similar to Morphonite, this is another completely original boss and does not use any existing base for its foundation, luckily. It would have been easy to plainly make use of all already developed systems, which wouldn't be contemptible taking the optional nature into account. Even so, we got a fully independent worked out boss fight and a quality one on top of that. The first few seconds already mirror the eerie atmosphere of the elevator scene with some snippets of voice acting thrown in. The laser attack might be unproblematic to dodge but comes out extremely fast and deals a massive amount of damage in comparison of what you're usually accustomed to. In the beginning I expected this confrontation to carry on the peculiar tone until the very last strike, but much to my surprise, after reducing some health, it seems the game contains itself finally. An amazing theme kicks in and every fighter involved starts to go all out turning into a massive fireball and even influencing the surroundings, the Chaos Soul throws some rocks at you as a preparation for a giant dash. What makes the sequence so memorable is not only the grandiose appearance, but how this involves jumping on top of the stone pillars to have a chance to dodge. A good platforming boss is able to create a scenario where the essence of the genre, platforming, is somewhat included. Not to speak of all the dynamic camera shifts which are nothing new at this point, but nonetheless used like in no other similar game. It's a small touch, yet I love how they kept in the UI during the sequence. Normally you would think this destroys maybe the immersion of something similar, but it keeps me in and despite the fact you cannot control Kirby when Chaos Soul destroys the rocks and flies away, for some reason it still feels like I'm within the battle. On top of that, if the attack patterns start to repeat, the game wastes no time with showing the whole sequence again and immediately jumps to the important stuff. 
This is just one impressive attack though, as every other proper soul boss is obviously necessary to perform some sort of iconic techniques, like the Drakia bounce, the boomerangs, the paint splitting or instant teleportation. On paper, none of these skills are new, but are greatly translated into 3D without appearing out of context or strange for newer players. From the beginning to the end, it impressed me how much effort went into this optional boss many players will not even see, making Chaos Elphilus Soul maybe even the best secret final boss of any Kirby game. Kirby's Return to Dreamland was the first proper traditional entry in the series after a long hiatus on home consoles and had to redefine how many well-established features should work. The same goes for boss fights, which experienced a huge step up from what is usually expected. The reason why Kirby bosses are normally praised today for their excellent staging is probably this game, which is why it would be a shame to not rank them. In order to not create any confusions, here are the general rules this list will follow. I'm going to combine every boss with their hard mode counterparts, as most of them don't change things up too much and only slightly enhance the original. I will not judge any boss based on how this remake could have improved on them, since all the enemies are identical to the original release of the game. The post-game bosses of Margulos Epilogue are going to be ranked in a separate video, since they differentiate themselves enough from the originals to be judged on their own. Starting like most Kirby adventures, Wispy Woods introduces this ranking with an exceedingly traditional rendition of the classic clash against the probably most iconic tree in video game history. Everything plays out as you would expect, with dangerous apples falling from above and a surprisingly strong breath pushing Kirby and his squad away. It's not too uncommon to start this timeless fray with rather grounded moves, as the real struggle is about to start as soon as the health bar is reaching its second half. As a side note, this was the very first Kirby game which introduced the elementary formula of how a modern boss fight should work. After entering the second phase, most enemies go all out and reveal their secret strategy as a last ditch attempt. Wispy is not so different in that regard, but the main reason why he keeps the last place is plainly being the first boss. His inhale technique really comes off as a surprise the first time you see it, and is a fantastic way to punish players who normally try to stick to his face. It forces you to keep a certain distance, yet it doesn't really change the way you would imagine a contemporary brawl against Wispy. Luckily, his harder counterpart makes up for this with a significantly more challenging version, and adds a Additional attacks on top of altered moves, dodging the little tornadoes or getting caught off guard by poisoned apples raises the tension of the fight, keeps you on your toes and emphasizes what I always appreciate to see in a proper Wispy clash, using the battlefield as the foe's playground. The only reason Wispy could not uplift this placement is the way too uneventful standard form. I understand that this is the first boss after a decade old hiatus on home consoles, nonetheless it's still no excuse to play it so extremely extremely safe. Fortunately, future renditions should make up for the lack of true creativity, making this Wispy Woods nothing more than a nicely looking but kinda outdated boss. In the halls of an abandoned cave, magical crystals garnish the surroundings and clash with a dry, seemingly dead atmosphere. It's here where an unobtrusive turban reveals itself to be Mr. Duta. 
a powerful magician with the ability to summon living creatures out of his headgear. With occult skills like these, it's even more surprising to see the physical strength Mr. Duta is able to show. His floating fists pack a serious punch and on top of that, the mysterious magician is also able to acrobatically jump through the air. The hard mode version doesn't change things up too much and only enhances the already existing moves with their bigger or fiery counterparts. This boss is a logical follow-up to Wispy Woods and just misses the final punch to be considered a higher place than 9. Surprisingly enough, many water-themed bosses in the series are actually placed on land and Fatty Puffer is no exception. What starts out as a suspiciously fishy encounter against a simple sea creature turns out to be one of the most offensively strong adversaries in this game. The first phase is nothing to gosh about as Fatty Puffer appears to be on the smaller side with no exceptional attacks to perform other than dashing through the arena. Once warming up, the furious fish almost fills up the whole arena and uses his massive body to nearly cover every single corner and hiding spot. It's one of the few bosses that actually requires you to float and brings in a special kind of dynamic. As if this wouldn't be enough, a water hyper beam rounds up everything perfectly fine and it wouldn't be too shameful if this boss prevails over any player. The EX counterpart doesn't change things up too much which isn't something necessarily detrimental if the foundation simply works. Mirroring the original, EX Fatty Puffer becomes extremely flexible and with the decreased health bar of Kirby, this is actually quite a challenging boss. I'm not too fond of this being a simple puffer fish and the fight not making use of any kind of watery ambiental, but even so, the utter destructive nature makes up for this and should not be underestimated. Before going further with this ranking, let's take the moment and appreciate a certain battle which was unfortunately cut in this remake. In the original Wii version, there was a minigame called Scope Shot, now replaced with a top-down shooter in this rendition, where you had to fight off different mechanical beasts by using the Wii Remote. In three different levels, you encounter unique robot counterparts of known characters like Waddle Dees, Kawasaki or Robo DDD, now present in another minigame. Since this is theoretically only a side endeavor and has nothing to do with the main adventure, it would be quite a stretch to call these encounters bosses, but it's not hard to perceive them as ones. They have a life bar just like every other boss, need to be defeated, throw out various unique attacks and pose a challenge by putting a timer on the screen. For for a minigame the presentation is surprisingly well done and it's a shame we do not get the chance to scope shot in the deluxe version. If Margolos ship counts as a boss in a gimmicky shooter section then I see no difference including another gimmicky shooter section into this ranking. The reason why a side game is even above any other boss? Well, we are fighting huge mechs, do I need any other reason to put it lower? Landia is the supposed to be final destination of the second half of the game and portrays the mighty appearance of a four-headed dragon. Entering Halkandra, this monster already proved his power by assaulting the Lord Starcutter once again and it becomes immediately clear that this is a force to reckon with. The boss fight itself reflects his brutal nature with all sorts of different techniques like the expected fire breath, wind beams and dashing through the arena. Naturally, this is only one side of the coin as Landia is able to divide himself into four nearly identical smaller dragons with one keeping the powerful Master Crown. If you 
you are struggling with this encounter, try to attack the leader with the crown as this dragon takes more damage than the other counterparts. What I particularly appreciate about this clash is how Landia is probably the only boss that makes use of four different players. No matter how crowded the battlefield becomes, everyone finds a target to assault, while single players enjoy a pleasant challenge for themselves. On top of that, with being a mere introduction to the actual climax of the game, it's delightful to see how Landia is not a reused or highly similar boss to any enemy before, as some Kirby games like to follow this path in order to pad out their finals. The only reason the dragon isn't higher on this list is probably because I wasn't exceptionally impressed either. EX Landia is once again just a harder version and while this boss doesn't fall into any specific missteps, it's also not as grandiose of what is still to come. Nowadays, it's nothing outstanding to meet Galacta Knight in additional modes or as some sort of a secret cameo in modern Kirby games. This force of nature proved himself as one of the strongest and most iconic characters, with similar knights following his path of success. As a result, it might appear like a battle against Galacta Knight might come across as basic, where in reality it was an unexpected revelation back when Return to Dreamland originally released. Because of that, the fight plays out rather truthful to the original, with many attacks being directly copied from Superstar Ultra. Everything seems to work just fine, but fans quickly recognize there is missing something. While the arena certainly adds to the atmosphere, the true soundtrack truly kicks in when entering the second phase. Now, Galacta Knight undoubtedly unleashes his former strength, and he is easily able to end your arena run. Normally, this battle has every right to sit on a higher place, but there is still a few nitpicks I have despite being generally impressed. It's obvious they use the playable Meta Knight build as a foundation for all the animations, which is technically fine, but doesn't work in this case. The way Galacta Knight awkwardly walks around in combination with his way too short wings poses no danger visually and is a far cry from the menacing appearance of Superstar Ultra. The newly added Arrow Shower is an imposing new inclusion indeed, but I always like my bosses to also have some kind of striking presence. Grand Dumas in the interesting position to be the seemingly final boss of the game. While it's pretty obvious for most players that it's certainly not the case, there's also the sense of mystery when entering this battle. What will happen next? Who guards the final part of the lore star cutter? All of these questions are protected by the Grand Duma, the king of all sphere Duma, so to speak. On paper, there's a huge pit this boss could have fallen into. From a developer's perspective, it must have been very tempting to simply reuse the regular sphere Duma's boss design and lazily upgrade it with maybe one more more attack and one more powerful skill. Luckily, this isn't the case at all as Grand Duma completely stays on his own wings and looks design-wise absolutely stunning. To deepen the illusion of a fake final boss, it's even necessary to use a super ability to finish off this ghost from another dimension. The EX counterpart is at least just as good as the original and while everyone knows there will be something after this battle, it's still an amazing way to close up the first arc of the game. The Lore Star Cutter is the only gimmick boss fight on this list and serves as a bridge to the actual final clash. 
With Landia you glide through another dimension and shoot in classic Kirby fashion from a safe distance while avoiding different projectiles. It's extremely reminiscent of past titles and by this point, somewhat of a tradition to get a shooting boss in every second entry. But what makes this encounter so special is the connection the players holds to this ship. Throughout the game we travel through Popstar to collect missing parts in order to rebuild this powerful ancient galley, only to fight and possibly destroy it in the end. The music may be connected to this whole section as a whole, but I always considered it as the boss theme for this match. As often, climactic Kirby music features the heroic theme of Kirby, mixed with the melancholic tone of this dimension, reflecting the irony to fight what we once repaired. And it's not only the theming, atmosphere and tone that makes this specific shooting section so memorable. Every attack is extremely aggressive and can only come off as a surprise when unprepared, while some of them seem unfair fair at first glance, it's always possible to learn the pattern and dodge properly, embellish this conflict with the proper EX version and we get an excellent kickoff to a bombastic climax. When I entered the boss arena of the Ice World for the first time, I was expecting all sorts of frosty monsters. Much to my surprise, a cocky monkey appears, slams the ground and starts the battle with a mighty cry. What should follow is one of the most action-packed encounters on this list, as Goriath is one of the few enemies who actively changes the surroundings by destroying the ground now and again. It's not a big change, but makes everything much more dynamic since you never know what could happen next. On top of that, he is able to perform various techniques, such as simply throwing ice balls crashing on the ground or sticking to walls. It's the first time you have to actively aim for your target, as all the other bosses before were either huge slow or just easy to hit. The true highlight and only reason why this boss is still in the mind of many fans is obviously the second phase. Goriath lets out his inner weep and performs different kinds of skills viewers of certain shows will certainly recognize. The parallels are so shamelessly apparent that it only makes sense to completely embrace them. EX Goriath confirms that with his ultimate ace while being an amazing glow up from the original. Everything about this fight is just so over the top and unexpected for an ice world, making Goriath rightfully so one of the most iconic battles in this game. Barely missing the number one spot of this ranking, Margolor can proudly claim to be not only one of the best bosses in this game, but also one of the most iconic final fights in the whole franchise. After an exhausting journey through Popstar, Halkandra and dangerous dimensions, the little blue guy reveals himself to be the puppeteer all along and steals the master crown in order to proclaim limitless power. After a chase through time and space, the moment finally comes to end this whole conflict once and for all. It's really hard to describe how phenomenal this battle is. From Margulos' menacing design, the tense music and oppressive atmosphere, everything screams climax and is only underlined by challenging yet fair to dodge techniques. Attacks from below, giant lasers and even summoning sphere doomers as simple slaves for one moment really stresses the point of how much power and danger the Master Crown can transmit. Obviously there is no final without the game's gimmick and after getting a taste during the Grand Doomer's confrontation, it's time to hit harder than ever before and slice up Margolos madness. This is the point where the final boss became truly something special for me. Up to this moment, the only Kirby final which lasted for multiple phases, appearing to never end, was Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, so there was no reason to assume they would follow the same pattern again. Nowadays we all expect the multiple phases and expanded climaxes, but back in the day it wasn't as established as now. What makes Margolor special, even today, is how the whole clash plays out. Normally it's expected to defeat the last enemy with a special feature of the game, so there's absolutely no reason to assume Margolor would still survive. The sudden resurrection 
resurrection and almost tragic music create the tone of hopelessness, as the game is not healing you or gives you any kind of advantage. To this day, this is still the only moment in a Kirby game where I really thought it's over due to the final Margolor being stronger than before. As if he's playing with you, he suddenly starts to use the super abilities against Kirby, juggling enemies like a child and even switching the dimensions. It's not even like giving this face a climactic finisher as everyone involved, Kirby, the player and maybe even Margolor himself just want to finally end it. If you're a long time viewer of this channel, this placement should not come off as an astonishment. Despite my bias and preference for robotic theming in general, Metal General could either be the best boss fight in this game or one of the most lackluster ones depending on how you want to portray it. Entering this clash for the first time, you meet a rather smallish but all the more abrasive mechanical knight. Throwing out bombs, beams and launching himself with a rocket, everything seems to satisfy my joy of fighting a robot but the only reason why this fight feels lackluster in the original run because it isn't complete. Metal General by himself looks almost pathetic, like a standard villain in a level and it doesn't portray the threatening appearance of a boss in the second last world. This however should change when you try to beat the hard mode of the game. Just as usual, Metal General looks a little different and performs stronger and new strategies like every other boss before. The triple rocket move is a great escalation and overall you get the feeling they made the most out of this little guy. Once the fight is seemingly over, the elevator, which functions now, starts to elevate and the true battle begins. The red robot assaults with a giant mech from the background, similar to the one lost from the cancelled Gamecube Kirby game. You can only deal damage when the robot stretches out his arms to the foreground, just like a certain boss from another Kirby game. As if all of this wouldn't be enough to make this boss the best enhanced version. There's also a third last phase, which admittedly doesn't last for too long, but lets the fight play out as a never-ending struggle. There's also the pleasing detail of the robot losing parts of his body as the health bar is being destroyed, something I would like to see more from other Kirby bosses. However you want to see it, there's no denial that Metal General is without a doubt the best and longest EX villain in the game and I will never forget the unexpected moment when this fight turned from a somewhat disappointing letdown to my favorite confrontation in Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Recently I ranked all the regular bosses of Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe you know from the original. This remake however includes not only additional minigames but a whole campaign for Margolor as well, naturally introducing new challenges and dangerous bosses. While most of them reuse basic blueprints from the regular versions, there are still more than enough differences to warrant an extra ranking for every post-game encounter. Just like I did with Kirby and the Forgotten Lands post-game bosses, I'm going to judge these enemies based on how they improve on their origin and add to the initial battle. Surprisingly enough, the head of all sphere Dumas, crowned Duma and supposed to be final encounter in Margolo's epilogue, sits at the bottom of the ranking. The very premise of this fight is already not in Crown Duma's favor as we just fought four of them before, in a way more fast paced clash. On top of that, the regular Grand Duma from the normal game is already an enhanced version of standard Sphere Dumas, while the Rampaging Dumas build furthermore on that foundation. So on paper, the Crown Duma is the third iteration of a boss which already appears way too often in the base game and I felt a little full at this point. All of his 
attacks are nothing we haven't seen before and although this battle takes place at the end, it's easier than the rampaging Doomers. Fortunately though, he is not the last foe of this mode and therefore acceptable as an appetizer. If you have watched the first boss ranking, then you are probably aware how I praised the original Goriath. His bouncy attitude and over-the-top references synergized in a battle not to be forgotten, which cannot necessarily be said about this watery counterpart. Again, I'm judging these bosses based on how they improve on the original and I cannot see any outstanding additions. His bubbles are easier to dodge while being slower and there's not a particular ace waiting to be revealed. The only noteworthy enhancement is his instant teleportation, because of course they would like to underline the shounen influence even even more. It's a welcoming surprise the first time it happens, but gets predictable really fast and amusingly enough, messes with your expectations the next time you fight the standard Goriath. The first opponent in Margulos epilogue, Electric Duta, is a shocking upgrade from the weak original, never being able to beat anyone. Although the same goes for his green brother, there are still some significant improvements. Instead of using a turban, he switches up his drip, gets harder to hit and creates shockwaves when landing. Normal Duta suffered from being able to completely overrun him with attacks and by disappearing nearly entirely, you are forced to retreat and let the fight breathe. One interesting new technique is using a giant saber and for being the first boss, all of this isn't too bad. Still, for whatever reason, it's quite cumbersome to reach the platinum medal in this fight, due to how Electric Duta simply dies too fast to build up the combo points. But then again, some things may never change, no matter how many upgrades a boss receives. Already being hugely aggressive in the origin, the fatty puffer increases wrath with a fiery passion and poses a refreshing challenge. Making use of the background and leaving fire trails behind, not only do you have to pay attention where and how this flexible fish attacks, but what he's planning to do next. Generally speaking, this is actually a rather grounded rearmament, just like his EX counterpart, but all the more interesting when taking Margolor into account. With Kirby, this battle is somewhat difficult, but would not be worth praising beyond this placement, whereas Margolor is a completely different case. Depending on how much you upgraded the floating ability, it might be tough to dodge the fish's huge rolling attack and you have to actually time the jump in floating in order to survive. Because of this, the fiery puffer is a fitting morning sign to show you what to upgrade and what danger might await you. In classic Kirby fashion, the true arena of Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe offers a special challenge not seen in the original. As if this arena run wasn't already challenging enough, with the addition of all the new bosses, Margolo's stubborn soul remains and enters one final round to further cement himself as one of the most iconic Kirby final bosses of all time. Of course they didn't went all out and created a completely original new form, but instead further increased his speed, attack, power and intimidation. Right from the start, Margolo's soul shows his strength by presenting two new super abilities, reminiscent of the freshly added 
sand and robot skills. This obviously implies there might be more super abilities we do not know about, but there's no time to theorize when keeping Kirby alive should be your number one priority. This goes for basically every secret final boss in any true arena, but I enjoy how they are simply not holding back in spite of how troublesome the lead up was to this point. A true arena simply doesn't care if you don't have any healing items left or wasted a good hour fighting through these bosses. Margulos Souls is ready to once again crush all of those ambitions just like any other true final boss. The icing on the cake are subtle cries for help from Margolor, showing he has definitely enough and would rather increase his own strength instead of using an artifact like the Master Crown. This fight stays kinda in between many others and is technically not based on any other existing boss. In fact, they are the literal translation of a mere sphere Duma, multiplied by four and all the more belligerent. Just like Landia, they are the only enemies to make use of multiple players and constantly fly around the arena, while giving very few chances to strike back. Those strange clouds they left every time they go for an attack explode after a couple of seconds and add tension to the battle. That is already more than stressful enough. At this point, it's wise to upgrade nearly every ability to some extent, as the Rampaging Dumas can be easily classified as the probably strongest enemy in this epilogue. After traveling through this mysterious dimension, completing the seed of the gem apple and defeating the crowned Duma, no one would blame you for thinking this is the end. Post-game modes like Meta Nightmare or DDD Tour either end on some kind of remixed boss you already encountered or rely heavily on fan service. Very rarely do we get to see a completely original opponent so ambitious it easily outclasses most Kirby finals in general. This description fits our last foe and number one on this ranking perfectly. Return to Dreamland's main MacGuffin itself, the Master Crown. Despite the fact many people predicted this powerful item to be the main villain to some extent, I kept my expectations in check. Even though everything up to this moment was already surprisingly enterprising enough, the worst thing to happen is looking forward to something which was never in the realm of possibilities. Luckily, my cautious pessimism got slapped by a wooden reality check, giving off the impression of a Final Fantasy boss. It's not like this happens for the first time in the series. I was downright impressed by the down-to-earth yet intimidating visuals of this creature, and hell plainly has a hand for trees, I have to say. Something about the combination of nature and the disgusting parasitic corruption of the Master Crown results in a style that fits the simplistic principle of the franchise while keeping the eldritch tone of most Kirby final bosses. The battle arena reflects this contrast, switching from a vague dimensional space to an apocalyptic sunlight, making us theorize what this place actually is. Every vibrant fan recognized the connection to Super Kirby Clash, a mere free spin off, mind you and the unobtrusive melodies of said spin-off season the soundtrack with the perfect amount of fan service. All of this refers to the bombastic scenery though, but what about the fight itself? Because of Master Crown's huge appearance, it mostly stays in the background and can only be heard by attacking its roots, trying to pierce you. With a setup like that, there's no opportunity to consistently deal damage, and the boss gets the chance to show off all his moves without being overwhelmed by Margolos' upgraded, overpowered abilities. 
enemies. It's the perfect way to make sure the final enemy is not a pushover, but to prove the tree's massive body, it occasionally jumps to the foreground and stares at you for a couple of seconds, being like, you didn't expect me to actually do it, right? Another impressive looking skill are its massive lasers, and despite the fact most of Master Crown's techniques are theoretically very easy to dodge, they at least look impactful. I still think they missed an opportunity to create a rendition of Wispy Woods as the final boss for at least once in a Kirby game. But nonetheless, the Master Crown finished Margolos' epilogue on a high note and will be remembered for its lore implications for quite the long time. Now, after we clinically analyzed each game with each boss on their own, it's finally time to rank all games based on their bosses. They're not going to be ranked within the tier, but simply named after the release date, going from D to S. Also, any true or regular arena runs will not be included, since their incorporation could alter the enjoyment of each entry. Kirby and the Amazing Mirror was the first proper original mainline title for the Game Boy Advance and to this day holds up as one of the most unique experiences in the franchise. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about its bosses, recycling many opponents from past titles and sometimes even leaving them nearly unchanged. They look different and often deliver at least one new blow, but it's not enough to justify their existence as a Mirror World counterpart. This wouldn't be much of a problem if the other half could bring in a unique twist but even supposed to be new bosses like the Master or Crazy Hand cannot change the fact that the Amazing Mirror plays it way too safe with its bosses, despite being so experimental with the gameplay. After Canvas Curse cleverly implemented its bosses as some sort of mini-games fitting to the special playstyle of drawing lines for Kirby to move, Rainbow Curse follows a traditional formula with battle designs you see from other Kirby platformers. On paper, there should be nothing to complain about with each boss offering their own premise and a appropriate presentation of what you expect. However, after the third main encounter, all of them start to repeat, admittedly with a small twist, but still very unsatisfying. Simply flooding the arena with water is something I anticipate in some kind of boss rush, not as another primary face-off at the end of a regular world. It doesn't help that the very final clash is known as one of the most disappointing Kirby climaxes in the series, and it's a shame to know that Rainbow Curse was probably restricted from the overall restraint and and budget many Wii U games suffered from. Despite its reputable esteem in the community as one of the best Kirby entries, Planet Robobot provides surprisingly lackluster bosses in consideration of how well Triple Deluxe evolved Return to Dreamland's formula. Generally, I get the feeling many players often like to forget how uninspired those foes are due to the almost flawless rest of the adventure. If everything is outstanding, the enemies have to be too, right? In fact, while ranking each adversary, I was quite shocked as well proving how memories can trick us. Planet Robobot's bosses are similar to the Amazing Mirror, frequently and literally recycled, uninspired or simply do not make use of the industrial potential. The second encounter is a mini-boss rush, Meta Knight only slightly altered and the prelude to the final, only moderately changed. Normally this wouldn't be much of a problem if Return to Dreamland and Triple Deluxe did not set a certain standard and there is even only one dedicated boss fight for the robot armor suit, a gimmick great for combat. Planet Robobot released merely two years after Triple Deluxe and probably had to rush certain aspects in order to hit the release date, but this does not excuse the lack of original battles, especially in regard to the general excellent quality of everything else. Luckily, the climax presents a truly surprising fight, with a secret final boss catering towards every longtime fan. Entering C tier, all of the following games do not fall into a disastrous trap, but seem to only scratch the surface of their possibilities. Dreamland 2 is a perfect example of such a case, with many enemies appear to arrange something uncommon, but maybe suffer from the limitations of the Game Boy. What I do have to praise how much they accomplished with such simplistic hardware, Dreamland 2 released after Adventure, and dwells in the strange limbo of not being as clever as Dreamland and simultaneously following after Adventure, the first title 
to, to feature copy abilities. The result are positively strange bosses, with Dark Matter being established as a driving force behind future entries. The remake of Kirby's Adventure didn't change any boss in any significant way and is more of a showing of the Game Boy Advance's power. Because of this, I'm going to include the original adventure as well, since it makes no sense to separate them, just like in the ranking. Following after Dreamland for the Game Boy, copy abilities were quite a shift for the gameplay, which mainly focused on projectiles. Now it's possible to deal damage whenever you like, as long as you keep your skill. While well, this makes some bosses incredibly plain and easy, like Wispy standing no chance whatsoever, it isn't as simple as I make it out to be. Adventure was very profound and aware of this drastic shift in combat style, with many copy abilities keeping Kirby in a short animation or feeling clumsy in general. We have the option to directly deal harm, but also have to come near the boss, making yourself more vulnerable and less safe than shooting a star bit from far away. Some bosses like Krakow even make use of copy abilities for at least one phase and even though there is not a singular battle I would call exceptional, Adventure as well as Nightmare in Dreamland constitute as a pretty solid continuation of what Dreamland tried to establish. Canvas Curse was the first game to make use of the features of the DS, mainly focusing on the touch pen, with Kirby unable to move on his own. Since this is a rather experimental gameplay style, it must have been quite tricky to design bosses in the traditional sense. This is why most main fights, if you can even call them fights, contextualize their battles into actual mini-games like DDD offering a race akin to the old days, or Paint Roller challenging you to draw different shapes and lines. The only classic boss with a health bar is Drossia, the final encounter and predecessor to many secret final bosses in the future. Although some players would not even include those opponents in this ranking, I quite enjoy how well the creators executed the idea of drawing lines into bosses. In fact, much more than Rainbow Curse. A boss should always be designed around the playstyle of the gameplay and Canvas Curse follows that idea as good as it can. Also, Drossia's soul left so much of an impression for the series as a whole, making Canvas Curse's handful encounters unexpectedly memorable. Going from one of the most unorthodox titles to one of the safest, Squeak Squad particularly underlines the band of thieves themselves, by annoying Kirby even in regular levels whenever they want. Since they are the selling point of the first mainling excursion on the DS, it's no wonder to face them off in a couple boss fights and to great success. Robot Krako and other robotic monstrosities are either surprisingly difficult for a Kirby game or make themselves quite grandiose looking for DS software. Their notable missteps, like DDD being as bare bones as the most boring wispy brawl, Meta Knight not offering enough for late game Quarrel, and not to speak of Dark Nebula, the possibly worst final boss in the franchise. Just like the game itself, Squeak Squad's confrontations ooze just the right amount of ordinary enjoyment to not consider them bad or great, being the representation of the C tier. Star Allies didn't follow the essential path of a traditional 2D platformer and instead presents four distinct chapters, all different from each other, be it the grassy lands of Dreamland, the devious Jam Bastion or simply space. There are a lot of places to visit despite the game's short length. Normally you have to face a boss at the end of a world, but since Star Allies is told in four chapters, it would be rather disheartening to only battle four adversaries. As a result, bosses are spread across the adventure in every corner with half of the levels in chapter 4 featuring a distinct brawl. Despite the fact Star Allies is often criticized for its short campaign, it was also responsible for this unique implementation of bosses, making the game's structure quite unexpected in terms of what will come next. Also, another special feature not common for the franchise are courses before the main attraction. Usually there's only the fight, but in Star Allies many bosses have either a level before the clash or in chapter 3's case, a whole sequence afterwards. This experimental style can even be seen in the final, presenting a long, elaborated and epic showdown against one of the most unforgettable foes in the series. The only real downside I can see is each battle on their own. As a whole, Star Allies provides a bunch of entertaining confrontations, but observing them piece by piece, they are not what they could have been. Wispy is a lackluster version of Triple Deluxe's and Planet Robobot's amazing counterparts, the Magical Sisters extremely similar and other returning rivals like Krakow or Pawn and Con only deliver the bare minimum of a modern title.
Despite its simplicity, the original Dreamland established not only a couple of Kirby's longtime rivals we fight to this day, but proves absolute mastery when it comes to dealing with hardware limitations. Since there's only so much a Game Boy can do, the creators had to be extremely creative with character designs and bosses in general. The result is a group of enemies fitting the condensed character design of the franchise, while assembling unlike premises for each skirmish. Wispy is a mere background tree with a face, eyes and mouth having the exact same shape and form, while Krakow could be created on one half and simply copied to have a full body. The twins are also identical with a ribbon differentiating their gender and plain enemies following the very same hardware relieving design choices. This alone would justify Dreamland's placing in B tier, but the fights themselves are not bad either. Wispy is a fitting first brawl being stationary and giving you enough means to shoot projectiles back. The twins focusing purely on shooting in linear paths, Krakow being in the air, moving around and DDD presenting the most elaborated fray to show his status as a final boss. There's not much the game I could have done better and there's a reason why those bosses work so great and are still used to this day. Using Dreamland 2 as a blueprint, its successor Dreamland 3 is not as indistinguishable as you would expect. Gameplay-wise there are no real differences, but battle-wise Dreamland 3 basically established the two-phase structure we mainly see in modern titles. After deleting the enemy's health bar once, nearly all bosses start the second variation of their battle making each fight quite unpredictable for its time of release. Even classic opponents you do not expect too much from, like Wispy or DDD, manage it to play with the chains of their design and fabricate the gloomy atmosphere Dreamland 3 ejects, intentional or not. Obviously every other foe cannot be underestimated either, with Zero 2 staying in players' memories thanks to his tendencies to provoke the age rating. What I missed to mention during the regular ranking of Dreamland 3 are adjusted arenas during the boss rush. The combat and surroundings themselves are untouched, but the background is often changed to a, in my eyes, much more appealing setting. Depending on your perceptions, Epic Yarn could either lean towards the lower end of this ranking or remain in the place it is. Thanks to the inability to die, each contest against the foe cannot be lost, which is only technically right. Yes, every boss cannot defeat you in the traditional sense, but if you want to go for 100%, you need to gather a certain amount of gems. Simply going for 100% might not be enough to push you to go for it though. However, by beating a boss without taking too many hits, you unlock two additional levels per word, which is quite the incentive to push through. Nonetheless, I recognize the problem of non-existent stakes, especially during the final. Fortunately, Epic Yarn tries its best to present some truly unique combat situations, only reusing two characters from the primary series. The main difference between Epic Yarns and other bosses is the three-hit pattern you see especially in Mario titles. While this pattern may be quite predictable, no boss plays out like the others, and not without justification do people twitch their eyes when Epic Yarn must be considered a spin-off despite its general charm and ambition. Return to Dreamland for the Wii brought back traditional Kirby gameplay on the home console after a long hiatus, not only modernizing factors like the controls, music or graphics, but rethinking old as well as new opponents as well. With the new director in the front line, someone who openly stated his preference for amazing fights, there was no reason to doubt Return to Dreamland's ability to portray contemporary clashes. However, after playing the remake and especially with follow-ups like Triple Deluxe in mind, it becomes quickly apparent how moderately good those bosses are. I'm not calling them mediocre or bad, but certainly not amazing either, as every boss most informers in the Planet Pop part of the game offers something you will celebrate at the moment, but retrospect more critically after some while. There are some exceptions like the giant robot in the hard mode or the whole climax. These are without a doubt brilliant confrontations other franchises can only dream of, but not enough for Kirby. Wispy couldn't be more boring, Mr. Duta simply jumps around and becomes bigger, the fish mainly rolls and the metal general isn't even fully realized in the regular game. The remake nearly made me reconsider the placing, with greatly enhanced confrontations and a breathtaking ending in Margolo's epilogue, but it was not enough to balance the fine dishes we got served before. Today I regard Return to Dreamland as the B tier when it comes to boss fights, laying out the foundation for the future, which is not something I would call necessarily the Detrimental.
When Kirby transitioned onto a new hardware able to display three-dimensional graphics, it was interesting to see how bosses would be executed, especially if you consider Kirby 64 was not a 3D adventure. Creativity should not suffer though, as all the elaborated backgrounds and possibilities of different perspectives lend themselves excellently for enemies we have not seen before. The result is an approach similar to the 3DS games, with some bosses remaining in the background while assaulting with long-range attacks. In every case, there is a second escalating phase improving on the foundation Dreamland 3 set and the mighty theme sells the point of a bouncy battle. Depending on how much you enjoy the general slow pace of the controls, these foes are either very tiring or quite enjoying, but I always cherish the crystal shards for its unique feeling and general higher difficulty. Some bosses can pose a serious challenge, largely Miracle Matter, one of the best bosses in the whole franchise. Not to speak of iconic encounters like Zero Two, which might be a little plain battle-wise, but all the more atmospheric when judging the tone. Another point to appreciate is how every mini-boss is an individual confrontation without repetition, something we rarely, if at all, see in modern times. No matter how you twist it, Kirby 64 made great use of its potential of being a mere 2D platformer on a 3D home console, making its bosses more entertaining than many similar experiences on the Nintendo 64. Just like Planet Robobot, initially it may appear curious to see a spin-off like Mass Attack so high in the ranking, but once again, if you truly take a look at all those troublemakers, you see the appeal. Commanding a bunch of Kirbys, the gameplay is similarly tricky like Canvas Curse, having to adjust combat to the peculiar style of game. Thankfully, the process of flicking Kirby into all directions already bears some potential for some interesting fights, and each boss makes great use of unlike premises, highlighting how versatile a seeming one-sided gameplay direction can be. Wispy required you to simply shoot Kirbys without aiming, Lady Ivy plays with the weight, DDD focuses on precise balancing, and Scarlet with positioning your group correctly. To be fair, there are not many, but sometimes less is more, and every boss is so particularly designed, you can clearly tell there was a big emphasis on doing them right. Because of this, the final encounter seems almost plain, not bad, but certainly a little ordinary, after seeing everything before. Nonetheless, Mass Attack consists of one of the best bosses of any spin-offs, even without all those unpredicted, elaborated mini-bosses in between. For Kirby's first proper 3D endeavor, it's no exaggeration to claim how amazingly executed this leap into the future succeeded. The same goes for gameplay, graphics, scope and obviously bosses as well. The Beast Army constitutes as the main antagonistic force behind the adventure and each commander plus Alolan Wispy offers a fitting challenge that sometimes feels a little too safe to call it flawless. A perfect example is Gorimondo, a giant monster guarding the end of World 1. There might not be something particularly wrong with the first main face off but I I kinda expected more from such a beast. The same could be said about other bosses as well. Often it feels like there's one special trick missing to make them justifiable for a higher tier. However, what makes those enemies so much better than others in the series are the phantom counterparts, traditional harder versions of every foe. Normally these variations only slightly alter each fray by increasing the speed or dealing more damage. In this case many attacks are so much changed that some bosses like Tropic Woods become way more entertaining, proving the sheer potential there is still left, and Phantom Chloraline becomes a Bayonetta boss with the traditional, admittedly overpowered but stylish dodge roll Kirby can now perform. The final is as bombastic as ever, and the best thing the Forgotten Land tells us with its bosses is that it can only go upwards from here. Entering the highest tier, Superstar Ultra is an excellent culmination of making use of the respective hardware, using your imagination to the fullest and making sure each boss remains an individual touch, despite the incredibly high number of enemies. To be precise, no other title in the series consists of so many encounters generally, which once again speaks all the more for the quality we witness. Starting safe with reimaginings of Dreamland's primary adversaries, you will quickly notice what kind of opponents will await you by trying trying out each mode, dedicated to surprise the player not only with their different gameplay premises, but foes as well. The Great Cave Offensive is an adequate first taste with different antagonists not only looking extremely unlike, but fighting uniquely too. Naturally the computer virus is such an example, but sometimes it's not only about the battle itself. Competing against Meta Knight is not too different from Adventure's counterpart, but in the context of what came before, destroying the halberd and listening to the dialogue of his crew makes the do 
tools so much more cathartic. Not to speak of iconic first-timers like Galacta Knight or Mask DDD, both appearing regularly in some shape or form, showing how much of an impression they left, despite being based on an existing blueprint. There's no denial how much influence Superstar Ultra left with its rivals, and you can truly not demand more from both the original and the remake. Although Triple Deluxe kinda remains in the shadows of its much more well-known modern titles, the same can absolutely not be said about the bosses. After Return to Dreamland formed the groundwork of what modern two-dimensional Kirby bosses should look like, it was Triple Deluxe building on that foundation and creating confrontations unseen in the franchise before. Thanks to the implementation of the background, there's a whole new layer both parties can make use of. Of course, there were some enemies in the past staying in the background, but not to the same degree like in this case. Seeing Flowery would suddenly jump away or Krakow bombarding the whole battleground are flexible evolutions of past encounters I would like to see more of in the future. Not to speak of the underappreciated inclusion of the 3D effect, a gimmick that can enhance the experience drastically if executed right. Also, Triple Deluxe is responsible for bosses having one climactic trump card when initiating the second phase or introducing one secret final original boss at the end of the true arena. Yes, Galacta Knight was a surprise in return. Return to Dreamland, but not at the end, and it's telling how Return to Dreamland Deluxe followed Triple Deluxe's path of offering an additional secret Margolo fight. There's only very few recycling, the climax is unmatched to this day, Hypernova surprisingly well implemented, and only one boss that could be considered annoying. If there's one thing Triple Deluxe should be remembered for, it's the bosses, and I'm glad the game managed to outclass the sandwich games it was covered by, at least in one aspect.